I'm unmuted and I'm going to stay unmuted. Good. I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council. That's exciting. I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council adjourned regular meeting of November 2nd, 2021. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. City council members and city staff are participating from remote locations and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during the meeting, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. May I have a roll call? Council Member Fair? Here. Council Member Pearson? Here. Council Member Beering? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Here. Mayor Grisanti? Here. If you have a quorum. Thank you. I'm going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, I hope. I pledge That's allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to, and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May I have an approval of the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. I also, second. excuse me, I would like to adjourn in memory of Dashiell Blake. Dashiell Blake. Okay. Do I have a second? Paul, oh, Steve? Do you have two? I mean, Richard Kerrigan passed this week also, and I was going to adjourn the meeting in his memory. Can we do it in, in, for both people? I'm seeing head nods, so yes, sure. I'm sure we can. Okay. Uh, Richard uh, Kerrigan? Yeah, Richard Kerrigan. Great. Okay, thank you very much, Scott. Sure. Okay. So we have a motion, and do we have a second yet? I believe I'll... you have a second from Council Member Pearson. Yes. Yes. Or, okay. There are several seconds. <laughs> Can we call the roll, please? Council Member Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Yering? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. May I have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on October 27th, 2021. Wonderful. Uh, the first item on the agenda is a update on the school district separation. And I believe Deputy City Attorney Christine Woods will present an update. Is that correct? There's also a proclamation there. Yeah, there was one. Yeah. 1A? The proclamation from October 25th was rescheduled when that meeting had to be adjourned. Uh, okay. So are we going to give it tonight or are we going to give it on the 8th? That will be presented on November 8th. Okay. Mayor Gasanti, I don't see Ms. Wood in the meeting. I don't know if she's logged on yet. She I'm was like, connected a moment ago, but it looked like she was having problems with her video. We're readmitting her now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Council. I am um, not completely sure why my camera is not working, but um, am I right? You cannot see me, correct? 
I can't see you, but I can hear you. Okay. Well, it's me. I apologize. And your brilliance comes across. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Vasanti. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, my laughter and glee totally mask my exhaustion. We have been pushing at about 125% on school separation. Um, we're so excited at all the things that are happening. And um, I just want to give you guys a bit of an update. Um, as you know, um, Alex, if you take me to the next slide, that'd be great. As you know, we are in the middle of our visioning process. Um, uh, I think I talked to you about this the last time I was here before you. Um, we have fully launched our visioning process. Um, we're looking at our values, our priorities, and how this will be reflected in the ultimate academic program that we will submit to the um, Los Angeles County Office of Education's County Committee. Um, what that means in practice, um, in, in more um, grounded terms, is we've launched our citywide survey. It was launched um, last Friday. Um, it was a bit of a soft launch. We were testing it, making sure everything was really working. Um, and now we are, we're fully launched and, um, and have deployed a communications plan that includes not just um, the normal city channels for distribution, but we've also engaged a vision process planning committee. There's about 15 people throughout the city who are assisting and are foot soldiers. They're sending out the surveys themselves. They're passing out flyers. We're um, passing out flyers and um, drop-off lines at coffee shops. And we're putting up posters in libraries and um, shops throughout the city. We are um, hitting all of the social media platforms. Um, our goal again, um, I, my, our express goal is to get at least 500 respondents to the citywide survey, which is pr a pretty significant response rate for the city. We usually don't get that many um, responses to our surveys. Um, we're at a little bit over 200 respondents so far, so I think we're going to get there. Um, I have a personal goal of a thousand, but city staff keeps telling me to give it up. So we'll see. We'll see if we get there. Um, but we're hoping to get as many respondents as possible to the citywide survey. Um, and if the council has any questions about that, or um, if the council has not seen it, I'm pretty sure you guys have seen it. Um, if you've not seen it, um, in just a minute, I will share with you the link and the QR code. We've also launched and organized our focus groups. We're doing um, eight focus groups. Um, actually, we, we, we didn't intend to, but um, because of availability, we're starting our focus groups tonight. There's a Spanish language focus group tonight. We're doing a, a, a focus group with special ed parents. We're doing a focus group with private school parents who have left the, um, who aren't, uh, whose children did not, they made an, a conscious decision not to attend the public schools. Um, we're doing a focus group with teachers and staff. Um, the business community, um, Council Member Pearson is actually hosting one along with um, Jarrell Taylor um, for the business community. So we're, we're doing about eight different focus groups. Um, and then we have convened the stakeholders um, with the help of Council Member Fair. We have identified and put together a group of the stakeholders who will meet on November 20th and will then synthesize the information from the survey and the focus groups and really come up with the roadmap that we've talked about. And then ultimately, as I promised, we will present a final report to you in January. Um, we're kind of on an accelerated um, pace with this because we need to get this visioning process done and completed by mid-December um, so that we can um, have the academic program written in time for our feasibility study, which we will be submitting to LACO in January. Um, I keep hitting arrows. Alex, please, next slide. <laughs> so here is our survey link and QR code. Um, you, if you guys aren't familiar with how to use a QR code, just take your phone, camera, aim it at the QR code, and the survey will pop up, or you can um, utilize the survey link. Um, that we also have all of our communications for the community survey in Spanish. The survey is in Spanish. We have a, a Spanish URL for the survey. Um, and we actually will be working with our Spanish language focus group tonight, the parents who are there to assist them with answering the survey if they need assistance. We actually have, I think, almost 40 Spanish language um, surveys completed already, which is pretty um, exciting. We're, we're happy about that. So um, we're moving along with the survey and um, the focus groups and the ultimate stakeholders meeting at the end of November. Um, the only other announcement that I would make about school separation, next slide, Alex, is that as you all are aware, 
we have um, the Laco County Committee virtual public hearing. Another public hearing is happening on Wednesday, November 10th in the evening. Um, we've asked everyone to kind of save the date and be aware of this. I will just say that there's been um, strategically, we are handling this um, um, public hearing a little bit differently than we've handled some of the other public hearings. Um, we're not doing a full scale push to have the public um, come out um, in as great a number as we normally do. Um, and I can explain why. Um, the, the preliminary public hearings, as you all know, we've already had two public hearings and those were preliminary public hearings. And the reality is those should have been very simple, maybe one hour, two hour public hearings. They really did not need to be four or five hour public hearings because they really were based on sufficiency. They shouldn't have been based on the merits. Um, we felt like LACO um, didn't properly define the scope of those public hearings. So we had two very big public hearings because we were um, we were told that that's the, the scope and the standard that we were under and we, we responded and rose to that occasion. However, um, it's really unclear now that we're in the real process, what's the purpose of this public hearing, right? We've already had two other public hearings. We're getting ready to have a third and you've not given me any idea why this public hearing is different. So in an attempt to um, be wise about our resources and in an attempt to make sure we don't have kind of community fatigue, we are not calling our community out to this particular public hearing. We will, however, dedicate this pu public hearing to the Spanish language community within Malibu, um, who's served by the Malibu Unified School District, I'm sorry, who's served by the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District already, um, who has not been heard. So what has happened in the prior public hearings They've always had Spanish translation services, but they've had very poor um, translators. They've not had simultaneous translation. Um, we've heard that many of the, in the first public hearing, um, we, none of the public, um, none of the Spanish language um, parents who were on the call were able to get through to actually speak during the public comment period. And in the second um, public hearing, they weren't even in the same room as us, so they weren't allowed to have public comment at that um, moment as well. So we've decided to use this as an opportunity to showcase um, the concerns and the issues from our Spanish speaking community um, and have them be the feature of this particular public hearing um, so that the county committee can hear from them um, since it's not been um, something that's happened in the prior public hearing. So because LACO has not proper, has not defined this scope of this public hearing, we're trying to do that in a way that's most productive and most um, effective um, for the city as well as for our, our constituents. So um, that is why you may not see a big push. I'm not gonna necessarily ask all of you to come out because our focus and our goal for this particular public hearing is a little bit different. Uh, we will also do a presentation obviously, but um, in terms of public comment, we will not be doing um, a significant outreach to um, the community. We're just going to do a more targeted and niche outreach. Um, that concludes my presentation, unless there are questions. Well, you must have done a good job. I don't see any hands. No questions? Oh, wait. I see John Cotty has a hand. No, wait. That's my mistake. Oh, geez. That would have been nerve-wracking. <laughs> right. no, no questions for me. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I'm Guess you're making progress on the nine criteria as well? We are, as, um, as I mentioned, the visioning process um, feel, um, um, feeds into criteria six. Our financial consultants are updating the financials with our new enrollment numbers and our new um, property tax information and um, which right. feel, um, feeds criteria five and nine. Um, we're actually doing some research. We've gotten a lot of anecdotal information about um, permits that have been denied by um, people who live in the Malibu zip code, um, people who are actually even displaced um, because of the Wolseley fire um, who um, have applied for permits. So we're trying to get a little bit more information about that and investigating that issue so that we understand that better as it relates to criteria one, which um, is our enrollment numbers. So yes, we are moving um, the entire um, consultant team is still moving towards um, fulfilling those criteria so that the feasibility study is complete in January. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
Next, I believe that brings us to 2A. Communicate. Did I see Council Member Uring with a question? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Steve. Uh, yes, I just, you know, these, these nine criteria you're working on, will we get a look at those before they sent, you're sending it to LACO or when? Can we sort of get at least a, a overview of your responses? Um, Council Member Uring, I, um, we will, we can definitely share a copy of our feasibility study with the council before um, it's submitted to the county committee. We, we had not done that before, but we can definitely um, do that. Yeah, I'm just trying to get a sense of, you know, what the answers are and, and, and get a flavor, at least in my mind, of where, where I think this thing is going. So we, if you could do that, that would be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. Your hand's up again, Steve. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking it down, Paul. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you. I believe that brings us to item 2A, written and oral communications from the public. Do you have any communications from the public concerning matters which are not on the agenda, but for which the city council has subject matter jurisdiction? Yes, you have 12 speakers tonight. I'll read their names in order and then call them one by one to speak. They are Scott Dietrich, Nicole McGinley, Hamish Patterson, Jenny Rosinko, Marianne Bima, Andy Lyon, Nicole Pierce, Craig Hill, Jake Lingo, Nick Shapiro, Carmen Tonarelli, and Ryan. We'll hear from Scott Dietrich first. Thank you. Scott, are you in the meeting? Yes, I am, Paul. Thank you. We hear you. Um, Alex, if you would start uh, my little video. I have video to show you. Um, Mayor Crisanti and council members, that on October 16th, between 2 and 4.30 in the morning, I was... Uh, out in Malibu on mostly on the coast highway, but on a couple of the other streets and uh, looking for, um, I did the video of illegally parked cars and uh, I don't know, the video seems to be having some issues. And I counted over a hundred illegally parked cars um, and RVs um, maybe about a quarter of those were RVs and as we drive along. And I'm bringing that to your attention because I, I think this is a big problem we have uh, through uh, Lost Hills Sheriff. We have cut down on some of the bigger uh, violators, but it's still an issue and uh, you know, people are parked when they're not supposed to between the times that we've designated. Now, if it was just parking, I don't think anybody would care. But there's more to it than that. We know there's an environmental degradation um, that comes when they use uh, the highway and the beaches as a toilet. We had the hazmat team out one time before. So with 100 cars and, or I should say vehicles, parked in Malibu and another 50 down at Las Tunas Beach, um, I think we need to step up the enforcement. And I talked to Lieutenant Braden about this. So there's two issues. One is the guys in the motor home, a lot of them are just there to uh, um, get free parking. They don't have to pay anybody to park their RV, but there's some of them dealing drugs. And this is where the intersection with our homeless issue comes in, because uh, if the drugs aren't there, the homeless aren't going to stay in their tents. And guess where we have problems. So if we can get rid of the illegally parked vehicles. So I thought at first, this is just an enforcement problem. But in talking to Lieutenant Braden, uh, there's something that the council can do, and I'm, I know you guys have been talking about it. I urge you to take immediate action. We need to set our times for the illegal parking from like 12 to 5 or some such thing like that. Whatever time you guys choose working out with the Lost Hill Sheriff is fine, but it's too complicated right now for the deputies. They have to go out. Did the guy move a 1,000 feet? Did he move at the right time? 
it requires so much work on the part of our deputies that it's just not going to get done in practical terms. They have lots of other stuff to do. So let's get change our signs to, you know, pick a time one to five, one to four, 12 to five, make it really easy for the deputies to be able to do this. And we will have a much more effective uh, program in doing what you guys have wanted to do in that first ordinance. Thank you, Scott. Who do we have next? Our next speaker is Nicole McGinley. Hi, Nicole, are you available? Are you in the room, Nicole? Hello? Can you Are you me? in? Yes, now I can, oh, thank perfect. you. Hello, Mayor, hi, Council. Uh, later in your agenda, you'll be hearing appeals that fall under what I've been referring to as GAP applications, applications that were deemed complete before the adoption of the updated and more robust telecom ordinances. As I've mentioned before, not only do we have a gap between the old and the new ordinances, we also have a gap between the requirements in the public right of way and the non-public right of way. As we've anticipated and warned, telecom has flooded our city with applications that take advantage of our old outdated ordinance. As a result, we have a ton of gap applications that are being processed with no consistency and wreaking havoc on how these installations go up in our city. We need to update the public right of way ordinance to match the non-public right of way ordinances safety standards that are validated by professional engineer and insurance requirements. Residents should have the assurance that the highest level of safety standards possible will apply to every application. I keep reaching out and I've submitted documents several times, but unfortunately I haven't heard from staff. We were patient, but maybe too patient, because I know how fast time flies between now and the end of the year, because we were in this exact same situation last year when we were trying to get the urgency ordinance heard, after which we were assured we'd be able to update the urgency ordinance to reflect the deliberate improvements that were made to the resolution in the non-public right-of-way. If we don't update the public right-of-way ordinance soon, this gap will continue to widen between ensuring our city has adequate infrastructure and mitigating fire hazards. Please engage with us. After all those alerts I've gotten recently, I mean, brush fires, exploding transformers, last week's meeting was canceled uh, for power outs. And then the week before that, there was exploding transformer and electrical fires. I know fire safety is all of our number one concern. We haven't, I just don't really know why we haven't done this update yet. Um, but I thank you all very much for your time and I really hope to get this on an agenda soon. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Who do we have next? Our next speaker is Hamish Patterson. Hey Hamish, are you in the room? Hello? We can hear you, Hamish. All right. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council members. I'm uh, I'm going to put you guys on notice about this mandatory vaccine things in the public school system, and you get to you get to own it if you break it. You, the city council members, were elected to represent all the members of this community, which include our children. You have an obligation to speak on our behalf and protect our children from public institutions that would harm them, allowing the mandating of untested vaccines on our children falls squarely on your shoulders. Silence on this matter will be viewed as you being complicit in the matter, and you will be held responsible by name for any child harmed, injured, or killed in the immediate or distant future. Council members Mike Pearson, Council member Steve Yearing, Council member Karen Ferrer, Council member Bruce Silverstein and Mayor Paul Grisanti, you are on notice. These are the words of Dr. Will Nichols when asked by Craig Foster at the Santa Monica Unified School District meeting on 1021 regarding long term effects on vaccines. You are correct, quote, you are correct, but it's only been a year and we don't have any long term data. What I need to do and what I'm happy to look into is this there may be a corollaries 
or evidence generally from the mRNA research that's been done that can suggest the possibilities of long-term effects? He pauses, then states, the short answer is no. We don't have any long-term data. We're collecting it as we go. Dr. Rubin, the FDA, at the approval hearing on 10-26-21, quote, we're never going to learn about how safe the vaccine is unless we start giving it. That's just the way it is, the way it goes. That is how we found out about complications of other vaccines. Look, you can join us. You, as a body, can write a letter to Governor Newsom saying that you, the Malibu City Council, members of this body, do not support mandating untested vaccines on our children. You are on notice at this point moving forward. If you do not stand with us tomorrow, if you do not as a body write a letter, if you do not personally speak on the behalf of our children and a child is damaged by these experimental vaccines that your experts know, no long-term data has been done on it. If it's 5, 10, 15 years from now, and one of these children under your guidance and your care is damaged, you own it. So speak up now and get out of the way of this thing and kick it up the food chain. You as individuals and as a body want nothing to do with this mandate in our public school system. Thank you for your time. I hope to see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock at Malibu Pier and stand with your community. Thank you. Thank you, Hamish. Who's our next? Ne our next speaker is Jenny Rosinko. Hi, Jenny, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Oh, wonderful. Okay. All right. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. I am actually not going to talk about 5G or wireless installations, although I will be back for 4A later this evening. Uh, right now, I come before you as a Malibu resident, but more than that, a United States citizen. I beg you to please not hear these next few minutes as an anti-vaccine speech, but rather as a plea for the civil rights granted to citizens of this country by our Constitution. Malibu wants a separate school district for the sake of our children and future generations. Malibu wants to maintain the rural charm of our community by slowing development as much as possible. In the same way, a concerned group of Malibu citizens wants to maintain our city's uniqueness and integrity by not allowing government issued mandates to dictate how or if our children can be publicly educated, how our businesses are ran, and who is allowed within their doors, and how our residents live and work in our community. I know Malibu lies within the LA County boundaries I do not know what rights we have as a city to accept or deny county issued mandates. I do not know what power you, our mayor and city council as elected officials have to assist in protecting civil rights in our community. I do know that the civil rights and freedoms of Americans are at serious risk and I can't be silent anymore. Our FDA has approved emergency use COVID-19 vaccinations for the 5 to 11 age cohort, despite opposition from many experts and physicians who don't believe this is necessary. Many people will welcome this approval. This is fine and their personal choice whether or not to vaccinate their children. But now that the approval is authorized, will school districts mandate that children be vaccinated to attend school? I believe we all suspect the answer to that question. This is not okay. According to CDC data, children are 107 times more likely to die from the vaccine than from COVID. That statistic is from the CDC, not some crazy conspiracy theorist making up stuff in his or her garage. Mayor and city council, would you vaccinate your children or grandchildren knowing that CDC issued statistic just so they could attend school? Maybe, but maybe not. But wouldn't you like that to be your decision? This is a call to action. Whether you are for or against the vaccine does not matter. It is a time to fight for civil rights and oppose government issued mandates in any form. Each citizen of this country should be allowed the personal freedom to choose what is best for themselves and their families without the threat of losing educational rights, their jobs or other freedoms. As Plato said, this and no other is the root from which a tyrant springs. When he first appears, he is a protector. Are the people making these mandate decisions trying to protect us or are they trying to take away our freedoms under the guise of protection? Look back in history 
and decide for yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Who do we have next, please? Our next speaker is Marianne Bima. Marianne, are you there? Marianne, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. Do we need to... I just finished. Are you there? Uh, we can try to move on to our next speaker our next, and circle back to Marianne. Uh, our next speaker would be Nicole Pierce, but I don't see anyone by that name. Uh, let me see who we have. We do have Jake Lingo in the meeting. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Jake. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jake Lingo, and I reside at 33355 PCH in Malibu. I have a seven-year-old daughter who attends Malibu Elementary School, and I am vaccinated. I do not support a COVID vaccine mandate for school-aged children. I believe this decision should be left up to the parents and their doctors, not elected officials. COVID-19 um, has tested the will of individuals and institutions around the world. Um, your stomach, honey? These I hear two voices. I'm sorry. Someone I'm sorry. needs no. to... Nicole, it shows you're muted in Zoom, but um, so I can't mute you myself. I don't know if you can try turning that off on your computer. Apologies to Mr. Lingo. Yeah, I've never seen this error before where uh, someone shows up as muted in, in Zoom, but we can still hear them. This is Mr. Lingo, should I continue? I think everyone got muted by somehow. So um, not to speak for the mayor. Mayor, you're muted, just so you know. And you got Jake, hang on a second. You can totally continue. Sorry about that. And see if we can get our mayor to I mean, be able to unmute. So IT staff has uh, muted everyone now. Council members, you can unmute yourselves. And Jake, uh, you can continue. You should still be unmuted. Can Jake start from the beginning again? Give him his full three minutes. Yeah. Sure. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Jake. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll start again. I, I have a seven-year-old daughter who attends Malibu Elementary School, and I am vaccinated. I do not support a COVID vaccine mandate for school-aged children. I believe this decision should be left up to the parents and their doctors, not elected officials. COVID-19 has tested the will of individuals and institutions around the world. These are difficult times, but we now have data on how and who COVID-19 affects, and I believe we need to utilize this data. When the pandemic started, the governor of this state decided to shut down public schools. Children suffered and were not allowed an in-person education, while at the same time, big box retailers, liquor stores, manufacturers, motor vehicle dealerships, construction jobs, et cetera, stayed open. You get the point. The kids suffered. Why? Because elected officials made a decision to protect their constituents by isolating a certain segment of the population. Data shows that this decision was wrong. States that kept their schools open had the same transmission rates as those that locked down. This is a virus that cannot be contained or disciplined into submission. It will spread and mutate just like all other viruses. The government rules will not change that. We now know that the school-aged children are the least vulnerable segment of the population. So why would we mandate that children receive a vaccine that does not protect them from being infected with COVID-19? When I elected to get vaccinated, the consensus of the government and the pharmaceutical companies was that the vaccine would protect me from contracting COVID-19. They were wrong. It's now accepted that the vaccine does not prevent you from getting COVID-19, but they say it makes the symptoms less severe. Symptoms in children are already non-existent or mild, so why do we need to force these vaccines on children especially when we do not know the long-term effects of this vaccine on these children. We've been told by the pharmaceutical industry and government that there are no long-term risks, but again, these are the same institutions that have been wrong about much of the virus all along. Do we want to be wrong about this? 
Preventing children from an in-person education because their parent does not permit them to take the experimental COVID-19 vaccine is wrong. And what about children that have already had COVID-19? They have natural antibodies and should not be forced to take a man-made vaccine to go to school should they not want to. This should again be left up to the parent and their physician. The families that choose to vaccinate their children will not be at any higher risk of contracted COVID-19 from the unvaccinated. Vaccinated children will not be denied an in-person education. Vaccinated children will not be isolated, so why will unvaccinated children be isolated and denied an in-person education? I ask you to put the children first, all of them. Leave medical decisions up to the parents and their physician. Quit letting the government make the wrong decision and let families make decisions for themselves. This is still America, the land of the free. Be brave and join us in standing up to big pharmaceutical and state government, and please support our right to choose for our children and their future. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jake. Who do we have next? Our next speaker is Nick Shapiro. Hi, Nick. Are you there? Oh, that was fast. Yes, I'm here. Okay, we can hear you. Well, I have a lot written out here, and um, I'm not sure I'm going to write it, but I'd like to say that I stand with everybody here so far that has spoken against the mandates. I do not believe that is the role of the government to tell us what we should do with our bodies or what our children should do with our bodies. The science doesn't support that children need vaccines. It shows that children do not get COVID. They do not suffer. And um, it shows that antibodies that are natural are stronger than the antibodies um, from the vaccine. And at the end of the day, one issue that I want to present that has not been presented yet is the issue of trust. And right now we are having a, a huge issue of trust around the globe, but I'll keep it local in Malibu at the moment. We do not want to have an issue where the citizens of Malibu do not trust their city council members and the officials higher up the command. And that is what's happening because as soon as people are being mandated against and are being forced to do something, it's not, it's not a good situation, especially when it's not backed on science. So please, we have free speech in this country. We have real science via the scientific method, which is not being valued and not being implemented. In fact, what we have is we have a lot of canceling of credible science happening so that one narrative can constantly be pushed. That is not a valid narrative. And what I ask is that we have the free flow of information valued so that people can, as, as law-abiding citizens, as sovereign beings, can make choices for themselves and their children that they see fit for themselves and that the government stays out of it and does not force people based on some faulty narrative that it is protecting others. This is simply not true. I personally am not vaccinated. I personally have not experienced a symptom of COVID once. I choose to not wear a mask because I choose to breathe freely and I'm around my parents who are quite elderly and we've been quite relaxed around this whole thing the whole time, living in a completely different reality. That is one that is derived from a state of empowerment and a belief in natural immunity, which if we didn't have, we would not be here in this freaking meeting right now talking about all this stuff. So I ask that you please consider not just the science, but consider and please take to heart what so many of us are asking and will continue to be asking, which is to please just allow us the freedom to do what we want with our bodies and our children's bodies and not force them to get a vaccine that they simply don't need for protection. That is all. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Nick. Who do we have next? Our next speaker would be Carmen Tonarelli, but I don't see her in the meeting, so we'll move on to Ryan. Hi, Ryan, are you available? Uh, yes, I'm speaking on an item not on the agenda, although you probably will think it sounds like an item on the agenda. Um, in analyzing some of these uh, massive amounts of 36 or 38 applications for uh, cell sites, most of which are from Verizon, and not to cover dead zones, but just to probably sell new products, that uh, the city's uh, program for noticing the public and residents is pretty deficient. Um, I'm not going to say it's not legal, but 
the hearings were not noticed uh, at the sites for the days that the hearings occurred uh, by the Platy Commission when they heard the items. And they also were not noticed for the appeals, two of three of which I think you have tonight. Um, and that really needs to change. The county and other cities require noticing when there's a hearing for a cellular facility uh, in the public right of way or on private property. Some of the cities and on Malibu Canyon Road, you've probably seen the ones from the county, they're like a billboard. Uh, maybe that's too big, but this really needs to be implemented as a matter of administration and policy, whether or not it's mandated in the, the city's uh, code for staff to follow. Uh, it's just a good thing to notice the public when something's going in in front of their house. And I think that you need to, uh, if you need to agendize this, or if you can just give a hard stare at the city manager and say, make it happen, that the public needs to know what's going on. So that's the first one. And the other is there were some inconsistencies with the addresses involved that we really need to iron that, uh, the, list the poll numbers if it's a co-locate on some street light or power pole. And that um, the addressing, uh, you can't change the address. If there's an existing site, you can't change the address to a new address number so the public can't track the permits and look up the existing permit. I requested the ori original permit for one of these tonight, never got it because the original permits have conditions. And this is true for all of them. That's why I'm speaking tonight, that you need to do a little bit of housekeeping on the uh, interpretation and compliance with the noticing. And I think we'll all be better for it. So thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Who's next on our list? Now we're gonna try to circle back to some of the people we missed earlier. So we'll start with Marianne Bima. Marianne, are you here? And Marianne, you should have a pop-up on your phone asking you to unmute. Hello, I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Marianne. Ah, okay, great. Hello, uh, dear, dear mayor and dear city council member. Uh, I'm so sorry it is um, uh, noisy here because I am uh, at the football game of my son at the Austrian. So uh, the reason I am uh, I am here tonight to speak, it is um, for our children. I am I am speaking to uh, for for all the kids, and uh, it will be about the mandate vaccine. As you can hear in my accent, uh, I come from uh, Cameroon. So in my uh, in a um, in a country like like Nigeria, uh, the the Pfizer company ha, has been have been sued because they were experimenting vaccine on children, and uh, there were so many cases of death and uh, so many cases of uh, paralyzed children. My point is that with this COVID vaccine. There, there are a lot of controversy. At the beginning of the pandemic, they, they have been they, they announced that Africa is going to suffer the most. But, uh, but it was not the true. Africa, um, Africa was the less impacted by by the COVID crisis. And today it is still doing well. Children are free going to school and people in the village, are, uh, they are free going to their duty. And, and it, is, um, it is scary that a new vaccine, uh, that, that a new vaccine should be tried on children to know if it's work or no. I think that we should um, uh, listen to what the experts, the world experts in health are, are giving as opinion for the vaccine. Because exposing our kids, the vaccine is detrimental for them. And uh, uh, a couple months ago, 
we were all each against each other, but now a day we can Democrat, Republican, Black, White, all of us united for a good cause to to defend the the mandate. We don't want the the mandate on our children and on anybody else. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time. And good luck to your son today. Thank you. <laughs> Who do we have next? I still don't see Andy Lyon or Nicole Pierce in the meeting, but we do have Craig Hill. Hi, Craig. Are you available? Here we go. Uh, good evening, Mayor, and Council, and staff. Um, I understand that Scott Dietrich will be representing the Public Works Commission with a request to pull the Westward Beach paving project to dial it back a bit because the beach situation is not what was originally assumed. I've spoken with Scott, and I think reconceiving it may be a good idea, and I think we agree about some aspects. But no matter whether you decide to reconfigure it now or let Coastal weigh in first, it will definitely require a wave uprush study, a sea rise and flooding study, and a CEQA initial study because it's a public beach and it's bordered by mapped ESHA at both ends. We hear there's a hurry to get something done before the funding supposedly expires, but the legal requirements must first be fulfilled. Public Works asserted that those studies aren't required on the basis that the project isn't development, but a prior council amended LUP 2.20 expressly to permit this as development and under the LCP, a road is defined as development, as is a concrete wall. So then, LIP 1.5 requires those studies. Quote, all applications for new development on a beach shall include an analysis of beach erosion, wave runup, inundation, and flood hazards prepared by a licensed civil engineer with expertise in coastal engineering. Done or not. Not incidentally, the FEMA map shows the entire beach to be in a flood zone, and there are witnesses who've reported waves coming right up to the restaurant and flooding the parallel parking area on the north side of the road. So if you want to redesign a more compliant project, you can't rush. You still have to do those studies. And if you don't do them, I don't know, but I imagine that the application would be reappealed to Coastal anyway. So it might actually be quicker just to let Coastal have its bite at the apple now. The longer it takes, the less peace will be there. And sure, the sand comes and goes, but if you put in a seven-foot wall of concrete and aggregate base, half of it nominally above ground, the first time the uprush reaches the wall, the sand below it will be washed away. The wall then becomes a de facto shoreline protection device, and the side scour ensures that the beach won't return as before. Um, so now switching gears, I think one reason we got to this problem is that the city didn't do what state government code requires that the planning commission, quote, annually review the city's capital improvements program and the public works projects for consistency with the general plan. I don't know that we've ever done that. I'm, I don't know. Um, we're So we're supposed to be doing that annual review. Yet recently we were told by legal that we had to vote on the Westward project, yes, no, up, down. Um, you know, so clearly public works should go through both a more robust public review process and the full commission review, not just the pro forma request for us to rubber stamp it. Uh, if you'd like to hear my views on what might actually be a realistic solution on the site, feel free to ask. Uh, my time is out, so um, I'll stick around a bit tonight. Otherwise, we'll talk about this soon. Thanks. Thank you, Craig. Who do we have next? I'm still not seeing Carmen Tonarelli in the meeting, so that's all the speaker signups we have, but we do have a few raised hands, Mayor Grisanti, so we I've can... noticed that one of them is Nick Shapiro, who spoke to us already, and I'm wondering, is there a... And Mary Ann's has still got her hand up, so I don't know what the appropriate thing to do at this point is. John can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe you're obligated to hear the speakers a second time on the same item. That is correct. Okay. Given AB 361, though, you are required to hear speakers who have raised their hand that have not yet spoken to the extent they want to speak during public comment. Okay. And who is, who is iPhone number two? I think we're going to have to unmute them and find out. Okay. Let's do that. 
Yes, we'll start with iPhone. If All you right. Provide your name. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yes. Who's this? Hi, I'm Carmen. <laughs> I'm iPhone too. Okay. Got it. So I'm Carmen Tonarelli. Um, actually, hold on a second. There's an echo. So. Hi, good evening. Thanks for having us here. Um, I'm a mother of two children here in Malibu. One of my kids is at Webster Elementary School and the other is at Malibu High School. And please forgive me, I've never done anything like this. And it's, it's very nerve wracking, to be honest. Um, it's really been very difficult to express myself over these last few months over fear of being judged or labeled an anti-vaxxer, which I'm not. But Interestingly enough, it's really come to my attention that I'm really not alone. There are at least a couple hundred of us within the parent community that I am aware of that completely align with me. And almost every parent I speak to in private also shares my views. Sadly, most of us are extremely afraid to speak. Um, so with that being said, I'm here tonight to propose that Malibu remain a city that embraces freedom, freedom of choice. In other words, medical freedom. And we're a city that is tolerant, a city with elected officials that are able to step back and take a look at the bigger picture. Let us continue to be a city where parents decide what is best for their children, where restaurants don't have to police their customers by checking their customers' vaccine status, a city where people are able to make their own choices, and a city that does not discriminate against people based on their private choices, a city where everyone has the right to operate in society. You our elected officials, you guys have the power to protect, a power to protect the children. You not only have influence, but also power over our community's health and safety. Please do not be fooled. These mandates, they've already harmed and they will continue to harm not only individuals, including children, but also businesses. And statistically speaking, there will be adverse reactions. Sadly, I'm already Personally, I personally know a child who has been severely injured by this vaccine and has been in and out of the hospital because of this vaccine, this COVID vaccine. Please make it, make it your priority to be a city that rejects the mandatory vaccine for children to go to school. Don't fall into the narrow mindset with a one size fits all mentality. Allow individuals to make informed choices for themselves. I know you already heard this, but on October 21st at the SMUSD school board meeting, Dr. Will Nichols, he stated the obvious again, that it's only been a year and we don't have long-term data that we're collecting as we go. How can we sign our children up for this experiment in order to like go to school? That's absolutely ludicrous. Children are the least vulnerable to this virus. Each and every one of you as individuals has a responsibility to stop this, to stop mandating experimental, do not allow us to have a mandated experimental vaccine that affects our children. It's totally ethically and morally and constitutionally wrong. And to just close, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I'm totally anti-mandates for children. And I'm definitely anti-overreach by a school board, which we don't really have um, sway with as Malibu parents. So that's it. Thanks for hearing me. Thank you, Carmen. And Mayor Grisanti, the next hand I see from someone who hasn't spoken yet is Ryan Morelli. Did we hear from his wife already? No, by me. I don't think so. Okay. I don't have a Morelli we've heard from yet. All right. Well, Tornelli and Morelli sound similar. Uh, good evening. Um, I like the others again. You're going to hear the same thing. From me. Hold on. You're doing something wrong. It's really, are you on speakerphone or something? No, maybe my speaker's too loud. Does this sound better? That's better. Okay. Sometimes my voice is a little loud, so... I'm sorry, this is really more of the same. Um, I'm flabbergasted that um, I grew up in Malibu. I moved here when I was uh, two. My parents brought me here in 48. I just can't believe what's happening. And I feel like the vaccine mandate is only insane, but dangerous to us all. I mean, parents who have to take care of vaccine injured kids, uh, you know, just you, the board, yourself, the council, we're all responsible for this. If this goes wrong, we're responsible for this. And they already talked about Dr. Nichols. He already said in the school board meeting that he has no idea what the long-term effects are. And, and Dr. Rubin stated when they approved this thing that we're never going to learn how safe the vaccine is until we start giving it. So that's just the way it goes. That's how we found out how rare complications of other vaccines. That's what he said. So we're going to let a test, a therapy on our children, no matter what the odds it is of hurting them, 
when the probability they get sick is remote. You need to speak more softly or speak a little further away from the mic. I'm sorry. As your volume goes up, the signal is breaking up. No, I appreciate that. And I understand I'm very passionate about this. So my voice does go up and there is clearly something wrong with my with my remote. Not a problem. So to not think that parents should be able to decide if this is a good idea is crazy. I mean, this therapy is not even a year old. I, too, have no problem with a vaccine that's been around for 20 or 30 years. But there is so much uncertainty here. The masks we wear as an example, talking about uncertainty, come in a box. If you've ever seen a mask box, which we have many at our house here, they stay on them. These masks do not eliminate the risk of contact contracting any disease or infection, nor reduce the risk of illness or death. It's crazy, but I understand now 50 billion masks have already gone into landfills and into the ocean. How about the fact the CDC has determined the common COVID test used is not even accurate, and each COVID test has a disclaimer saying it's not even not even approved. So the point of this whole thing is it's unknown. We cannot let our children be guinea pigs. Where, where does it stop? I have a decent amount of short-term data on adults, to be honest with you. This is no baloney. I know several people have been vaccine injured. Any of you have been vaccinated? I, I have not been vaccinated yet, and I was going to, but I have two guys that I play golf with. They cannot play golf. They both got the Moderna vaccine in July. They started having inflammation of the joints in the end of August. I have not golfed with them or seen them since because they can't golf because of the inflammation issue they have in their joints. The, the point is, I'm just going to wrap it up. All, all, all of us are responsible. All of you council people, the mayor, all, all of us need to protect our children. All of us need to stand up to this mandate for children. And tomorrow, I believe there's going to be a massive showing in Malibu of people who are not okay with these mandates. And we will also lose a lot of people if this mandate is, is, is enforced, because people will be moving and taking their kids out of school. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And Mayor, we have one more raised hand from a person we haven't heard from yet. It's uh, from Nini, or if she has another spelling of her name, she can let us know. Okay, let's hear Nini, and then let's move on with the agenda. Hi, this is Nicole Pierce. I don't know how to change the name on this. Okay. So it's really, you know, my son did this. I have no idea. Anyway, um, I'm the last speaker, I think, so I'm not going to take up too much more of your time. I don't have a prepared speech. I'm just going to speak from the heart. I have two children. Pretty simple. You guys seem like you're pretty intelligent. You know what's going on here. I don't need to uh, inform you of what's going on in the news and blah, blah, blah. I don't want a mandate for my children. I'm not going to put the vaccine on my son. We had COVID last year and we have antibodies. I don't think it's safe. And I will pull, you know, my kids out of school if that's the case. It's just pretty simple. If you guys are parents, I know in your heart of hearts, you know what's going on here. And deep down, you know, this is not okay. It's unethical. And to mandate this for children to basically kind of choose over education is not okay. My kids are fully vaccinated. I don't have a problem with that. I see Dr. Harris in Malibu. I live in Malibu. I've been here for quite some time. I'm, and it's just, we all know what's going on. This is not safe for kids. Once you get kids involved, you're going to get a lot of angry parents involved. And this is just not okay. And it's your responsibility, I believe, deep down to protect the kids. Because bottom line, the kids are the future. This is what matters. Who cares about us? And a lot of adults are super crazy with this, and I don't agree with them either. But the kids is a whole different story. I don't appreciate this mandate. I don't think that it's right. And, you know, I know you guys know that deep down inside. So thank you for listening, and I hope that you join us tomorrow at the round. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Mayor Grisanti, while Nicole was speaking, we have had one more raised hand, and then I do have another speaker after that, a speaker sign up. So we'll hear from Heather Gardner and then Jessica Mark. Heather, are you available? Hello, I am. How are you all tonight? Thank you for hearing all these voices in Malibu. There is quite a concern here, and it is my hope that you would open your ears and your minds to really not just think about what people have been saying tonight regarding these mandates, but to look beyond, look into the future and think about 
the potential that if our government is trying to do these things to us, and by the way, I am vaccinated. I have had COVID. My whole family had COVID. My husband is also vaccinated. I have two children in the Malibu uh, elementary and middle school schools. But if we continue to allow the overstepping of our government, which is very anti-American for all of the freedoms that millions of people have fought and died for in wars, and we are coming upon Veterans Day. I mean, think of all the people who have who have given their lives, people who are still alive that continue to give their lives. Think of the men and women who have stepped out of their jobs to protest not wanting to have a vaccination and to protest the idea of government actually stepping in and saying, you must do this or else you lose your job. Are you kidding me? Years ago, before COVID happened, someone would have told us that we would have laughed. We would have said, no way, not in the America that I live in. That is not our country, what it's founded on, what the Bill of Rights guarantees to every single citizen in this country. And look around globally and see what is happening. This is an important time in history. And this is an important time for you you are here as our council people. You are our elected officials. You have been given this job to fight, to stand for us, for our children, for the rights of people to be able to freely assemble wherever they wish. Tomorrow, LA will take away, I'm sorry, November 4th, they will take away the rights of citizens to be able to go freely, freely assemble indoors where they wish to go because they choose not to be vaccinated. They are not putting anyone else at risk. People who are vaccinated can vaccinate. If people don't choose to vaccinate, they're the ones putting themselves at risk. That is their choice. We need to protect our kids. We need to be careful. This is your time to take seriously the decisions that you will be making and allowing the government to overstep if this, if you're gonna choose to do this and allow for this, what will be next? Think about what will be next down the road if we allow this to happen, if we allow something else to happen. Heather, that's your time. Yes, thank you so much, have a great night. Thank you, Heather. Our next speaker is Jessica Mark. Hi, Jessica, are you available? Yes, thank you. (laughs) Uh, thanks everyone for taking the time to hear us out and um, I appreciate your consideration of us as part of the community. Um, my husband uh, grew up here in Malibu. I moved here about uh, 11 years ago and we're raising our two children here um, and I have a, my stepson who's going to UCSD. So um, I have autoimmune issues and I've been very hesitant to take the vaccine, yet through societal pressures um, did and have had really adverse reactions to it um, because of my autoimmune issues. I've had extreme joint pain, which is um, I'm learning through talking to people that other people have experienced this also, and then extreme fatigue. It's only what is this, uh, three months later that I'm finally starting to feel a bit more normal again. So my hesitancy for, you know, giving the vaccine to my children is, um, is very personal. And I don't see how we can, you know, not allow our children because we, we are uncertain of the outcomes for our children and, you know, mandating them to 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 attend school public school because they're not vaccinated is just not right and i um it's just really um hard for me because you know through covid and having to stay home i'm not ready to homeschool my children it was detrimental to our, to my relationship with my children um, you know, they do so much better when they're in person. They're much happier with their friends. So 
I do plead with you guys to take a stand with us as um, citizens of this community and help us in really standing up to the government and taking a stand against this. So thank you for hearing me out. Thank you, Jessica. Mayor Versanti, we did have one more speaker sign up, Laura St. John, but I can't uh, find her under that name in the meeting. Laura, if you are here, you could raise your hand under the reactions button. Okay, not seeing any raised hands or any other new speaker signups. That concludes public comment. Thank you. That puts us at item 2B. Do we have any commission or committee updates? Yes, you do. You have a committee up commission update from Scott Dietrich. Scott, are you in the room? Uh, yes, sir, I am. Thank you, Mayor and Tom. Um, before I start, um, they the speakers on uh, the vaccine Scott, for the kids. you've already started. I'd like you to I am. do what you're supposed okay. to do. Could, could we find out when that rally is so we could inform the public? I don't, I didn't know about it, um, but I'll continue. Um, I come to you from public. Scott? Of our commissioners. Um, yes, sir. You, you, you dropped Hello, out for a minute me? there. You dropped out, but now you're back. Okay. But, okay. Thank you. Um, I'm coming for from Public Works Commission with the unanimous uh, direction of our commissioners. Um, we're going to request from the council that you return the Westward Beach parking project back to Public Works for further analysis. We've had a number of public uh, uh, letters and discussions. Um, Brian Merrick and I, myself, along with Rob DeBow and his staff, met out at Westward Beach. We think we have a lot of uh, avenues to improve the project um, that will please pretty much everyone. So if you would, please return that to the commission. And from there, it can go through the normal channels. Um, next would be the planning commission. And I understand that for some strange reason, and you heard from Craig Hill, that uh, they were told they couldn't make any changes. They had to take it or leave it, which makes no sense to me. Um, we are also on the commission uh, going to explore avenues to try to get public's uh, comment earlier in the process. Normally, we don't get anything from the public. And I believe that Director uh, Rob DeBow is going to speak on that with some ideas. And uh, because what happened is this project was ready to go out to bid. And suddenly we get a lot of public comments. We went out and met with a couple people. And as we looked at it in the B. South Swogan takes the center. And uh, so we, we think we can improve this markedly. So please return that to the commission. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Who else do we have? That was your only commission update. Okay. Do any of the committees want to report or are we, back, are we on to uh, city manager update? City manager update, I think. How yes, are we thank doing, you, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, just wanted to, uh, before I start my report, just uh, uh, thank uh, and acknowledge all the hard work by the school separation team. A lot of great work being done uh, by the, the team members with a lot of help from members of the community. So just wanted to give a sh shout out because I know everybody's working really hard on that and just want to appreciate that. Um, just wanted to bring the council up to speed on a few things. Um, of course, last week we did have a nice little rainstorm. It did bring some issues which affected the local roads, of course, uh, but, but it was welcome rainfall with our parched conditions. Uh, the rain did help push the live fuel moisture uh, rating, which is, of course, what we use to determine how dry we are looking out there in the Santa Monica Mountains. So it got pushed up uh, by 5% to uh, 61%. Of course, 60% 60, 60 or below is considered critical. Again, while that is uh, good news, it doesn't mean we are clear of the fire danger this season and it 
would only take uh, some dry winds and some warmer temperatures to push us right back down to where we were. Uh, but at least a, a little bit of a good respite for now. Um, last week, I attended uh, the California Contract Cities Association uh, City Managers Summit uh, with uh, Assistant City Manager Soger. Uh, had some good updates from that group. Uh, also wanted to report um, that I attended the Las, Valibu, Las Virginis Malibu uh, Council of Governments meeting. Uh, last week at the, at that meeting, the COG voted unanimously to support the city of Malibu's request to send a letter uh, to the county of Los Angeles, uh, encouraging the county to open their winter shelters during red flag events. So we're happy to see that the uh, COG stood in support of the city on that. Wanted to announce for the council and the public that um, there will be a public hearing on the city's uh, update to uh, it's housing elements that is set for the November 15th Planning Commission meeting. Also wanted to give a little bit of a plug here uh, for the uh, Malibu Alerta. Uh, the city started offering our emergency alerts in Spanish uh, in October. Uh, and this is now a quick and easy opt-in text in uh, uh, text opt-in feature. Uh, this is part of the whole community approach to disaster preparedness, uh, and it meets a recent requirement under California law to provide emergency information in the community's most commonly spoken non-English language. Uh, Spanish speakers can text Malibu Alerta to 888-777 to be automatically registered with the city's Nixle alerting service to receive emergency alerts via text messages in Spanish about evacuations wildfires, earthquakes, and other disasters. The emergency alert will include a link to more detailed emergency information posted on the city's webpage. On September 11th, as part of National Preparedness Month, the Public Safety Staff, the Malibu Foundation, and the Malibu Community Labor Exchange held an emergency preparedness training in Spanish and registered attendees in the system. So we've just started promoting registration and we'll be rolling out more promotions in Spanish to sp local Spanish language media and we'll partner with groups like the Labor Exchange and the Chamber on outgoing outreach. Also wanted to provide council with uh, an update on um, city staff is working with the sheriff's host team uh, to complete the removal of illegal encampments on Zuma Beach property. That's scheduled to be completed by early next week. Uh, signs posted on the site indicate all persons must be off that property no later than no November 9th and that further camping is prohibited. Once complete, staff will work with members of the host team to clear some smaller encampments in the Eastern Malibu area. Lastly, uh, I wanted to direct um, or wanted to address an issue that was actually just raised by the most, uh, by, by Mr. Dietrich, uh, and that is the Westward Beach parking project. Um, staff has heard a number of concerns uh, regarding this project. Uh, as you know, it was recently approved by the Planning Commission. Uh, we've heard a number of concerns that uh, conditions have recently changed uh, at the beach and in the area. Uh, and we are asking to bring this matter uh, to City Council uh, for discussion. Uh, staff is prepared to bring a report to the City Council as soon as the November 22nd meeting. At that point, City Council could have discussion on what it would like to do with the project and could give further direction to staff. So unless I hear any objection, um, we will, staff would bring a report uh, to council on November 22nd uh, for the Westford Beach project. Thank you, Steve. That, that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Thank you. I see Jim Braden is in the audience. Can we get Lieutenant Braden to give us a short report on uh, the activities that we've had recently? Are now the automotive historians. They're taking these hang on. Is that you? Yeah, hang on one minute. You got it? Okay. I'll try to be quick. The uh I'll start off with uh the murder that occurred on May twenty first, about four o'clock in the afternoon. It was in the twenty seven thousand block of Pacific Coast Highway. Um two weeks ago on Wednesday, we served a warrant. Los Hills Station, along with Los or LASD homicide, served a warrant outside the city of Malibu. 
the uh, uh, person was taken into custody for the crime. Also, uh, evidence was obtained. I don't have any other thing I can release at this time. I wanted to let you know the arrest was made. Um, when they allow me to release anything else, I will to you. The uh, uh, To comment on what Scott Dietrich was saying about the motorhomes, it's not about the Coastal Commission signs that allow us to kick these people out of these two-hour spots. It's about the oversized vehicle ordinance, which isn't a sign. There's signs coming into the city and also at the entrance and exit of the city. But the uh, uh, to take away the 1,000-foot limit, possibly to increase the time on that, and that's in discussion in the uh, Public Safety Commission meeting tomorrow night. So if you have comments on that, go to that meeting. The uh, um, what else do I have? The uh, I've been going through Malibu a few times, and uh, it's been very pleasant down there lately. The uh, there we are seeing positive effects too. I understand what Scott's saying. There is nights that there's a lot more motorhomes in Malibu sometimes, uh, especially on the weekends, especially when it's warmer out or it's a nice weekend, and it limiting the hours they can be there or limiting the the oversized vehicles that would help us out. The uh, overall in Malibu, compared to when we started enforcing that at the end of last November, uh, I would estimate that 80 plus percent of the motorhomes are gone that we are dealing with at that time. So it's been highly positive, um, but it's a work in progress. It won't, will not be over. I was reading an article that said because of the pandemic recession that they predict that homelessness will go up another 49% in the next four years. That's not impossible. Um, there was some email floating around, said something about the uh, broken window theory. And uh, I just wanted to comment on it. The broken window theory came out in around 1995. It is absolutely great. It could be initiated. Uh, the things it takes is support, and that's in the prosecution of laws. In the state of California, several years ago, Prop 47 minimized felony laws, making a bunch into misdemeanors. What we're dealing with at the Sheriff's Department is a bunch of those misdemeanors now because of the elected district attorney. He's choosing not to file a lot of these. This is anything but a broken window theory. It's not in our world. Uh, what I would encourage in the city is that, just like on these motorhomes, that's an important issue, and and that we do push the envelope on that, and that we we as a city do comparable things that other cities are doing, so we don't end up with a bunch more motorhomes again, and we don't have a regulation. And I understand there's boundaries to what we can do, but at the same time, that's the area to push the envelope. Uh, in the next week, I actually have a meeting on Thursday with John Cotty and with Susan Duanis and the city manager regarding implementation of the anti-camping ordinance that we're putting into place. The sheriff's department's part of that is the enforcement part. So all the pieces that say how somebody can't be here, somebody can't be over here, all these things, that's what we'll bring into effect. Be patient as it's put in, as things are implemented, you got to be patient with things. So, and at the same time, trying to get some assistance from the county with extra patrols and back in the Santa Monica mountain areas as the host team's finishing up with moving people out. We don't need people moving back in. So I, I'm working on that. I'm meeting a little bit of resistance, but I'm working on it. So um, I'll let you know how that goes. And uh, we have another meeting next Monday. And I'm open to any questions you might have. Thank you, Jim. Do you have any news about the uh, prosecution of uh, the machete guy? Is that moving it's forward? Still, there is another court date set. I'd have to look it up to make sure on the court date. Um, the... The victim in that and also the um, doctor that stopped to help, we actually the sheriff's presented an award to him on Thursday night. They're doing a town hall meeting inside of Hidden Hills. So that presentation's going on there. Um, 
and they're both supposed to be there. I'll look up the information on that case so I can be accurate about it, and I'll report back next Monday on it. Thank you, Jim. Uh huh. Okay. No I'll be I'll be back on Monday again. Well. We'd love to see you here in Malibu. So, no problem. I love Malibu. Thank you. I think that brings us to City Council Subcommittee reports. Karen, I see your hand. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so, first of all, I'd like to thank the public speakers. Um, and I will repeat what uh, Deputy City Attorney Christine Wood said. We've been working many, many hours on school district separation. And there's a reason for that. A lot of us don't agree with many things that's going on in our local school district. So I want to address what a lot of people talked about tonight, the uh, mandatory vaccine policy. Um, anybody who's been a pay paying attention to the news can see that in Malibu, COVID is much less prevalent than it is in more urban areas. And along with that, we're surrounded by school districts that have a far less aggressive policy than SMMUSD. Um, I think the district could have used a more nuanced approach. I don't think they had to have, uh, I know they didn't have to have an all or nothing black and white edict on vaccination, and obviously it's affected students, it's affected staff members, uh, longtime teachers, uh, a beloved coach, and it's really too bad. Uh, there would have been ways, in my opinion, to address this uh, with testing. There were staff members that offered to do regular and frequent testing. All of that fell on deaf ears. Um, I think, I think the district could have just been less rigid and, and, you know, we've seen this again and again. That's why personally I've been working on school district separation for more than 11 years. Uh, this is just one example out of, I can't even begin to count how many, um, the district, I think, started out encouraging vaccination and then just turned to this hard line. And that's unfortunate. Um, as for myself, I am fully vaccinated. Um, and I will just say as an example, and I don't mind uh, letting people know this, and whoever said they go to Dr. Harris, I do too. And I think he's a great diagnostician. Uh, I was about to get uh, a booster and then he advised uh, myself and my husband, why didn't we do an antibody test first? See how that turned out. And that would inform our decision about getting the booster shot. And guess what? Both of us have antibodies that are sky high. So I'm going to save that booster shot for later. Uh, I'm not a doctor by any stretch. Uh, I've taken high school biology. That's my science background. Uh, but that has worked for me. Um, so that's what I have to say about the school district and vaccine mandates. I don't agree with what they're doing. But what I can do right now is work on getting us our own school district. Um, along with all of that school district separation work and all the things that uh, Deputy City Attorney Wood discussed, uh, Mikey and I have been continuing our meetings on uh, affordable housing slash workforce housing. Hopefully there will be some progress there. Um, and to my surprise, I was asked to participate in a survey with the Las Virginis Triumpho uh, Water District. Um, they have a joint power authority for something called the Pure Water Project. And the goal of that uh, is to join other cities and communities in um, implementing a system to treat uh, wastewater which sounds quite uh, uh, unappealing, uh, to purify it and to be used as drinking water. 
I'm going to go to a demonstration on this. Uh, I don't have a date for that yet. If anybody would like to go with me, I welcome you. Um, but I think there are communities doing some very interesting um, projects that uh, I would love for us to be able to uh, to closely monitor and see if it's something that might work for us at some date in the future. Um, Scott Dietrich, I do want to say, I couldn't agree with you more. I really would have loved to have seen our parking restrictions midnight to 5 a.m. That's what I personally asked for uh, when we went and, uh, and, and put those signs up. Guess what? Coastal Commission said no. Uh, they wanted us to allow for people who might want to go to the beach at midnight, 1, 2, 3, 4 a.m. So here we are, unfortunately. Um, I do have to ask sort of a procedural question, maybe more for the mayor. I'm just wondering, um, one of our public speakers did speak on an item that is on the agenda uh, during 2A, items not on the agenda. So I'm not sure where we're going with that, but I think it might be something we want to pay attention to in the future. Um, uh, and without repeating everything that's been said, uh, that's it for my report. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I see Mikey's hand. Thank you, Mayor. And I want to start off by thanking all the speakers, uh, very passionate speakers. I appreciate that. I hope I don't miss somebody's comment that I want to comment on because I have so many notes here. Um, I mean, Karen kind of covered some of what I want to say. I'm not going to try and repeat myself, but every single day, Karen and I are working on separating from the district. Every single day. It is the single thing I'm spending the most time on my own city council. Um, we do not have the power to, <laughs> how do I say this? They don't give a damn what we say, to be honest. You know, they just don't. And we have Craig Foster fighting for us um, and doing everything he can. He's won against six others and it's it's a really difficult battle i i promise everyone here we are not giving up and i agree with everything else karen said um this has been i mean when i was at juan Gabrillo, my parents i remember them talking about separating district this is how long this has been we are never not giving up this time because so many speakers here talk about a very specific issue that we're all passionate about. And that's one of just so many other issues. So I hear you all loud and clear. And I didn't know about any gathering tomorrow. I will be away at work, but don't take that as meaning I, I don't hear you loud and clear and that we are not fighting loud and clear. Um, so I really appreciate everyone showing up. It's um, some very, um, well-spoken speakers, and I appreciate that. I really do. I really do. Um, and I just know there's some, I guess, Jessica Marks, a comment that you said, this has been a very difficult time for everyone, everyone. And that everyone's got stories that are are, are difficult. I certainly do. Um, we all do. I have relatives that died. I have people that have been isolated, you know, grandparents, we you know, issue, it just, it just goes on and on. Isolation issues. My kids are older. They're through the mouth of school, but still, you know, my daughter having to work at home and, you know, just absolutely that isolation your kids went through on her level. So I, I just want to say, I hear you all very much loud and clear. Um, Sorry, I have to just check my, my notes here. It's, my writing's not the neatest. A Western Beach, uh, yes, been aware of this. I want to thank Andrew Ferguson for first really focusing us in. This project didn't work for so long, long before any of us were on city council. This was approved. So from the city council level. 
So when Andrew got sent a photo, I looked at his photo, an aerial photo, and I drove down there right away. And then I got a hold of Andrew immediately and I said, Andrew, your photo doesn't show how bad it is. It's gotten worse. I think, you know, I think the wave action got within 30 feet of the turnaround right at Birdview. And um, I alerted, you know, Steve McClary and he, you know, he checked it out. We all checked it out. It's like, okay, things are changing here. I've had talks with Rob. We've got some great ideas. Yes. So we're all on the same page. Um, um, I guess there's different conversations, but yes, I already knew it was going to be coming back to council, or at least I thought I knew that, and now it's confirmed. So um, that project, things change <laughs> quickly. And uh, But I do want to thank uh, Rob DeBow. He's worked so hard. He does what the council directs him to do. So he's been working really hard. And, um, you know, I think everyone knows that, but he's following the directions he's given, and he's fantastic at what he does. Sorry, I'm here for the pauses. A lot going on here. Um, Steve McClary, when he said that we had 5% boost in the fuel moisture load and it was 61%, my whole heart sank. 61% is still terrible. It's way better than 56. So anyone who thinks we're out of the woods on, on fire danger, absolutely not at all. I've been up in the mountains a couple of times, mountain biking the last few days, and it's really, if you're going to go hiking, now's the time. It's nice and tacky. It's not wet, but it's, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous, and it's not the just dust bowl that it's been for month after month. So now's a good time to take advantage of that. Um, hang on, sorry. Also, you know, it's continuing to feel, you know, the, what are the issues at the top of the list? The homeless situation is bad. It's difficult. It's getting worse. It's um, descends on Malibu. We are working hard on this issue. We are not backing off. You know, we've worked on, on some ordinances. We've worked with the sheriffs, which they've been great. It's still a very, very tricky issue. Um, one that I'm glad to speak with anyone about. Hard to email about it because the emails get so long. Um, so I'm glad to discuss that issue with anyone. It is a very, very complicated issue to something that is right and it's horrible in our face. Um, I attended a Santa Monica Bay Restoration Committee meeting as a director. We got a long talk on the massive amount of toxins that were dumped offshore. I know it's been in the press and the LA Times, but to hear a detailed report on the extent of the toxins dumped offshore that are sitting there in a 3,000 foot deep trench, mind blowing. And they still don't know how to pull it up. The stuff's in corroded barrels from decades back and they don't really have anything that just can pick up stuff like that. 3,000 foot and deep and deeper. Um, so that that was a head spinner right there. Um, with Steve Uren, we attended an ANF meeting and um, we will have a report coming out soon on, on good financial news, things heading in the right direction. The report's not done yet, but the, 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 it looks positive. And, um, and that was really great to see. And I just want to congratulate Lisa and, and the staff for the fine job they did being conservative, which I think was the right thing to do as we work our way through what we've all been, been living. Um, also attended a COG meeting, um, actually covered for Karen for once. She never misses, but her and she had no connection. So I, I got lucky and um, a lot of talks on redistricting. So as you know, every 10 years we get redistrict and the COG is working very hard to stay together. We do have a great relationship city um a, a callous hidden and i know i'm missing one i just can't think of it right now um and uh so working hard to keep us together we share we share the sheriff we share fire we share a lot of things in common and Okay, just to keep things moving. I'm, I know I missed a couple of things, but thank you very much. That's my report. Thank you, Mikey. Steve, your hand is in the air. You have the floor. 
Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, I would also like to thank the speakers. And I've got two, uh, just a question. Uh, do we have, and I, th I think I know the answer, do we have any control over this vaccination of kids going into the school? Do we have, do we have anything to say about that? Or do you guys have any idea of what we can do to influence that? In the short run? I, we, I, we could bring it back for discussion by the council um, is always our option. But can we can we make something happen? I I don't know. I, that's I, I mean I hear I hear I hear the passion they're talking with, uh, and you'd like to try and say if we agree with it, you know, we can do something. I'm just not sure what to do. I know oh. that I know that Craig uh, was in the face of the other members of the board trying to get them to adopt a more a more nuanced approach, but. He got no traction whatsoever. It was six to one. And it's, it's, this is the reason we need to win on district separation. It, it's, it's one of the many things that makes me want desperately to have our own school board. And see, I'm just trying to figure in the short run if there's something we can do. If, if somebody's got something, let me know. I mean, you know, I'm more than happy to try and participate in that. And I guess it goes to the, the other issue of the uh, oversized vehicles on PCH. Karen, are you saying that if we we don't have any option to change the hours, that, that we can prevent people from parking on PCH overnight? We can ask again. That question was asked, and the result we got was what we have, 12 to 2 and 2 to 4. Okay. And I agree, it's terrible. Let me work on that and think about that. I, mean, I agree with my for Richard Malika, maybe he'd be the person to talk to too. Yeah. Uh, but I guess it's coming back to the Public Safety Commission, so maybe I can learn something when it, when it hits that. Uh, Mikey's right. We did have an ANF meeting and we got some good results from uh, the work the staff had done and sort of managing the budget. And I think they're also going to come back with some ideas of some other things we may be able to do to increase the revenue for the city. So I'm sort of looking forward to that meeting. I think that'll be interesting. Uh, on, a good, on a happier note, I guess, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I got, along with some other city council people, got invited to attend a tour of the Adamson House. Uh, and it has been, um, I, I was there probably 10 or 12 years ago and forgot what a great place it is. I mean, it, the, the tour was amazing. It's, it's a look back in history. You know, I want to thank Nidra Winger and John Mazza, uh, who sort of set it up, Damian Ruddy, who was the uh, state parks person who was the host there, and Jules Hirschfeld, who did the tour. And I'll tell you, if you ever have a chance to get a tour with Jules Hirschfeld, you ought to take it. The guy knows his stuff backwards, forwards, everywhere in, the, in between. Uh, he gave us a perspective of what life was like back, uh, you know, for, for May Ringe, uh when they were living there, it, it was amazing. Uh, Westward Beach, uh, I, you know, agree with some of the comments and I'm, I'm glad it's coming back. And I want to also thank Andrew Ferguson. I, you know, I've been in contact with him in terms of some of the work he's done to help identify some of the problems there. And I think his, his, his work and identifying the issues has really helped us get a better handle on what we should be doing there. Uh, I, I do think the city needs to pull the project, and I guess we'll talk about that when it comes back. Um, I hope that the next time around, the project, we take a look at the project with a wave uprush study and a sea level rise study and a, and a parking or a traffic study, because those things were missing from this uh this round looking at this project and i gotta believe that's some reason why this thing has been in planning for five years and sort of ended up being you know in serious conflict with the environment uh hard to figure out how you know i mean maybe if we had looked at some of those things and we've known about wave uprush we've known about sea level rise for a long time so how we got here after five years without getting that understood i don't understand uh and I think that's all I got for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Bruce. Thank you, Paul. Well, first, first off, I want to say 
we're coming up on the third anniversary of the Woolsey fire. And for anyone who doesn't appreciate this or know this or appreciate it, there's a three year statute of limitations for anyone who wants to, who has been not physically injured, but whose property has been damaged by the fire and who wants a recovery. Uh, SCE has all but conceded liability. Um, there are a lot of people coming out of um, arbitration or uh, mediation who are getting checks and, and are quite happy and are able to start rebuilding. Um, please, if you've got damages, you're, it's just it's free money you're giving up. I mean, SCE is just going to walk away without paying damages for anyone who lost a home. I can't believe there'd be anyone who hasn't sued yet, but if, if you lost a home, but even if you lost part of your property, any damage, please consult with a lawyer because the time is running out. You see that on the news all the time. I'm not, this is not a uh, promotion for, I'm not going to make any money off of this. I don't do any of these lawsuits, but um, please consult a lawyer and um, see what your rights are because you won't have them again uh, a week from now or two weeks from now. I want to thank the public speakers also, all of them. Um, I'm I say this all the time, and, and I mean it. I'm always impressed by the quality of the um, conversation that we get. Um, a lot of impassioned speakers tonight, but but very rational, very cogent, um, stated their case. Uh, I I'm actually glad I don't have to make a decision on this. I mean, and, and not only do I not have to, I can't. We have we have no power, no authority over this issue. Um, you know who does? The federal courts. So, you know, if, if you feel your constitutional rights are being violated, federal courts are where you can assert that claim. Uh, I understand, I believe, I believe the U.S. Supreme Court already has allowed one of these mandates to stand over a request for emergency relief. Um, but who knows? But that, you know, that's, that's where the answer is because it's not here. We don't have any power to do anything. Um, the issue of the vehicles on PCH, you know, I, I continue to be dumbfounded by the issue of being parking. It's not, these people are not parked on PCH. I, first three years I lived in Malibu, I lived in a condominium on PCH. And I had two park, I had one parking space for two vehicles and it was lawful. And I think it still is to park my vehicle in front of the building where I lived. And leave it there overnight. That was parking. That's what you do when you park your car. You you get out of your you put your car in a space. You get out of your car and you go live your life. And in my case, I went and lived in the condominium I was paying rent for. Um, sleeping in a vehicle overnight is not parking. That's camping. That's what our camping statute says. So we we don't need hours to regulate people sleeping in their vehicles overnight on PCH or elsewhere in Malibu. It's illegal. That's, that's where the camping ordinance comes in. So I'm hopeful. I, I heard that there's going to be some conversations with between between um, sheriffs and staff about how to enforce our camping ordinance. Well, if the cars, if the if the RVs, if the cars are parked with someone sleeping in them, camping in them in a place where they're not allowed to be camping, there you go. You can enforce that. We have a constitutional statute. Um, I've been participating. You know, it's been I think it's been close to three weeks now since we had a meeting. Um, we have a weekly meeting with Cal Strat. I, I did miss this week. Um, but among other things, we've been talking about what, if anything, can we do to get our government to get the cargo ships that everybody is aware of out in our bay further away from us? Because if any of them have a spill, that's our beach. That's our ocean. So, I mean, clearly no one can do anything about making them unload because they're backed up. They, they would unload if they could, but they don't have to be parked essentially right off of our shore. They can be out further in the ocean. And I'm hoping that um, the state or federal government can step in and do something about that. Um, I've been working with uh, Mikey on city manager recruitment. Um, Karen and I have had a meeting and we'll be having another meeting with respect to the Wagner affidavit investigation. Hopefully we'll have some information to report in the short run. Um, another issue that has arisen a lot from residents over the past couple of weeks has been the arrestor lane or the runaway truck lane on Cana at PCH. Uh, apparently over the past month or so, multiple cars have driven into there. And I understand <laughs> most recently a truck which needed to drive into there didn't drive into there. It's kind of odd. But um, I've been in contact with um, Public Works of Rob DeBeau, and I, he's looking into um, whether some, some, some better indication that that lane is off limits to driving 
can be provided because I mean, a lot of people say it's well it's already very clear and people must just not be paying attention but I don't know too many people seem to be driving into it so something needs to be done and uh, we look we looked online and found some good examples elsewhere of some very clear demarcations that are better than ours so hopefully something can be done about that uh, we obviously we had a, we had a rock slide over the weekend um, on Cliffside Drive and that ties in. It's, it's not the same issue, but it's, it's a similar issue with Westward Beach. Um, you know, it was explained to me on Westward Beach, Malibu is essentially the homeowner. You know, we, we, we have property and we want to do something about our property. So we've applied for a permit and we speak through city council. City council has got a revolving door of sorts. You know, it's not the same five people every, at least every four years, it may change completely. Every two years, there's a different composition or can be. Um, seems to me when there's a multi-year process like this, um, the contractor owes it to the homeowner to come back to the homeowner and say, you know, I'm getting closer to getting to starting your project. Do you still want to go forward with it the way we previously discussed? Do you want to go forward with it at all? Um, and I'm happy to hear the homeowner is going to be consulted sometime in the near future about that product project. Um, and perhaps it'll be pulled from coastal. Maybe, you know, maybe the project will be changed sufficiently that, It'll have to be done over. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, related to that, I just want to say Coastal Commission appeals are free. And where matters appealable to Coastal, there's a right to bypass the city council if the city charges an appeal fee. So um, something I'd like to some thought given to is maybe we should repeal the fee, at least for appeals from Planning Commission approval of projects for which there's an appeal to the Coastal Commission. There can't be too many of them that it's really going to change the city's finances and it would give us some better control over our destiny because that appeal would have had to have been brought here if we didn't charge for an appeal um, that is appealable to Coastal. But since it's appealable to Coastal for free and since we charge $750, I understand a resident went forward with an appeal to Coastal because why should they waste $750 when they can go forward for free? Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is that in the past few months, I've been lobbied for various development projects. Uh, including proposed housing, af this affordable housing, workforce housing. Um, and I've been lobbied for proposed commercial development of um, certain properties, um, including some that have been mapped as ESHA. Um, and I was previously lobbied for the um, Seaview Hotel project and other projects that have come before the city council and have been approved, some of which have been disapproved. You know, th this lobbying activity to me illustrates a prime example of how the Brown Act actually works against the public interest. The Brown Act prohibits more than two of us from discussing any particular subject, the same subject outside the confines of one of these meetings. And the purpose of that, that law, good, well, 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 good purpose is to promote transparency, accountability, and ethics in government. But, it does not preclude us all from being lobbied separately by the same person who's taking each of our temperature and not let and, and can't tell us what the other is saying. And they find out which two or which three they have the most sway over. And that's where they concentrate their efforts. And if they find out that there are problems, they just they they they, they don't they don't have to worry about the problem speaking with the people who are in support of something because we're not allowed to. And it seems to me there's something wrong about that. Now, close to a year ago, Steve and I had proposed a city council policy that would help put an end to back, secret backroom discussions on things like that. And that has just sat on the shelf without ever being publicly aired or having any discussion. And I'm hoping that as we move forward, we can have a discussion about that, because I think it is a situation where it actually operates against the public interest for these things to be occurring. And um, I, I hope we can at least have a discussion about whether it's a good or bad thing and whether it ought to continue or be discontinued. Thanks for the time, Paul. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, as Mikey mentioned, this was, it's been a long time since we last met. And as Steve mentioned, uh, I also went to the Adamson House. It was a great tour. I've been there many times over the years. And it's, uh, it's you know, if you have anybody coming into town, always take them there. It, it really fleshes out why Malibu is so unique. And I think it's a great thing, wonderful. Uh, other things that I've done of interest, I went to an installation dinner for the current uh, version of Pepperdine Ambassadors Council. 
which is a group of very high functioning uh, juniors and seniors at Pepperdine that are in charge of uh, representing Pepperdine to the community at large and uh, to alumni. And these are the kind of young people that you talk to them for a while and you go, okay, there's hope for the future of America. And, and then I also was invited to the Fulbright Scholars Luncheon, not because I'm a Fulbright Scholar, uh, but because we have in our community a gentleman who was a Fulbright Scholar in 1953. And as a result of that, he has set up a, a, uh, an organization to support Fulbright Scholars who are here from other countries and he invites basically everybody in California to come to his house for lunch. And the turnout was not what it would be in a, in a uh, non-COVID time. But I met some charming, interesting people from many different countries who are going to school at Berkeley, UC San Diego, USC, UCLA, Pepperdine, UC, UC Santa Barbara. And it's, uh, there's some very smart people out there coming here from other countries in an effort to learn. And of course, we're hoping as a country that some of them decide to stick around with their brilliance. In the meantime, our, our country sends Fulbright scholars abroad to various countries so they can study things. And the, the, the basis behind all of this is that when countries have a better a picture of how the people of other countries believe we have a better chance of all living in peace. And I've got my fingers crossed on that. Uh, as the other thing I went to was an opening of the first in America Leeds net zero carbon house, which is just outside the city limits up uh, just before Yerba Buena. Uh, beautiful house. Uh, one of the key programs that made that possible was they are using a concrete that's made with 25% fly ash, which is a, a, a byproduct of an, other processes. It makes the concrete stronger and uh, much less carbon as a result of that. And the, the other thing that's really great about it is that it's actually the same price as regular concrete. And so they are talking about circulating to us a possible uh, ordinance that would require people to use this kind of concrete in every building project in Malibu. I think it's a great uh, way to improve the city without, you know, everybody's project without having it uh, cost them extra money it's easy to talk about a lot of things that cost an awful lot of money and people go, I can't afford any more of this stuff. But this is something that is basically free. It's already a, an expense they have. On Westward Beach, I'm looking forward to the improved project. And I'm hoping that uh, coastal, the coastal appeal that was filed will be withdrawn so that we have a chance to have something that coastal will like. And that's about it for right now. Oh, and the other thing is I've already, I've already talked about the need to separate schools. So that moves us on to, uh, I think we're at item three, consent calendar. Have any items been pulled from the consent calendar? One moment, let me confirm. Uh, no, no items have been pulled by the public. No items have been pulled by the public. Do any members of the commission wish to pull any items from the consent calendar? Can I see a motion to approve the consent I'll make calendar? A motion to approve the consent calendar. I'll second. I'll it. second. Go ahead. Bruce won that one. <laughs> Congratulations, Bruce. All right. Uh, Kelsey, uh, we have a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar as written. Can you take the roll, please? Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Green? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, everybody. And that brings us to item 4A. 
And I'm hoping that uh, that we are, we have been asked if it would be possible to hold 4A and 4B together. They are very similar. The same uh, the same appeal grounds are on both of them. And I can't see a problem with holding them together, but I will yield to the wishes of the council. Do you need a motion? Bruce? Yeah, I, I actually, I don't know where that request came from, but I was going to make that same request, but I would like to know from John Cotty whether we can lawfully do that before we go ahead and do it. John? Yes, Mayor Gasanti, members of the council, good evening. I think you can hold those appeals together. I would just ask that you ask the members of the public that if they're uh, making comments as to one specific item, that they let the council know. And if they, uh, if a public speaker wants to speak on both items, that you give them additional time to address concerns related to both appeals to the extent they're different. Other than that, I think you can hear those together. Um, I think that's a, a fair request. Thank you. Okay. Are you ready to go forward with this? Do we, have a, we have a motion to, to hear them both together. I'll second. Motion and second to hear them as one item. All those in favor? I'm sorry, we can't do that. We have to ask Kelsey. <laughs> yes, and I'm sorry, neighbor Santi. I missed who made the motion. Was that a motion from you? Uh, yes, it was. Okay, then Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, we need a staff report at this point. All righty. Can you guys hear me okay? We can see you okay. All right, great. Thank you, uh, Parker and Alex. Um, so good evening, Mayor Grisanti, members of the City Council. The next items tonight are for two appeals to two separate Verizon Wireless Communication Facilities approved by the Planning Commission. Both projects are within the public right-of-way. I'll be addressing the items by their agenda number. 4A is WCF 2010 and 4B is WCF 2011. Both facilities are proposed on utility poles. Next slide, please. Item 4A is located on PCH near Lechuza Beach, and 4B is located on Canyon Doom Road about halfway up from PCH and the north city border. Next slide, please. In June of 2020, the projects were submitted to the city. In September of 2020, the projects were deemed complete. The city council adopted ordinance 477U in resolution number 20-65 in December of 2020, which amended the design standards for wireless communications facilities in the right of way. In June of 2021, the planning commission approved the items before you tonight. Next slide, please. Item 4A is for a replacement utility pool and a, a replacement Verizon wireless uh, facility. Item 4B is for another replacement utility pool and another replacement facility. Both require a variance for height taller than four, uh, 28 feet and also a site plan review for placement within the public right of way. Next slide, please. Um, item 4A as shown here is proposing to replace an existing utility pool with a, uh, and an existing wireless facility with a new pool and an upgraded facility. The existing pool is 38 feet tall and the new pole is proposed to be 52 feet tall. Next slide, please. Item 4B is proposing to replace two poles with one, an existing utility pole and, a, and an existing standalone monopole that hosts uh, the wireless facility. The proposal is to install one pole that hosts the utilities and the wireless facility. The existing utility pole is 39 feet tall, and the new pole is proposed to be 48 feet tall. This facility also proposes a backup battery unit to serve the facility in times of emergency and power outages. Next slide, please. Ms. Lonnie Gordon appealed the Planning Commission decisions for item 4A and 4B. The appeal items were as follows. The Planning Commission did not have the jurisdiction to approve the project. The approval was not supported by sufficient evidence. There was a lack of review for safety and code compliance. 
and there were objections to condition numbers 3, 11, 18, 38, 52, 53, and 54. Staff goes into further detail about the appeal items in the staff report. Next slide, please. It was brought to our attention that uh, the notices that were attached to the staff report had uh, incorrect maps. However, uh, even though that was true, we did verify that the notices that went out, that the maps were correct as shown here. Next slide, please. With that, staff is recommending that the city council adopt resolution numbers 2157 and 2158, denying the appeals and approving the project as conditioned. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess we're at clock council member disclosures. Uh, like everyone else, I'm sure I've received a lot of mail about this and including as recently as yesterday. And uh, I've responded to the extent of thanking people for their letters and nothing much else. Does anyone else have any disclosures? Bruce? Yeah, so, um, you know, consistent with my um, policy, I, no ex parte discussions with anybody. Um, but we're all we're often we're always asked, did you did you learn anything in advance of the hearing that's not in the staff report or the the materials before us? And the answer is, as a result of conversation, not conversations, email communications with members of the staff and with city's council, I did learn two important things. Uh, and the bearing of them I'll discuss later, but the two things I learned that I don't believe are in the report anywhere that I could find are one, these are not small cell applications. That was confirmed to me by um, both the city staff as well as the city attorney. And um, the other thing I learned was that the um, small cell order upon which Verizon relies doesn't necessarily apply to non-small cell applications. Uh, contrary to all of what is told to us in the report, uh, and that I got that information, I got that from the city's um, special counsel on um, cellular matters, on telecommunications matters. It's an open question of whether the, that order, which we're told, compels certain things, applies to this. So those are the two things I learned, which are not in the report. Thank you, Bruce. Karen, do you have anything? No, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Steve. Do you have anything? Uh, no, I've got nothing, but I have a question with, before we, if I could ask, you tell me when's a good time to do that. I guess that's the question is, what's the question? The question is, what, uh, 4A, 4B has got a backup battery unit to it. Does 4A have the same thing? No, uh, it does not. It does not. It does not. Mikey? Uh, no, no, no disclosures. Um, I, uh, I mean, a lot of emails. I didn't, I don't think I actually discussed with anybody. I mean, it's been such an ongoing subject. It's hard to blend the line on, you know, what conversation goes with what. I guess really the only question I have is I didn't quite understand the second point Bruce said. Um, my note doesn't make sense. So at some point I'll, I'll make sure I understand what he said better. And I, I think. I think that's it. Okay. I believe it's now uh, appropriate for the appellant team to present. Are they yeah. present? Uh, we have Lonnie Gordon here, and then I believe she's also going to have Scott McCullough and Susan Foster speak on her behalf, but we'll unmute Lonnie first, and she can let us know how they want to use their time. Thank you. Can you hear Hi, Lonnie, me? Lonnie, are you in the room? I am. Can you hear me? We can. Good, great. Good evening, everyone. Lonnie, uh, I just want to check. I'm setting your timer for 15 minutes. Do you want to save any time for rebuttal? Um, for my team, because I'm only going to speak for a minute. It's just a thank, do a thank you, and I'm turning it over to Scott and Susan because I'm not able to continue it on my own. So um, I would, yes, save whatever time there is. I think this will be a minute. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you for asking. I appreciate it. And good evening, everyone. First, I want to thank you for granting the continuance that you did in my other appeals so I could get representation. 
And thank you as well for the kind words of support about my condition. I'm still working through all of that, but hope to soon be back at full strength, <laughs> soon. Second, because we heard that there were many speakers tonight on different subjects, we decided to keep our speakers to a minimum and let our appeal speak for itself. I'm gonna let Scott and Susan present my case tonight on these two appeals, but I do wanna briefly mention the larger issue. Several of the issues before you tonight would not be issues if there, if there were not these gap cases filed before Ordinance 477 and therefore supposedly not fully subject to its requirements. We're still working through the non-row gap cases, but on row projects, the gate will remain open until you bring 477 up to speed with the other ordinance and then secure Coastal Commission approval of the LIP pieces. I urge you to get the 477 update done and then push staff to get the LIP changes approved. They need to do that. This is all taking way too long. We must finally get to a place where all ordinances and the LIP provisions are in place so that at some point we can eliminate the gap problems that keep popping up. Thank you so much. And I now turn this over to Scott and Susan. Hi, Scott and Susan. Hey, hello, um, this is Scott McCullough. Um, we signed up as uh, against, that is because we oppose the staff resolution. We ask you to grant Lonnie's appeal and deny these two permits. It was, by the way, a good idea to hear them together. Uh, we may need a little bit more than 15 minutes total if, if we are addressing both of them. <laughs> The major issue we presented in these appeals uh, related to uh, code compliance demonstrations before approval. Uh, we, we basically lost that issue a couple of weeks ago, and so I'm not going to take uh, much time on that tonight. Um, we, we don't waive our position, but we recognize what you ruled and think it would be kind of pointless to try to relitigate that tonight. Uh, but let, let me get to some other topics. But first, um, there's been some debate between myself and, and staff about the extent to which the Malibu Municipal Code and the local implementation plan, how they interoperate, whether one takes precedence over the other. And we keep getting inconsistent indications from staff. Um, last night before the Planning Commission, they insisted that they were enforcing both ordinances and imposing the higher burdens in the MMC where they could. But that's not true. And you can look at that in the packet that you have tonight simply by reading pages four, six, and 179. In those three places, staff continues to insist that the LIP, uh, and this is the old LIP, takes precedence over the Malibu Municipal Code provisions to the extent they conflict. And that is simply not true. It would only be true um, if the Malibu Municipal Code set a lower standard than the than for the coastal development permit, and it was not possible to comply with each of them at the same time. But since the Malibu Municipal Code, in many instances, imposes a higher burden, then they can coexist. Um, second, on coastal matters, this this is an appealable action. Um, it is an appealable action because it is a public's work project. Now, we don't know what the total cost is. I know just generally the facilities of this course cost at least $150,000 in capital. And there's going to be probably that much by way of expenses, too. And so that means it's a major public work problem project, which means it is appealable to coast. So we, we very much disagree with the proposition this is not appealable. Next issue. Horizon asserts, but it has never provided any evidence that it will be providing personal wireless service over this facility. They say they will. They provide no proof that they will. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because if they are not going to be providing personal wireless service through this facility, they are not entitled to the protections of the federal act. They can still get a, a permit under the LIP and the MMC, your, your, your code addresses all telecommunications, all wireless telecommunications, but they would not have the protections of the federal act. 
And that means that all the things that staff says the Federal Act preempts you from being able to do would not be preempted. So there's been a major failure proof by Verizon that it is entitled to all the protections of the Act. They have never demonstrated that they will, in fact, be provided personal wireless service through this facility. And we, in, in our planning commission filing, we gave some very specific questions that could be asked to address that. Simply, will this facility handle any VOLTE barrier traffic uh, over wireless logical channels delivered through the physical path between this facility and the user's equipment? If the answer is no, then they're not providing a personal wireless service and they are not entitled to the federal protection. Next topic. The staff seems intent on unilaterally handing out waivers and variances to the wireless industry, even when they don't ask for them. In addition to the variance waivers, waivers specifically addressed in the agenda report, staff also waived the express LIP requirement and the functional requirement in the old version the Malibu code that the appellate would provide coverage maps and include an alternative location analysis. Now, why is that important here? That is important here because this, the, the council needs to be able to make intelligent determinations as to whether the location proposed by Verizon is the best or at least the least worst location in order to meet its coverage requirements. We do not know what its coverage requirements are because staff didn't make them tell us that either. But even if you accept those coverage requirements, whatever they may be, we do not know what, whether this locate, whether there's some other location nearby, as there is with the PCH, PCH uh, application, that's uh, item A, uh, where there's a pole right down the street that could probably uh, easily suffice. Now, the, they, they argue that the federal, uh, that the commission, the federal commission said that coverage maps can no longer be required. That's not true. That is only correct with regard to a determination of need. In other words, coverage requirements. That does not mean you cannot require coverage analyses and alternative location analyses when the question is whether the specific location is the appropriate one. That is completely separate from need. Verizon doesn't have a federal right to put whatever it wants, wherever it wants, nor does it have the state right to just place facilities anywhere in the public right of way. This is especially so if it will incommode the public. Blocking safe egress, which is something Susan's going to talk about in a minute, is definitely something that would incommode the public. And for that reason, at least, you should deny the PCH, item A. And you should certainly demand better proof that the uh, Canaan Doom uh, site is the least worst, if not the best. Now, I'm going to turn over now to Susan Foster, who's going to speak a little bit more about the safety issues with regard to a location determination. Let me be clear. We're not trying to re-argue you should make, make all the safety code findings. We're saying there is a fire safety issue based on the proposed location. Susan, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Scott. Good evening, Mayor Grisanti and City Council. In 2020, I was asked by then Mayor Mikey Pearson to perhaps stick around and assist Malibu in creating a community that is more fire safe. I joined with Scott McCullough, as you know, and electrical engineer Tony Simmons, who is currently working on the grid across the country. We all know that Malibu has burned not once, but twice in the last 15 years as a result of telecom-initiated fires. Our discovery of telecom-linked fires does not stop with Malibu, yet this list begins with your city. Malibu Canyon Fire, 2007. There was structural overloading of utility poles that snapped in the wind and ignited the grass below. Woolsey Fire 2018, a lashing wire came loose, dropping telecom fiber, which ignited the grass below, igniting at least one of the two ignition points for the $6 billion fire still under criminal investigation. Over 400 homes in Malibu were destroyed. 
Telecom caused or contributed to other nearby fires. Silverado Fire 2020. In Irvine, a faulty lashing wire belonging to T-Mobile came loose, igniting the grass below. Gehito Fire 2007. A telecom lashing wire triggered the Gehito Fire, which merged with the Witch Creek Fire, making it the worst fire in San Diego history. Cox Communications settled with SDG&E for $444 million. We have probably not captured all of the telecom initiated fires in this area, but these four tell us why you must think about fire events at every stage and for several issues before you approve these permit applications. Safety is not just about code compliance, although that is certainly key. You also need to think about what will happen if a code compliant facility begins to burn. You need to plan in advance and figure out things like escape routes. When you are permitting, one of your location decisions must be whether the proposed site may impede firefighting or prevent people from escaping. Mr. Sullivan, representing Verizon, says a coverage map is not necessary. Well, according to the old ordinance, which according to staff covers the appeals we are bringing tonight, the coverage map is about more than just need. The LIP expressly says the carrier is to provide a coverage map and an alternate site analysis to assist in the determination of whether the specific proposed site is safe and appropriate based on other criteria like aesthetics and safety. The location of the tower that bothers me tremendously is the one at 31557.5. Um, Alex, could we please see the Google map Mr. McCullough sent you? Um, thank okay. you very much. Your team has just under three minutes left. Okay, thank you. This cell tower could not have been this cellar, cell tower could have been placed elsewhere. It could have been placed down PCH where there's another utility pole that is not in front of one or more families' driveways. Now, I see Bob Ross in the room. So when we are done speaking, could we please ask Bob Ross if Verizon can meet its coverage requirements? If the PCH facility moves to the pole a little to the west of where it is currently at the base of someone's driveway. Here's what bothers me about this location. What if a fire starts in this cell tower? For example, imagine this cell tower ignites because of a transient like those that occur when the power is turned off or when the tower is turned back on during high wind events. Every one of us who has lived in California knows this is happening with increasing regularity and it never comes without a sense of fear because there's good reason for it. These families need room for escape. When I zoom in on the map with the cell tower on PCH, I count up to 15 homes where their escape is essentially right by the cell tower. If this cell tower itself is the reason for the fire, these families are trapped. As we've told you before, cell tower fires are electrical fires and cannot be fought through conventional means. Typically, fire departments allow cell tower fires to burn themselves out. If the wind is blowing at 30, 40 miles an hour, how in the world are these families going to escape if a fire is blocking their one route of egress? City Council, you can and must keep these towers away from people's driveways and entrances and exits to the neighborhoods. Using the language of the LIP alone, you have the right to a coverage map and an alternate siting analysis should be undertaken. You would then be able to decide if the pole I showed you just up the road is a better location with a yellow arrow there. I am imploring you, do not Susan, put these towers- just under a minute left if you wanna save some time for rebuttal. Right, thank you very much. I am imploring you, do not put these towers by residential neighborhoods or at the base of people's driveways. It is all about location, location, location. Please use the local safety control you are given to maximize escape opportunities for your residents. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. I believe that brings us to the applicant presenting. 
Is the applicant team in the room? Yes, we're unmuting them now. They are Todd Smith and Daisy. And Mary um, Santi, I actually have a question, if um, if I may. Oh, please. What's the question? Um, in light of the request by council or the decision by council tonight to combine both items, we actually had prepared to do two presentations, but we're going to do our best to consolidate and skip over areas on the two slide decks that are um, relatively similar or similar. And in addition to that, I guess um, I question, I have a question regarding how you want to address the time. Typically, we would have 15 minutes per item. Um, and so since we're consolidating our presentation in a sense by going one after the other, um, are we then granted collectively um, or cumulatively 30 minutes? If you want to use 30 minutes, then we're going to have to add another 15 minute to the appellant's time. I'm not anticipating using 30 minutes, Mayor, but I just wanted to know if that was something that is available for us because, like I said, we, we were prepared to do two presentations today. I'm, I'm perfectly willing to... I, I can ask the council's opinion of it, but I think that if uh, I think our, our attorney warned us in the beginning that uh, that it may be that we we may have to spend some extra time on the on the for the individual things if that's something that's going to go on. And I see Bruce's hand, and then followed by Karen's hand. Well, for what it's worth, I I support allowing the parties up to 30 minutes, but I think that the um, applicant should declare how much time up to 30 minutes they're going to take before they start. It shouldn't be that they take what they need and then the appellant is limited to the, the additional time that actually was taken. So they, they should actually say now whether they need another 15 minutes, another 10 minutes, another five minutes, whatever it is, and then whatever they ask for that same time period should then be accorded to the applicant, but the appellant. It shouldn't be that they just get to speak until they're done. If they manage to finish in three minutes, then we tack on three more minutes because they should have to just say what they're going to take up front. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Karen, I see your hand. Yeah, I was going to say something similar. Um, obviously, we want to give equal time to both sides. So perhaps uh, the applicant can give us a, an estimation now so the appellant can um, be prepared. Daisy, would you like to give us a try that, giving us a... Yeah, I'm certainly happy to do that, Mayor um, and Council Members. Um, we are estimating utilizing about 10 minutes per slide uh, or less, and then we were estimating about five minutes per project for rebuttal. So really we're looking at you know 20 minutes in one swoop to go over the two slides quickly. We anticipate it to be less than that because like I said, I'll be skipping pages that are similar um, where it's uh, consistent with the both, with two projects. So, but estimating wise right now, I'm thinking 20 minutes total um, and then 10 minutes for rebuttal total for both projects. Well, I imagine we're gonna end up uh, asking questions of both the appellant and the, and the uh, applicant group as well, which may take care of the extra time. Bruce? Well, it sounded to me like um, the applicant just said they want 30 minutes. It so, did, they did say that. I was trying to talk them out of it, but that's that's what, I, what they said. They so said they want you, 20 minutes to speak, and they're hoping to have uh, 10 minutes for, for rebuttal. So why, why don't we just give them the 30 minutes, and then the appellant gets 15 minutes for rebuttal? That works for me. Any objections? All right, Daisy, you're on. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, we appreciate the opportunity today to share our project details with you and be able to answer any questions that you have about our project. Uh, we do have um, on deck today myself, as well as our legal counsel, Kevin Sullivan, as well as Todd Smith, who's the project a site development consultant that um, works on this project. Um, please go to slide three. 
So the site location is already discussed earlier by staff. Um, so it is an existing site location. I do want to remind everybody that the site has been there uh, for quite some time and we'll go into that detail in a little bit. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, I just wanted to point out additional details about this particular existing site location. Um, what you may notice that between the left photo and the right photo, our proposed design is actually a sleeker, um, cleaner design. And uh, the location of the particular pole is at the edge of the driveway in the public right of way. So it is as far as possible from the home as, as we could possibly put it. Um, the plan here is for the new design to paint the pole to match. So the difference between the old design and the new design is to make it less obtrusive in that sense, as required by the city's code. Uh, furthermore, uh, a lot of our proposed design are actually a bit screened by trees, um, so it's less obtrusive. So I just wanted to share that with you, that you can see the difference from the left to the right here from the existing site as it exists today. We are actually proposing a cleaner look um, for the new poll. Next slide, please. A few more items I wanted to share with you that what we're proposing here is to upgrade an existing wireless facility um, that is currently attached to a wooden utility pole. It is on the inland parkway side in the public right of way at PCH. The existing pole itself has been at that particular location since 1947, and the wireless installation was added in 2010. So it's been around for quite some time. So what Verizon is proposing to do here is actually upgrade this facility in order to provide a capacity solution and improve service capabilities in this general area on PCH. As it stands today, this facility provides voice, provides text, and other wireless services accessing, such as accessing the internet. So all of those are currently already being provided and we are upgrading that with our new um, equipment that is being proposed in this poll. The proposed small cell facility is located in PCH, and according to Caltrans, average daily traffic, there are approximately about 16,700 average daily trips on PCH at this location. So it is a highly traversed location. Next slide, please. So the existing pole height today, as it exists, already exceeds 28 feet. As indicated by staff, it's at 38 feet currently. What we're proposing is to bring it up to 52 feet. The additional height is necessary for Verizon to be compliant for safety reasons with GO95 or General Order 95 rules under the CPUC or the California Public Utilities Commission. So this is a requirement that we are adhering to and that that particular order, GO95, is actually specifically for safety reasons. In addition to that, Verizon's design has also been approved and meets SEE requirements for safety guidelines as well. So the height um, addition that we're proposing here is basically to allow for us to be complied with those two requirements and also comply with the design requirements that SEE has on this poll. Next slide, please. So in a few of our letters um, and also at Planning Commission, we had indicated that there's no retroactive application of the law um, with regards to the new wireless facility regulations. So this is both under state law and federal law, and the same argument we will actually um, carry over to this, pro the, this project, the next project, and the last project today. So under um, Government Code Section 6594.3, um, basically, you cannot retroactively apply um, new wireless regulations. You can only prospectively apply them. Same thing is stated, um, or similar thing is stated under federal law, where um, you are required to um, be able to process facilities on a proactive basis, basis as a pro prospective basis as opposed to a retrospective basis. Next slide, please. So just want to clarify, there is a typo here. It does not say, um, it should not say small cells. Um, this, these two particular projects are not small cells in the sense of um, the, high, the, the various dimension or requirements of what a small cell is. So, um, and they are existing sites, um, again, which is, you know, a different kind of review um, compared to um, new sites that we're proposing to replace. And we do have the right as a public utility provider under PUC code 7901 for us to be able to install equipment in the public right of way. Next, please. So at Planning Commission, we did raise a bunch of um, 
objections to conditions, specifically condi conditions 1, 30, 31, 37, 43, and 56. These same conditions are also uh, applicable to the next project. So I just wanted to state that so we won't go over that again. In addition to that, we also sent a letter detailing our uh, how we're addressing the specific appellant's concerns in a letter that was sent to City Council previously. Next slide, please. So these are just the details and the conditions. Um, and um, you know, staff has indicated what these conditions are in the report, so I will not go over them. Next, please. So that's the first project. Next project. Can I check time, please, Kelsey? You have just under 14 minutes. Okay. Next slide, please go to all the way to slide three. Okay, so the location has been um, discussed by staff, so we'll skip that. Slide four, please. So slide four here. Again, we are proposing for this existing site a cleaner design. There are two poles right now in the existing site, the main pole and the buddy pole. So with our new design, we're actually proposing it to be sleeker, removing the buddy pole. In addition to that, uh, Verizon is proposing to add a BBU or a battery backup unit, which is a unique thing that we've actually designed for the city of Malibu. And um, it is a limited power backup unit that allows us to provide additional power to this particular node. We didn't propose it for the other location. We've selected certain locations where we think that we needed it the most, and this is one of the areas. In addition to that, we're also painting this pole to match, which she didn't quite have before. In addition to that, we are also distant from homes. Next slide, please. So Verizon again proposes to upgrade this existing wireless facility. Um, this is uh, on the Westward uh, Parkway of the public right away on Canaan Doom. The original pole was set in 1979, so it's been there even longer than the other pole. And our wireless installation was installed around 2010. So for the same reason, we're proposing an upgrade for capacity solutions on a highly traveled road, which is Canaan Doom classified as a major arterial in the circulation element of the City of Malibu General Plan. Next slide, please. So for similar reasons as earlier, the existing pole does exist, exist and is taller than 28 feet. So it's currently, I believe, 39, and um, we are increasing the height to 48. And the reasons that we're increasing the height is again for GEO 95 state CPUC standards, SE requirements, as well as um, SDE design requirements for safety reasons as well. So this is the same argument as the other one earlier, so I'll skip through all of this all the way down to the end because there's similar arguments from the previous slide. That concludes our, our presentation for the moment. We are definitely open for any questions um, from you know, council or staff, and um, thank you for the opportunity to present. Thank you. Uh, it is now appropriate for us to hear public comment. So I would imagine that there probably is some. Kelsey, is, is there anyone waiting signed in? Yes, we do have a few speakers here. I'm just checking who we have in the meeting. Uh, the first speaker present is Jenny Rosinko. Hi, Jenny, are you available? I'm here, yes, thank you. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you perfectly, thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Okay, um, my comments apply to both 4A and 4B on tonight's agenda. Um, it's also important to note that I'm speaking on behalf of a large group of Malibu residents. Uh, we chose to limit our speakers tonight knowing that public comments might take up much of your time and energy this evening. Okay, although our group of concerned community members have been following this process, we still cannot tell what rules the staff is applying to these projects. And we cannot understand why they unilaterally grant Verizon waivers and variances from the rules they claim apply. They say that LIP applies, but they do not enforce the LIP 3.16.9.B.9 coverage map requirement or the MMC 17.46.100 minimum application requirements that functionally demand a coverage map. I know Scott and Susan talked about coverage maps, so I'll just talk a little more about it though. 
Um, a major reason for requiring coverage map is to determine whether alternatives exist for providing coverage. This was the stated purpose in the LIP and expressly reserves determinations on location to local city and authorities. Coverage maps are key to the location decision and Verizon has refused to provide this information. The coverage map tells staff and interested residents like us where Verizon has adequate coverage and where they don't. It tells staff and Malibu residents where a safer, less visible location may be if Verizon's preferred location is undesirable for some reason. We have come before the city council for a year and expressed our concerns about the potential for fires within cell towers, as Susan Foster talked about. Yet one of the cell towers we are appealing is proposed at the entrance of a residential driveway where they have no other exit from the property. There is no evidence provided on potential alternative locations for this installation. Why doesn't Verizon supply the coverage map to allow a safer, more aesthetically pleasing location? We are not challenging the need for these installations, but rather, as Scott said, advocating for the least worst place for them. For this particular installation, there is a site only two to three utility poles away that does not block the only exit from residential properties. We know this because we have physically driven to the location site. Coverage maps give everyone the opportunity to see alternative locations without having to physically drive to the site. So we believe that especially um, the site, the PCH site is inappropriate and possibly dangerous. I doubt any of you would want that in your driveway. I know that I would not. Verizon's refusal to investigate alternatives or provide any information that could be used to determine potential alternatives leaves the city council no choice but to deny these permits for 4A and 4B. Please grant Lonnie's appeal and deny these applications from Verizon for 4A and 4B and update PROW ordinance to stop accumulating gap applications. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenny. Who do we, else do we have in the room? Our next speaker is Jeff Laux. Hi, Jeff, are you in the room? We have unmuted the person in the room under Lauren Laux. Jeff, if you're there, please try speaking. Should we circle back? Yes, not sure what the issue is. We can try to come back in a moment. Our next speaker, I'm just confirming that here. Our next speaker is Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Are you available? Yes, I am. Um, I want to start off generically in speaking to both sites, um, and that is that each of these locations currently has state-of-the-art working service, as I would call it, for voice and text calling, that um, neither site has an operational problem. And Verizon has specifically fought the city and the city staff and consultant and the public requesting coverage maps for these areas because there's no coverage problem. Look, if you haven't dropped call problem, you're probably not on Verizon at these two locations. And so... This uh, proposal before you, denial of both or one of these as configured and proposed on paper, won't materially affect Verizon's coverage in this immediate area. Certainly will not improve any other subscriber's coverage in this area, such as AT&T or T-Mobile or Sprint. So um, the red flag is the refusal of the coverage maps because there, there really ain't no problem here. And the... The bigger issue is what is Verizon up to and is any of this true in what they state in their reports? And I'll get to that later. Um, it's That's a very um, problematic situation you're, you're presented with. Um, the real or imagined coverage gaps that just, you know, are not there and they won't provide any data to prove that there is and we pretty much know there isn't. The history of this is that the uh, system Verizon operates is was the first system uh, established in Malibu, and they had the pick of all the poles. 
there were no other carriers on any poles. And they picked Pacific Coast Highway, this area, coming down from Encinal, uh, down toward the Civic Center, and put in this string of microcells interconnected with fiber optic cable. They picked and chose. They were the first, they had first dibs, and they put in a system that worked. I, I drove it for 20 years without dropped calls with Verizon along Pacific Coast Highway. So we don't have a problem to fix. Now that's the first thing we gotta figure out here is what are they up to? And the second is it's all about the height. The city of Malibu has a 28 foot height limit. And if they wanna do something, which there isn't really a problem to fix and wanna go beyond 28 feet, that's a visual and view blockage problem. And you do have the rights to mitigate those problems. So I will need my my total of six minutes. I can um, either speak on specific sites now after this, or I'd like to know how the parliamentarian is going to cover that uh, right. I think we're a little short of parliamentarians at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Dr. Sanchez, I would just allow Ryan to continue speaking and finish his presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, so... <clears throat> Knowing that there's no gap or problem in coverage, I requested the original permit for the site on Canaan. And I actually went there and climbed the hillside and looked at it. I remember this one. It's the only one of the Canaan string, which I think is fed from Agura. It's the last of the, the fiber. And I suspect it was put in without a permit. That's why your city staff can't find it because our city staff was up to speed in 1998, 1999, 2000. We were sued by Sprint, I think in 2001 and the permit files should contain it. It wouldn't be the first one that Verizon put in without a permit. There was another one, I, I can't recall if it was Decker or Encinal, it was one of those two. They put one in the city limits and, and then they asked for approval later. And they, they it was, but ugly. I'm sorry. It was not even on a power pole. They went across the street onto a stabilizing pole and said that was an Edison pole. And it was already put in. Now, I want to go back and say on the one on Canaan, if you look at Google Maps and they have no axe to grind, it shows the history. In 2016, the antennas are on the single tall power pole and the equipment is in a box at the side of the road. And if you advance to April of 19, which would be after the Woolsey fire, the antennas are on a new parallel pole right next to the taller pole and no further equipment on the pole. And if, if you recall, just a, a less, about a year later in 2020 is when they applied to uh, go higher on this pole and replace it. And then you go to Google March of 2021, the antennas are on um, the shorter pole, and there's now radio equipment mounted onto the pole, which we do not allow. Our code does not allow it. They would have needed a permit. We're doing it now. We're doing it in arrears. This is a permitting violation. It should have been a code enforcement issue, and it does not comport to the Malibu Municipal Code. So nice try, Verizon, but you got your equipment box on the ground in a very protected, fire-protected metal box, that's where your batteries are supposed to be. It's where your radios are supposed to be. And I don't know why, I mean, I welcome a bigger battery pack if they want to put in a second box. But they they should not be, uh, be allowed to put the batteries, which, you know, or can cause and start a fire on a wooden pole. And why is this a wooden pole when the poles on Malibu Canyon are metal and won't burn? We're supposed to be hardening the network system here and with our tradition of fires and the success of Malibu Canyon, it really should be a metal pole. And Edison should uh, have a say to you. And I, there, there's silence from Edison on the poles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. And Mayor, now we can try circling back to Jeff Laux to see if he's available and he should be our final speaker. Thank you. Jeff, are you available? Are you there, Jeff? Jeff or Lauren, you are unmuted.
I'm guessing there's some sort of technical problem. I see uh, Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein has raised his hand. Do you have a solution for us? I don't have a solution for you, though. This may help facilitate the solution. I was wondering if I could request that we take our short break now before the speaker, if, so we can find the speaker and also before the appellant and applicant do the rebuttal. Well, I see it's uh, it's after 9.15. We usually stop for a moment be right around 20 minutes ago. So I'm, I'm totally okay with that. Is everyone uh, okay with 10 minutes? Is 10 minutes okay? So we're gonna put everybody on pause for 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please turn off your cameras and microphones. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, if you are ha Jeff Laux, if you are having technical difficulties while the meeting's on recess, you can contact our media technician Parker Davis at 424-395-6433. That's 
6433 and we can help you get connected.
we are all back here together. And I didn't make a good note of the time, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that we're right around the right time. So can we rejoin the meeting? Has Mr. Luke's been able to figure out a way to connect? Alex, were you able to connect with him? Do you know if he's going to try calling into the meeting? I know he was having microphone issues. Yeah, I did speak with him and I did uh, help him try to call in, but I don't see him in the meeting. Um, so I don't know if he was successful with that. Right, I don't see any um, the only call in user. We have a couple of call in users, but none under the Lauk's name. Okay. Well, I, th I think we gave it the old college try. We can move on to rebuttal if you'd like. I, I would like to move on to rebuttal, and it says on my notes that appellant rebuttal goes first. Yes, so I have 15 minutes for the appellant rebuttal, and then the applicant can have up to 21 minutes based on the time they used. Thank you. Hello, I, I doubt I'll be using all of the time y'all have given us. Um, let me just try to clean up on a couple of things. <clears throat> First of all, this issue of retroactivity. You know, I get their argument, but, you know, one of the fundamental um, differences in, in, in law with regard to retroactivity is uh, retroactive application of substance versus a new procedure. One of the significant things that happened when you did your um, uh, urgency ordinance was that you decided there would be an administrative appeal of these sorts of matters. It wouldn't go before council, um, nor would it even go to the planning commission. Now, as you know, the community opposed that, but that is what you voted to do. And, and so, um, and, and that's a matter of procedure. It would not have changed the substance. It would have been perfectly permissible, even under the staff's and, and Verizon's arguments about retroactivity, for you to have applied that procedural route to these applications. But for whatever reason, staff decided to go to the Planning Commission, and we had to file a protective appeal towards you. Uh, you know, we very strongly urge that at least with regard to the procedure in the uh, Ordinance 477 of doing an administrative appeal. That is where you need to send this because you lack jurisdiction, as did the Planning Commission. What you should be required to do is vacate the Planning Commission decision and require that the proper procedure, the procedure in the urgency ordinance, Ordinance 477, be followed here. A decision by the planning director recourse to a hearing exam. Now, I disagree with the retroactivity with regard to some of the other substantive things. Uh, first of all, most both of the statutes, federal and state, that talk about retroactivity have to do with things, especially things like application content. Our contentions are not about application content. They are about substantive requirements. And here, our main point with regard to the location choice is not a retroactive application in any event. The old MMC, not the new MMC by virtue of the urgency ordinance, the old MMC, 1746, is the one that required a coverage map and an alternative location analysis. The current LIP, the current LIP, which has been in effect for quite some time, even before this application was filed, requires a coverage map and an alternative location analysis. So the retroactivity argument does not apply to that. Now, I, I also want to just take a minute to point out couple of Verizon slides where they were objecting to conditions 
um, that came out of the Planning Commission, Verizon did not appeal to you. They are not an appellant. Therefore, they cannot contest any of the conditions that were granted by the Planning Commission. This is all about the issues that we filed in our appeals. And we've tried really hard to stick to the ones that we filed. The um, last uh, thing I want to talk about, actually, there's two more. Um, you know, we keep talking about these coverage maps and location analyses. And, and, and Susan asked this question. I'm hopeful that you will ask. Bob, this question, um, with regard to the PCH site, could Verizon still meet its coverage determinations, whatever they are, we don't know what they are, but whatever they are, by moving this facility down a couple of poles, would it still meet its coverage requirements? We don't know. We think it would, but hopefully Bob would be able to tell you whether Verizon could still meet its coverage requirements by moving this facility down a couple of poles. And if he doesn't know the answer to that question, then that certainly points out the whole problem with the way this thing has been managed from the beginning. Your own consultant doesn't know what the, what the coverage needs are for this application and, and whether this is indeed the best location for it. <clears throat> I know this last issue is, is, is very highly technical and probably confusing, but I continue to insist that Verizon has not shown that it's entitled to the protections of federal law here. They say that this facility will support voice, but that doesn't get them across the threshold. I have every reason to believe that this facility is not going to, once it is completely finished, is not going to be the facility that in fact provides the voice communications channel, the VOLTE bearer channel to end user devices that are within its area. It may provide data service. It probably will provide data service, but we do not know whether it will be the thing that provides the voice grade bearer channel. I have every reason to suspect that that will instead come from a nearby macro tower. And that is because of the way these, these networks, especially LTE networks, are configured. It costs more money to be able to handle VOLTE out of these lower to the ground, uh, quasi smaller cell facilities. I agree, by the way, this is not a small cell, but it is a smaller than macro tower. And so the question remains, is Verizon entitled to the federal law here? And the only reason they would be is if they are, in fact, providing personal wireless service. And the only way they can do that if the voice, the VOLTE bearer channel itself will be provided by this facility. Um, you know, I think I'm going to give you back the remaining eight minutes. I'm hopeful we'll be able to have a little bit of discussion. I'm sure you have some questions, but that's all there is in my prepared remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Is the uh, applicant available to rebut? Yes, Mr. Mayor, um, applicants available to rebut. Um, we do we only have three minutes? I thought we had. I'm adjusting the timer right now. Okay, cool. Thank you. Just wanted to confirm. Looks like 21 minutes to me. Daisy, you can go ahead and start. Okay. Um, thank you again, um, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I will actually share part of my rebuttal with Kevin Sullivan towards the end of it. Um, one, just a couple of things that I also want to reiterate here. I think there's a bit of confusion as far as, you know, what the requirements are under the FCC. Verizon under the FCC is required to just show that we are identifying our network or improve our services. We are doing both with this particular upgrade for these existing facilities. Um, so coverage um, maps are not part of that equation. 
So densifying the network is definitely what we're doing. Upgrading the services is definitely what we're doing. Um, I also want to share the fact that um, one of the reasons we're upgrading this facility in this location is, or these two locations, is mainly because a lot of the equipment that's on the facility right now are actually dated. So we want to be able to bring Malibu the latest equipment that's available so that we can improve um, connectivity and provide capacity solutions here. Um, the fact that we're replacing an existing pole to have both of them have been around for decades with a newer, sturdier pole in itself is a safety enhancement. So I just want to remind everybody that that is something that, you know, is, is a good enhancement that comes with these poles being replaced with brand new poles. So with regards to alternatives analysis, alternatives analysis are required in the city of Malibu when we are submitting a new wireless facility and we're required to show what different alternatives are needed. Um, these two facilities are existing facilities in the Verizon network. They're operating. They're part of an integrated network. So for us to show alternatives, that's not required and staff has even indicated that, that same argument. Coverage maps provide coverage area. Again, what we're doing here is providing enhanced service and connectivity and capacity. And there is voice over LTE here, or VOLTE as referred to. So um, just wanted to clarify that as well. So um, let me transfer uh, some of my time to Kevin Sullivan and um, I'll close it out after Kevin. Thank you. Good. Kevin, are you there? Yes. Good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. So wanted to touch on a couple of points. Um, you know, what codes are applicable here? Um, as stated in the October 11th letter that I sent to uh, the City Council on this, both California law and federal law states that only uh, only the old code that was in effect at the time uh, that Verizon's application was submitted and deemed complete would apply. And then even only those portions of the code, code uh, that are applicable given um, federal law. So, you know, Verizon is not required to constantly change uh, its application and submittal materials depending on whether a jurisdiction uh, is changing its code. We complied with the codes that were applicable uh, when the application was submitted and deemed complete. Um, and that issue is supported by both California uh, and federal law that we discuss in my October 11th letter. Um, also, just a little bit more with respect to the coverage maps and the alternative site analysis, uh, as Daisy pointed out, this is an existing facility uh, that uh, is part of, both of these are existing facilities that are part of Verizon's uh, integrated and operating network. Um, the issue here is upgrading uh, old equipment to make uh, it consistent with uh, current equipment uh, and technology that is used in Verizon's operating network um, and the need for coverage maps and alternative uh, analysis uh, in this unique circumstance um, doesn't exist because, again, we're trying to just replicate existing um, coverage and improve it to the extent that um, new upgraded equipment and technology is being installed on the two poles. Um, you know, one, one more point, if I could, uh, Mayor, um, you know, Verizon, um, I'm informed uh, by uh, Daisy and others that are part of Verizon's team that the upgraded uh, equipment is going to provide voice, text, fax, other personal wireless service capabilities, including voice over LTE or Volte. Um, that's just part of the standard bundle of uh, network services that are provided by Verizon, not just at this site, but other integrated sites within the city of Malibu. And um, was that all of it, Kevin? Yes. Okay. 
So um, in closing, Mayor and Council Members, um, I just want to state that a few years ago, I'd say two and a half years ago now, the City of Malibu came to Verizon after the Woolsey Fire asking us to improve wireless connectivity and coverage in the City of Malibu. We answered that request. We came and submitted and worked, redesigned our network, invested in coming to the city to upgrade our facilities at the request of the city. So, you know, we hear frequently from residents, why is Verizon submitting all this project? We submitted it because it was at the city's original behest and also to improve our network. So I just wanted to share that history a little bit in context there that, you know, this is, did not, did this, the submissions that we've done did not come at a whim or just because it's for profit. We're trying to provide service. We're trying to provide connectivity also in emergencies. Um, we even provided a temp facility temporarily right after the fire about a year or so ago and parked at the city hall for availability for the city to use. So we've been trying to be a good partner here with the city with regards to providing connectivity to the residents and provide emergency services where needed. So I just wanted to share that in context and we thank you for the opportunity to explain and provide information about our projects today and um, appreciate and ask you to please deny the appeals that are in front of you today and approve the projects as approved by Planning Commission. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I believe it's time for the council discussion and Mikey Pearson is first with his hand in his air, in the air. Probably shouldn't try and be first because I have like a novel of notes I can hardly read, but you know, I'll do the best. Just read us the chapter titles. Chapter titles, yeah, I'll send out a, I'll send that out. Um, what I'm wondering is if first, if I could ask um, Mr. Ross some questions. I believe Bob is here. I think I saw him earlier. I'm sorry, uh, Councilmember Pearson, can you repeat that name? Uh, Bob Ross, or maybe it's Robert Ross? Yes, I think he's registered under Robert. Uh, we found him now, thank you. Like me being registered under Michael, you know, so it would be hard to find. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Robert, how are you? <laughs> Pretty good, how are you tonight? I am well. So I would, I mean... I would love to get your general take on what we're hearing tonight, which is a little unfair to ask you. And I can try and point into more detailed areas, but uh, into areas, but would, I'd love to get your take on what we're looking at here and as in the position that you hold. Okay. Um, as a consultant for the city of Malibu, I have to look at this, um, in a little bit different light than if I was just a uh, general public. I'm seeing two applications for modifications to an existing, two existing sites that already have some toy, some type of a permit, whether it's a conditional use permit, whether it's a land use permit or whatever. Uh, those modifications, uh, the proposed modifications are to extend the pole. Um, which puts the antennas in a little bit different situation. You're going from a three foot in, or 24 inch antenna to a four foot antenna. Um, so again, that's not a small cell. That's what I would consider, uh, a pretty much macro cell. Um, so this is a pretty large site. Um, when we start speaking about, um, you, your RF coverage charts. Well, you're probably going to get a little bit better coverage with a four foot versus a two foot. Uh, how much more? Um, is, is, are you going to get uh, significantly more? Probably not because the equipment that are going to in there is not much uh, bigger than the existing equipment. It's newer. It's basically smaller. Um, so uh, that's where I would look at that. When you start saying, okay, can you look at it an alternate site? They've already got the site. You've got a conditional use permit already. All they're asking for is a modification to the existing site. Um, when you start talking about Geo 95, 
is is it to whose advantage? Um, you have to look at the age of the poll. Um, I look at the age of the poll and say it's to SCE's advantage to change that poll out um, because right now that poll is a fire hazard, um, both of them. Um, is would I go with a wooden pole? Um, maybe a class three wooden pole uh, would prefer to go with a metal pole. Uh, maybe something uh, along the lines that you existently have there and say, okay, uh, if you're going to change this out, we want to go with metal. Um, that's a SCE uh, situation there with both of them. When you look at the other site there and you have that pony pole there, um, uh, from a professional standpoint, I think I would have had them change that out uh, after day one. Um, that That's a no-no. Um, and changing that to an existing pole is probably the best thing uh, that you possibly could do uh, on that one. That cleans up that area a little bit. In there, uh, again, um, same situation when you start talking RF. Uh, I've, I've looked at the RF EME reports and I've looked at uh, um, Scott and uh, asked, wanted to know uh, what they were going to provide on there. If Verizon is going ahead and on their drawings on page RF, I think it's RF1, uh, section 2 there, they've gone ahead and they've told us exactly what they're going to use. They're going to use all the latest, including 5G on that. Can, can you talk to me about the height of the pole? Is that, I, I, I understand it'll, I assume higher will give better coverage. Um, is that, just could you comment on that? And is that there, right? Well, the I, I can comment on that. I'm I'm going back and I'm taking a look at the poll. Um, they're going from existing antennas, ex existing top of antennas is at 25 feet, and their proposal they're only going up to 30, 34 feet three inches. The rest of the poll. You're saying, well, that's not very much. Well, it's not very much. The rest of it seems to be going in the areas of the primary and secondary of the SCE lines. Um, and they're putting some spacing between their 34, 34, 9 to 40 feet. So you got your six feet there. That's where they're looking. The rest of it's all, Paul, uh, seems to be, the height seems to be going uh, towards SCE. Um, not, you know, um, so Verizon's going to go up a little bit. They're not, you know, I, it, you know, if they went from, from, uh, from, from a spacing of, let's say, um, 34 feet and they went up to the 47 feet area, then, then I would say something that, yeah, then the, now we've got a situation, but they're not, they're staying below the 35 feet. Uh, with the with the pole, w even though the pole is larger, so I, I have to look at it and say, maybe this is more for uh, more advantageous for SCE than it is for Verizon. Verizon is going to get a little bit uh, a little bit better of a situation, but you know, it, is it um, generally in the best interest of SCE or Verizon? And it seems to fall a little bit more into SCE. If, if okay. I may, uh, just interrupt for a second, just because I like to uh, try to answer the question in a different way. Okay. Um, the the existing uh, wireless facility uh, does not meet uh, the uh, California Public Utility Code requirements right. for vertical separations, and. Um, and so um, what they're trying to do is replace their equipment and their antennas on that existing utility pole. However, they can't do that uh, based on the pole they have there now uh, because it is non-compliant uh, with those requirements. The minimum uh, vertical separations uh, between the bottom of the antenna to the existing cable lines 
is 12 feet and currently it doesn't meet that requirement. And the uh, separation between the um, secondary power lines and the top of the antenna uh, is required to be six feet. Six. Uh, and then for a primary power, uh, the requirement is 12 feet. Uh, these facilities have been designed to meet this, these minimum uh, 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 vertical separation requirements. So um, it, it is not only advantageous for the subject property because Again, they're doing this to comply with code requirements, uh, but uh, it's also, uh, you know, something that will benefit SEE because, again, they will have a, a pole that would um, be uh, bigger in diameter, uh, and it would also be uh, designed in a way that meets their requirements. So, so Adrian or, or, or Bob, so then what we're really looking at is a choice between a pole that co-locates the one, but is taller, are two separate poles um, that could potentially be lower, but you have more poles. Is 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 that is that really what we're looking at? Yeah, and I think uh, what Bob mentioned before is that we're looking at this as an upgrade to an existing facility that already exists. Um, however, if this was not an existing facility and this was a completely new facility, I think we would be looking at it in, in that uh, in that aspect where we would have a lot more choices in terms of um, uh, the design. Now, um, I think we always have a choice in terms of whether uh, they uh, do a freestanding pole that meets a 28 foot height limit or whether they use an existing pole um, and uh, increase the height of that pole to meet these vertical separation requirements. Um, the, the staffs, uh, you know, staff has always been pushing for using the existing infrastructure since um, the wireless ordinance, um, you know, that uh, the city had always uh, encouraged uh, a co-location versus other alternatives because the infrastructure is already there. But yes, the, those are, you know, those are always options. When it comes to, um, and I'll, I'll wrap this up because I don't want to keep going, let other people try here. <laughs> um, when it comes to the poll that um, the appellants were worried about right at the driveway of the house, is how do we know that instead of upgrading that one, which maybe it needs it for safety, it can't be on a nearby pole that's not in front of their driveway to that point there? Is there, is there any, do they, do they get to pick which pole? How does, how does the law work on that? And I know that they talked about the urgency ordinance and the old MMC related to this, since this was, you know, predates our new ordinance. I'm just trying to figure out how that all interacts and ends up on that pole. Yeah. Can you, you want to answer that Adrian, or do you want me to give my 40 cents worth first? I, I just noticed Gail uh, turn on her camera. I, I think that that's probably a better uh, suited question for Gail, um, which um, the, the question is regarding whether we can um, uh, pursue alternative locations versus um you know, what are our limitations in terms of, you know, requiring an upgrade or using an alternative location, I guess. And especially because I know we don't have, we don't have map coverage maps or anything sort of like that. So, uh, Bob, you can put in your 40 cents, but let's hear from Gail first and feel free to jump in after. Okay. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Um, so let me start just by saying what you have to do is obviously address the application that is before you. So the application before you, or, or you know, originally before staff, was to upgrade an existing uh, facility. So modify that existing facility uh, to change out, uh, you know, the antennas and, and some equipment, and along with that, uh, bring it into compliance with the current. Uh, requirements for safe infrastructure that are established by the 
uh, California Public Utilities Commission and General Order 95 is, is uh, the detailed order that uh, regulates and requires those separations. So uh, you have that before you. And then I, I believe uh, this is stated in the staff report and Adrian can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but your uh, uh, applicable ordinance if, for this project uh, prefers co-location and use of existing facilities. And so uh, in that context, looking at alternatives at other locations, uh, uh, if you think of if you're, this seems to be the, the preference in the code. So, so looking at alternatives uh, doesn't seem like a, a kind of a rational way to address this application. Um, because if you were to deny it, but it's your preference, that doesn't seem like a reasonable basis for denial. There may be grounds for denial for other reasons, but I'm just saying just purely on having chosen a path of choosing what is preferred to now say that the applicant should have done something that is less preferred doesn't uh, seem like a rational basis for a denial um, on, on that issue. Um, uh, so I think that is where staff came out with this um, notion that requiring an alternatives analysis in this instance of a basically a modification to an existing facility did, didn't seem like a, a useful exercise. Thank you, Gail. Um, anything to add to that, Bob? Um, no, um, not that much. It basic, just basically uh, uh, reiterate again, um, they've got an existing permit. Um, the applicant wants to modify an existing permit. Um, so looking at another facility, that's not what he's looking for. He just wants to modify his existing one. Um, whether whether we would prefer him to look at a different location, um, that's um, um, something that the, you could ask the applicant, and if he says no, um, then uh, he just wants to modify his existing site. Okay, last real question here is, can, in, in any situations, can we require a metal pole? We're worried about pole catching fire and trapping residents or something like that. Or can, we, can we require a metal pole? I think we can ask the applicant. In the past, they have not had any objections to uh, whatever pull material uh, the city wants. I think the question did come up before when we were uh, writing the ordinance. Um, and I think um, I think there was a preference by the commission uh, that we leave that up to, um, I guess, the decision makers because uh, wooden poles may be the preferred option since that's more rural and more in character with the city. Um, and again, they're having to replace the pole. They're having to change the, the diameter of the pole to uh, a thicker diameter um, in order to accommodate the additional height. So, um, uh, you know, in terms of, um, you know, structural stability, I think it's going to be uh, in compliance uh, it's just a matter of, you know, this is maybe more uh, susceptible to fire. Uh, and I think it's up to uh, the city council to decide whether, you know, one is better than the other. Okay, thank you. And in transparency, we've told this before, Daisy talked about the city coming to Verizon. Um, and my memory was a meeting was requested with me with a whole bunch of representatives, including including Daisy and um, and Verizon, I thought Verizon was coming to put in 5G. This is two and a half years ago, and they gave me a perplexed look that they were just coming to upgrade their equipment. At which time I requested if a, at least a couple strategic areas could have battery backup because of the you know. Tr traumatic loss of communication we suffered during the fire. So that's that's my memory of how that that meeting went. And with that, uh, Lonnie, I I really do hope you're you're starting to feel better, and and I wish you the best in your health. And I will see my, see somebody else now.
And Bruce is ready to go. Okay, so um, got a lot of a lot of different things going on here. I'm going to start though by saying that that statement by Gail about it would not be rational given the preference for co-location. I think all things being equal, I get that, but all things aren't equal because a variance is being requested here, and we also have a preference for not granting variances. We have a preference for following the law. So although co-location is preferable, following the law is even better. And I think that same thing about what Adrian was talking about, it, metal versus wood. Yes, we we care about aesthetics. We also care about safety. And I think actually, as much as we care about aesthetics, I think we have to put safety number one, special, especially fire safety. So I mean, I, I'm not, I don't agree with the calculus that because it's less aesthetic, if 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 metal is safer, I guess I you know I live right off Malibu Canyon and they put up a lot of metal poles over the past two years. They're god awful ugly. I feel a lot safer with them there. I felt a lot safer than than with the wooden pole that's up at the corner of my of my street. So, I, notwithstanding that, I want to say I'm going to begin by quoting the vision statement, which is which is part of our code. And not only is it part of our code because it's in our zoning code, it's actually a part of the Coastal Act. And we all know what it says, but it bears repeating. Malibu is a unique land and marine environment and residential community whose citizens have historically evidenced a commitment to sacrifice urban and suburban conveniences in order to protect that environment and lifestyle and to preserve unaltered natural resources and rural characteristics. The people of Malibu are a responsible custodian of the area's natural resources for present and future generations. Now, I agree that the ability to make personal wireless phone calls is a modern necessity, not merely a convenience. And I support the approval of technology needed to sustain the provision of personal wireless service to Malibu residents. And even if I didn't support that, such technology is protected under federal law, as we've heard multiple times. Federal law prohibits local governments from inhibiting or interfering with the provision of personal wireless service. Federal law also, however, oh, and it, and it also prohibits us from regulating wireless technology based on local concerns about health issues relating to radio frequencies. And we're not, we're not doing that. We're not talking about that at all. Notwithstanding that, federal law expressly preserves our authority over, quote, decisions regarding the placement, construction, and modification of personal wireless service facility, close quote. That's the power we have. And among other things, that includes the authority to consider issues of local aesthetics and issues of safety, other than RF frequency emissions, which we have to accept the FCC's determination on. Now, the three appeals tonight all involve applications for a variance from our zoning law to permit a utility pole substantially higher than our law permits. I don't need to go into the details of what they are. They've been discussed, but they're all, they all require a variance. We know, we all know the fire danger associated with electrical equipment. As I said earlier tonight, SCE has all but conceded responsibility for the Woolsey fire and SCE's power equipment is known to have caused or contributed to multiple other fires in Malibu, including one that wasn't mentioned before on the hillside below the church on Malibu Canyon just in the past year or so. PG&E also has burned large parts of Northern California, including the campfire which also took the lives of 85 people and uncounted wildlife. San Diego Power and Electric also has played a role in the destruction of our state by wildfire. According to Frontline.com, quote, fallen power lines are the third most common cause of wildfires in California and were the cause of the deadliest fire in history, the campfire. That's a quote. Now, and by the way, I, I, I take the comment that the poll as it stands now, one of them is a fire hazard. Well, well Damn, if it's a fire hazard, it shouldn't be. We should be getting that replaced with something that's not a fire hazard, separate and apart from Verizon's application. Whether we grant the application or deny the application, we shouldn't put up with a fire hazard. Now, this meeting was scheduled to be heard on October 25th. Like many others in Malibu, I received an alert from the city that morning that Canaan Dune Road was closed due to a transformer explosion. Within the space of 30 minutes, I received four separate pulse point alerts about four different transformer explosions in this area, including one in Sarah Retreat, which I think is the one that caused us to have to cancel the meeting. 
I also received an alert about a downed power line on PCH near Topanga. Any of those events had the potential for serious and deadly consequences. Now, I recognize we're dealing here with applications by Verizon to place cellular equipment on utility poles, not applications for new or additional power lines. But with items 4A and 4B, we're talking about an application to erect substantially overheight utility poles that will carry multiple power lines, as well as newer and heavier equipment that currently exists on the poles that already are in place. Look at page 150 to 152 of the council agenda report. You can see that. Now, pursuant to our law, when we're considering the grant of a CDP and a variance, we have a responsibility to be confident that there's no added danger to the safety of the community or the environment. Yet the only Verizon engineer that has supplied any information about the safety of the proposed development expressly disclaimed an opinion on electrical and structural safety. Just as occurred in the last meeting with the Big Rock Appeal, I'm sure we're going to hear that the permits are conditioned on satisfaction of all applicable engineering and safety requirements. But safety is not an after the fact requirement. It's a requirement for the grant of a permit, especially a CDP with a variance. Otherwise, there's no point in having public hearings. All permits should just be granted as a matter of course with a provision that they're conditioned upon subsequent satisfaction of all applicable legal requirements for the grant of the permit. That would be absurd. That would be illegal. It would be a legal absurdity. It would turn the public hearing process into a hollow mockery of due process, which many of our residents already believe it is. Now, in addition to posing fire safety concerns, utility poles, power lines, and other electrical equipment attached to them are an urban blight on our rural town. This is the opposite of what we should be permitting, much less encouraging. Our residents want greater safety, not greater risk. Our residents want undergrounding, not new and higher poles. At a minimum, our residents want as little proliferation of electrical and telecom utilities as the law requires. Now, I recently rented a house situated along PCH on the land side. The view of the ocean is impaired by eight separate wires, five of which are pretty thick, running from pole to pole like an ugly fence in the air. Additionally, when I go outside, I sometimes hear the snap, crackle, and pop of electricity coursing through the lines. In a rural town where ocean views, as well as other scenic views, are cherished, and residents disagree about the smallest intrusion into their scenic view, it makes no sense to permit telecommunications companies free reign to litter the landscape with unsightly and potentially dangerous infrastructure. Now, notably, the staff report, and we saw these pictures earlier tonight, provided to the, the staff report includes renderings of what the overheight utility poles, wires, and telecom equipment will look like from PCH. Note there was no rendering of how the view would look like from the residents in front of which the overheight pole is going to be placed. We didn't see that. This is just one more absurdity in this process. Another example of how the playing field is tilted in favor of big telecom and against our residents and against the environment. Now, it seems to me that if the approval of these applications, if that were to occur, if these were approved, it'll eviscerate the existing height requirement in our law. It'll be by way of a death of a thousand cuts. In one application after another, the recommendation is that we grant a variance from the legal height requirement based on a claim that it's necessary for the wireless provider to, quote, now this is the quote, achieve their objectives, close quote, whatever that means. We don't know what it means. If that's the standard, it's necessary, according to the wire, telecom, to achieve their objectives. We'll never have a basis to deny any height variance, never. And the height standard requirement in our law, it'll become a rule that's only honored in its breach. It seems to me we're giving up a golden opportunity also to extract reasonable concessions from SCE and telecom companies in the form of agreeing to mitigate existing safety concerns, underground lines, make streetlights more dark skies compatible, relocate particularly unsightful, unsightly facilities. Now, I can't help but feel we're being gained by Verizon. I appreciate the statement that they're just trying to be helpful. But we know from a recent district court decision where Verizon sued the city that they previously asserted an overly aggressive and incorrect reading of the law with respect to a prior application, which we denied, or I'm sorry, we, yeah, we, we ultimately granted it, but they claimed we didn't even have discretion. They were wrong. There's every reason to believe they're continuing to travel down the path of deception tonight. In fact, I believe if it weren't for the fact that I pointed out earlier that the staff has conceded 
has told us this is not a small cell facility, we would have still been told it is. In fact, it was on page five of both of those um, slideshows that was presented. This is a small cell. That seems to me to be a great example of the dishonest and aggressive strategy that we see repeatedly being presented by big business. Now, so again, it's, it's conceded that this is not small cell. Yet, Verizon repeatedly and misleadingly relies upon a small cell order from 2018 to justify its refusal to provide a propagation coverage map or alternative coverage location analysis. That's on, on pages eight to nine of the staff report provided to the Planning Commission, which is at pages 105 and 106 of our report. Staff wrote the following. The applicant wireless Verizon Wireless has declined to provide a wireless coverage map, referencing FCC order 18-133. Again, that's the small cell order. And citing a passage from an ex parte letter to the FCC from Crown Castle. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but basically we're being told we can't require these things that we are requiring. You don't have to comply because small cell rulings say so. Well, it's not a small cell. It, the, the staff report then goes on to say staff interprets the FCC Order 18, again, the one that doesn't apply here, as a federal preemption of LIP Section 3.16.9, Paren 9, and MMC Section 17.46.100, Paren 9. So our staff, based on a order that doesn't apply here, has reached a legal conclusion, which they don't even have the right to reach. That's not within the purview of the staff. That's, a, that's for our lawyers. And by the way, we don't have any legal analysis from our lawyers on this issue, on um, the issue of retroactivity. We again have the staff's interpretation. And interestingly, our statute says, our ordinance says, retroactive to the fullest extent permissible by law. Interestingly, the staff report says only to the fullest extent permissible by law. That's kind of strange because the fullest extent permitted by law is really broad. It's not a limiting thing. It's not an only. Now, before the 2018 order was addressing, okay, the 2018 order was addressing only small cell applications, and that's not what's before us. Even, however, if you were to read that order to pertain to all personal wireless facilities and not just small cell facilities, Verizon has not established, as Scott McCullough noted, that this particular wireless faci facility on an overheight pole is for personal wireless services. We heard tonight for the first time from Verizon's lawyer that the lawyer was told by the representative that it is personal wireless service. Okay, that's hearsay. It's not in the record, it's not under oath, and there's no opportunity for our planning commission, our staff, or us to examine the veracity of that hearsay, none. It's been asked for for quite some time now, and it wasn't until rebuttal that we heard it for the first time. Also, question, is the heightened part of the poll for the purpose of providing what personal wireless services? Or is that something below the below the height requirement? Because if it's not above the height requirement, why do they need a variance? Now, aside from relying on the inapplicable small cell order, they argue Verizon was not required to submit alternate site assessments because the facilities already exist and the projects are upgrades to current sites. You heard that multiple times. Again, the staff and the staff adopted that self-serving view of Verizon. The, as noted by Verizon, the staff says the following. The permitting process for a new facility or a proposal for an upgraded facility would materially result in an equivalent bundle of permits, WCF, CDP, SPR, VAR. I take that to mean variance, and equivalent hearing before the approval body. I don't understand how that can be the case with an application that requires a CDP and a variance, whereas the prior site didn't. We're talking about a different bundle of rights here, a new bundle of rights. It's not, this is not a situation where they had one complying facility and they want to replace it with another complying facility and where co-location would be better because they're not asking for a variance. So this, I mean, there's no question about it. this is requiring a CDP and a variance. And those are the rights that the staff says would need to be considered if we had to reconsider those things for a new app, for a revised application. Well, we do have to consider them because that's what's being requested. 
This isn't an addition or upgrade to an existing facility that would result from, for example, changing out the guts of some existing housing already attached to an existing utility pole. That would be where it wouldn't make any sense to do that analysis. This is an application to replace an already oversized utility pole with an even more oversized utility pole that will be burdened by additional telecom equipment. Now, I'm almost done. As I understand the applicable telecom law, we have broad regulatory authority over placement, construction, and modification of telecom facilities, subject to three exceptions. One, we can't unreasonably discriminate among providers for personal wireless services. We're not doing that. No discrimination here, no claim of discrimination if we were to deny this. We cannot prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting the provision of personal wireless services. Not doing that. They, they provide personal wireless services now, as Ryan talked about, that they're perfectly fine. They just want to improve their services, and we don't even know exactly what services they want to improve. Again, this, this amorphous, it's, it, it, it meets our needs. Lastly, we can't regulate on the basis of the environmental effects of radio frequency emissions to the extent that they comply with the FCC. We're not doing that. So not only will the denial of the pending applications not trigger any of the legal prohibitions, the grant of the applications will set up the next applicant to argue, you did it for Verizon, so now you need to do it for me. Verizon's failed to establish a significant gap in coverage necessitating the CDP invariance. They failed to provide an alternative site assessment, and they failed to provide competent engineering analysis establishing the safety of the proposed project. I can't bring myself to approve a proposed application under those circumstances, and I'm, I'm seriously hopeful, not optimistic, but I'm hopeful that there will be at least two other members of the city council who have sufficiently similar regard for the safety of our residents and for the natural beauty of our rural town to join me in denying these applications. I took some notes, but I think that's sufficient for now. I may have a, a few comments later after I hear from others. Oh, one last thing, cleaner look. Well, there's no restrictions on what they're going to do down the line. It'll look really nice when it's new. And that's always the way. Nice, shiny new object always looks better than the old one. Uh, look at page 255 of the staff report. That's the telephone pole at the corner of Harbor Vista and Malibu Canyon. Look at the disgraceful condition that's in. That started out as a nice, new, shiny object that was cleaner than whatever was there before. Look at it now. That's where we're headed. So, uh, and, and then lastly, for a variance, they need to establish that they're being denied rights that others are being given and that denying them this right will effectively um, deprive them of property rights. There, there's no showing of any of that. So for all those reasons, I, ca I can't possibly bring myself to vote for this. All yours, Paul. May I go next? Without uh, making anybody feel bad, I'm going to take cuts. And I want to ask a, a question of Daisy. Daisy, if, if we were to ask you to use the metal poles similar to what is on Malibu Canyon, of course, painted brown as they've been painted on Malibu Canyon, would that uh, provide a strength benefit? And is that something that you could do? So we are subject, um, Mayor, to whatever SCE will allow us to do. If SCE allows us to do a steel pole um, at this location, then we will do so. It's not an it's not an issue for us. Um, okay. It's li literally just subject to SCE's requirements there. Okay. And the other question I have is the the relocation of the PCH pole, the equipment to a a different pole that's not at the driveway for these several houses. Is that something that can be done or is that a whole new application that would be required? And maybe Adrian would like to jump in on that too. Yeah, I can probably answer that question. Um, yeah, unfortunately that would be a new application just because um, the mailing information was based on the specific site. So if they have to uh, relocate the equipment or the antenna to uh, a different location, we would have to re-notice. Okay, Gail, can we, can we condition an approval based on steel poles rather than, than wood? Uh, I, yeah, you, you can. I mean, it will be, if there's a, if the condition can't be met, 
due to, you know, some uh, safety reason. And I would just mention that, uh, you know, General Order 95 will have an impact on, on what can be done here as well as, you know, SoCal Edison's uh, requirements. Uh, if, but you could condition it on that if there was a problem with it fulfilling a condition because it would, say, not comply with General Order 95 or SoCal Edison's requirements, then I think the applicant would just have to come back and, uh, you know, ask for a waiver of that condition or something like that if it, if it wasn't feasible or not feasible, but wasn't um, allowed uh, for some safety reason. I see Kevin has his hand raised. Would you like to take a crack at one of my questions or all of them? You there, Kevin? Yes, I was just uh, unmuted. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to address both of them. With respect to the metal pole, to emphasize what Daisy said, if SCE will allow us, we will do that. I think that if there was a condition imposed that, you know, subject to, you know, feasibility of approval through SCE, um, that might be acceptable to Verizon. Daisy can weigh in if it's not. I will also note, though, that the proposed wood replacement pole um, is going to be structurally sound and fire safe with, you know, with respect to compliance with uh, general order uh, 95 requirements. Um, that those requirements address the separation issues that uh, uh, the kind of control of fire safety um, and there are also structural integrity requirements that are part of the General Order 95 regulations. With respect to could Verizon go to another, you know, nearby pole, um, not only would that require additional noticing, it would require a brand new application. We're looking at new zoning drawings, new, new everything, and starting back at kind of the, you know, the beginning of this process. Uh, at least as I understand it, that, you know, has already gone on for approximately, uh, well, so for certainly well over one year. Thank you. I see Daisy has raised her hand. So maybe you caused her to think of something else. Daisy? I just wanted to add that the, to the relocation question, right, there are existing comms that are attached or communication lines that are attached to the pole. So if the pole were to be relocated, um, that would affect all those calm lines. And it is also subject to those being feasible to be moved. So there's all sorts of things that um, are, are required there in addition to what Kevin indicated about it being a new application and a new thing. I mean, the site's been existing for decades now and we've been operating at this location. So just wanted to add that, you know, there are other comms and communication lines that are reliant as well on the pole existing where it's at. And this question is for both Daisy and Kevin. Have, have either of you ever seen an instance where you asked for a steel pole and, and SCE refused you? Yeah. Not for oh. me. I'm sorry, um, Kevin. Yeah, um, to answer your question, Mayor, not personally. I have not um, had that, but uh, one of our consultants who's actually speaking next for the next uh, project has seen that. Okay. Kevin, you started to speak. I said I don't have any information on that question. Okay. And I see Scott McCullough is, wants to weigh in on the question. Scott? Uh, hello. Yes, two quick points. First of all, we wouldn't be in this problem of having to uh, start all over again um, with potentially a different location if Verizon had just done what it was supposed to do and give us an alternative uh, location analysis. Uh, this problem could have been flagged a lot earlier. We've known about this problem. We raised it at the Planning Commission. And, uh, you know, so this is a problem of Verizon's own making. Second, while a metal pole may be uh, something of a safety improvement uh, for a couple of reasons, it does not entirely solve the problem because um, even with a metal pole, um, 
if there is a fire, the fire department is still going to let it burn out. You also have the situation where oftentimes when you have a metal pole, the electronics are put inside the pole. And if the electronics are inside the pole and they burn and they melt the pole and the pole falls. So a metal pole is slightly preferable, but it does not solve the safety problem. Thank you. Thank you. And Robert Ross. Yes. Um, there's a, in order to go with GEO 95 in the ANSI TIA 222, which is in your new ordinance, they all call for a class three pole, uh, whether it be metal or whether it be wood. Um, that's a recommendation um, that you can make uh, right off the bat and just say that it's a class three pole, not a class two or a class one, it's a class three pole. Um, and that would bring you up to probably the best standards that you can get at whether it be metal or whether it be wood. Okay. Thank you for that suggestion. Certainly. I'm uh, done for the moment. Karen, did you want to jump in on this or, or Steve? Steve's ready. Yeah, just a couple of quick ones. Did we, did we ask Verizon if they moved that pole in front of the driveway down the road would that impact the services they're providing? Did we ever ask them that question? I think what we, excuse me, sorry. What we did ask is for an alternative site analysis uh, multiple times, and uh, we we were rejected the alternative site analysis. So we had to go forward with the application materials we did have. I understand, but I mean, the, the pole in the driveway and the risk of a fire and the risk of, you know, injury or whatever uh, seems to be an argument that says, okay, guys, you know, tell me what, if I can move it down there, does that impact what your services are? Would have been a question I, I, you would thought they would have asked. I thought Bruce's arguments were compelling. Um, it, 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 but let me, Gail, let me ask you. I mean, you know, some of the arguments Bruce brought up, the fact that says that, you know, Verizon is saying this meets our objective. We have no idea what the hell their objectives are. I mean, what do you think of that, those, those positions he took? Well, I, I, I don't think I can go through all of them, but, but um, the, I, my uh, understanding of the, the need for the pole uh, height increase was driven primarily by the General Order 95 separation requirements so safety requirements imposed by the California Public Utilities Commission, uh, which it which are you know equivalent to state law and would it is it is an exception where you don't have you as a city have of um, Bruce mentioned you know you can't regulate based on RF emissions that's a federal standard but you also uh, can't come up with standards that are different than the uh, state law, uh, General Order 95, and, and the CPUC standards for safe infrastructure. So I understood that the height was uh, was driven more by the separation requirement of the safety uh, separation and not uh, driven by uh, uh, the network objectives of Verizon. Yeah, but some of it is driven by the network objectives because the original site, height of the antenna was what, two feet? And I think I remember that came up someplace, right? They are putting up a bigger antenna. And yes. as a result of a bigger antenna, the pole has to get bigger, right? Well, I, you have to I get think, more separation. I think you could. Uh, Verizon can can explain um, why they need, but I think the existing pole right now does not comply with existing General Order ninety five separation requirements. Right. right? And, so the even if you kept the if, if that same you, though that configuration that is on that pole today and perhaps Adrian or Tyler can jump in here but that's my understanding is that configuration that is on that pole today could not be constructed today in the same configuration and comply with today's standards in the in General Order ninety five. Yeah, and, and and to make a point uh, also the. Utility pools are already pre-cut 
to five foot intervals. So um, increasing the height of the antenna by two feet um, is not really going to make a, a difference in the uh, pool that they selected to comply with the general order 95 requirements in that um, they are uh, barely meeting these uh, vertical separations and there's not much uh, space between the um, uh, power lines that are at the top of the pole and the very top of the pole. So, um, so uh, to Gail's point is they're having to replace the pole um, as a result of the safety requirements and it's hard to tell whether they would ever replace the pole if they weren't uh, replacing the existing um, uh, antennas, but should, I, should they be replacing the pole? And the answer is yes, they should be replacing the pole even with the existing infrastructure that's there because the existing uh, facility is not in compliance with state requirements. Do you think leaving that pole in front of the driveway is a safety issue? Uh, we don't have any requirements uh, that no, would... No, no, it's not about requirements. Do you yeah. think it's a safety issue? I, I don't know of it being a safety issue. So you, you see no safety... Interesting. Okay, I'm done. Aaron, you want to take a shot at it? Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, that's one thing I was wondering. Um, with all this concern that's been voiced about the... Uh, pole being there at the driveway um, kind of makes me wonder why it hasn't been relocated all these years. I don't know if anybody has an answer to that. Uh, staff doesn't have an answer just because the facility has been there and it was approved uh, you know, many years before all our time uh, with the city. But um uh, why haven't they uh, replaced it? I, again, it is, it, you know, it's an existing facility unless they are in the process of upgrading their facility. There's, there's no need for them to have to relocate or replace it. Um, and like I said before, we don't have any uh, requirements or provisions that would require uh, the facility to be relocated. Okay, thank you. Um... Well, I do agree with Bruce, 100%. Undergrounding is preferable. That's what everybody would like to see. So, um, Gail, can you talk about any requirements to do that? So the undergrounding of existing utility lines is a fairly complicated uh, area of the law uh, that has, there are different, uh, to give you like the short version, there are different ways that you can go about getting uh, lines under undergrounded. Uh, some are through uh, just simply paying, right? The, whoever wants the lines undergrounded pays for the undergrounding of the lines. Uh, another is that there, there are certain circumstances where the money is raised through uh, rate payers uh, that goes into a fund that makes it uh, available for undergrounding. Um, and in this particular uh, instance, this is, I think this, um, at least one of these is on PCH. I don't know if there are, you know, Caltrans would be involved in, in those decisions as well or how that would work, but, but it, but it's, um, undergrounding uh, uh, would not would not um, to address a, a, a wireless facility uh, for a moment. Part of the facility, just by its very nature, has to be above ground um, in order to propagate uh, the signal. So, uh, on on that sense, uh, I think we're we're getting into a topic that is maybe for another day. Um, it, we can't address the undergrounding issue for a line of utility poles through through this uh, wireless application, which is really only dealing with one existing above ground pole. Okay, thank you. I had a feeling that was the answer. 
Um, I have a question, I guess, for either Gail or Richard. I'm not sure. You, I guess you guys can decide. Um, are these two installations adequately conditioned for safety? Or Tyler? So, so similar to the ones you saw um, for the commercial rooftop site, uh, these are have conditions uh, to enter building plan check and to also complete building plan check and, and obtain building permits. Uh, and it's the same conditions that applied to that project. So it's it's a retroactive because it's based on the the way the old ordinance was set up. Um, but the uh, the safety compliance is still in effect. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have for now. Going back to Bruce. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I have a couple questions about this General Order 95. First question is, does it apply retroactively such that if a site is sitting there and it's not planning to, no one's planning to alter it, they have to change it to comply with the order? Uh, it, it, yes and no. So what, what's happened with SoCal Edison is, uh, and this is, this goes back and I'm going from memory here, but the, after uh, a series of fires due to unsafe uh, utility poles, one, one, one thing that came out of that was SoCal Edison was supposed to over the next, I think it was 10 years, uh, do a complete inspection of all of its poles and uh, and find ones that aren't complying with the current standards and do replacements. That obviously they have millions of poles or, you know, or a million or well, I don't know what the number is, a very large number. And so that's why it was over such a long period. And they are slowly but surely supposed to be doing that. And I think reporting to the Public Utilities Commission yeah. Uh, on it. So when there is a request uh, by a wireless carrier to place a facility on the pole or a, a new telephone line or fiber or something like that, that may trigger an evaluation of that pole and whether it can hold this new, uh, whatever new facility it's going to be, that kind of bumps it to the front of the line for compliance with the new uh, standard because there's a change being made and the change uh, has to uh, be, the poll has to be brought into compliance. Okay, so if I'm if I'm understanding you correctly, then what's going on is because Verizon's proposing to make a change, they have to make a higher poll to comply with General Order 95. But had they not been applying to make a change, they wouldn't have to do something different to comply with General Order 95 because it's fine just the way it is unless they want to make a change. Is that what you just said? Well, it 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 will it will the SoCal Edison is supposed to get to it at some point in this general inspection of all of their polls. Okay, but 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 for the fact that Verizon is asking to change this particular facility at this particular time, they wouldn't be compelled. SCE wouldn't be compelled by General Order ninety five to be doing anything differently at this moment in time. Right. That, okay. That's correct. Okay. Second question. Are there other ways in which Verizon and SCE can comply with General Order 95 without obtaining a variance to raise this poll to 52 feet and the other poll to 48 feet? Uh, that That's not uh, fully a legal question. It's really what else is on the poll and do you meet the separations, right? And so that's, that's an engineering question. question. Let's let one of the non-legal people answer it. That's fine. So based on the existing infrastructure on the poll, um, uh, the, the answer is uh, they would have to replace the poll with a taller poll. Uh, there's no way to comply with uh, General Order 95 without having to do that. Even, even with more polls? Excuse me? Even with more polls? Even with more polls, uh, because of the vertical separation requirements, uh, this poll would have to be uh, replaced with a taller poll. Uh, adding new polls is not going to uh, fix that issue. Okay. How many more polls are in Malibu that if Verizon asked to change anything on them would trigger a need to raise the poll to comply with General Order 95? 
I don't know if we can answer that question, uh, but Tyler can maybe speak yeah. to the fact that we do have some applications already from Edison to replace a number of poles uh, with taller poles in the city. Correct. Um, so, uh, Councilmember Silverstein, was the question was how many uh, applications can Verizon do without changing the pole? Is that what your question was? No. Of all the poles in Malibu, how many of them would need to be raised with a variance above the height rec height prohibition um, to comply with General Order 95 if anybody asked to make any change in the poll? So it depends on the type of um, antennas that they're going to be installing. We we have had applications where they uh, can use the existing poll uh, for, for small cell type uh ones where they where they already provided enough separation in this case uh for these poles in order for them to to reach the separation as we've mentioned before the variance is required for a taller height okay so, so I, maybe maybe, I don't maybe think that's intentional but that doesn't answer i don't think that yeah, let me yeah let, let, let me see if i can uh try to answer the question so um there are, uh, I mean, I, I would imagine it's going to be a lot of pools in the city. Um, now, um, what we do know is that uh, uh, SCE has submitted a, a number of applications with the city to replace a number of their uh, utility pools. Uh, these, uh, some of them include wireless facility, many of them do not. Um, and to answer the question about the variance, Replacing a pole with a taller pole um, does not by itself require a variance, okay? So we don't have any height restrictions on utility poles. We have height restrictions on antennas. And so uh, the fact that this antenna is actually in compliance with the height, the reason we actually applied a variance to this facility is because the antenna is prompting the need for the pole to be replaced with a taller pole, and thus it does not comply with the intent of the code, and that's the reason why the variance is being applied. But the simple uh, uh, the simple act of replacing an antenna with a taller antenna does not uh, does not necessarily need, uh, mean that it would need a variance. Thank you, Adrian. I have just two last comments. One is, it seems to me that we shouldn't be doing this piecemeal. I mean, we, we've got a whole city to deal with. And if there's a lot of polls that are dangerous and not in compliance with General Order 95, we got to find out what they all are and clean them all up at once rather than have piecemeal applications. And the other thing is, I mean, just one note, I heard the statement, we asked them many times to provide us with this analysis. They refused. So we are where we are, and we granted the application with what they gave us. You know, when your children refuse to answer your questions in order to get permission to do something, you don't let them do it. So I, I don't get the, the concept that we asked them multiple times for something we're entitled to. They refuse to give it to us. So here we are, and we have to grant their application. That makes no sense to me. The answer to me is we asked them multiple times to give us something we're legal enti legally entitled to. They refuse to give it to us. So they don't get their application granted until they give us what we're entitled to. So, so to answer that question, yes. uh, we did. That wasn't a question. That was. A oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was. My apologies. Steve has got his hand raised. Yeah, just two quick ones. I want to go back to the safety issue on this. You know, the houses behind that were the drive. When were those houses built? You know, are they new? I don't have that information. Okay. Uh, and just just to give you a perspective, the, the poll that Bruce spoke about earlier, the corner of Harbor Vista and Malibu Canyon, uh, basically it, it, it caused accidents. And, you know, everybody who drives out of there says, you know, when you look down the canyon, you can't see anything. We I went to the city council back in 2000 uh, and complained about that poll. And the city council wrote a letter to SEC saying you got to move it. All right, because it's you got you, there's you've got an easement there you can move it to, and this is 23 years later and they haven't done a damn thing. So you know these guys are not going to do. They're not concerned about safety as much as they're about making money. One man's opinion. Second thing is the safety study that's going to be done after the fact. If we if this permit is is in, uh, approved, 
in building plan check, they go through all the safety. What, is there a requirement that it can't be done up ahead of time? I mean, what stops it? If it's going to be done, right? There's, we know someone's going to do it, but why can't we just say, okay, let's do that up front? Because, you know, to Bruce's issue of make sure it's transparent, make sure the residents understand what we're doing, make sure that they understand that we're trying to do the best we can to take care of them. So why don't we do that up, up front versus waiting until an after the fact issue? So uh, just to confirm, some of the language in that uh, that condition does say that failure to obtain a permit from the building of the safety division will result in the avoidance of the wireless facility permit. That's not the point. The point is that, again, we're, we're approving a permit and then somewhere behind closed doors, and I, I that, that's what the residents call it, okay, somebody goes back and does a study and says, okay, this permit, it's, it meets all the safety requirements. If I'm, as a resident, I would like to see that up front it's part of the what we're doing now, all right? So before I issue the permit, I got some level of comfort that says, yeah, it's going to be done safely. I understand what's going on. We've, we've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. Why don't we do that? Uh, I believe that the issue here, sorry. Okay. I, I was just going to. I was just going to say, I believe the issue here was just a timing one of the, that this application came in before those uh, more detailed requirements, uh, application requirements were imposed. And so you can't impose an application requirement on an application that was already submitted. Uh, and I'm not so changing the, the requirement. That, they they, they got to do it anyway. I'm not, really, I'm not adding any requirements. I'm saying it's going to be done. Just do it here versus there. But I, I, I think no, you, you are correct, Steve. Uh, it, it's going to happen. It's just that uh, what, what Gail was getting at is that in the change in the code, we 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 now say that as part of the determination for your completeness, you need to give us those documents up front rather than having them come at the tail end. Uh, no one gets to skip those documents. But what a solution may be here, uh, what we could do is similar to what. Uh, was suggested at the last meeting is that once we receive those documents, we can make them available on our uh, wireless uh, section of our city website so that there is a way for folks to see those documents. And it's still after, it's still putting the cart before the horse, I think, but uh, okay, I've, I've got everything I need for this one, I think. I'm just, right. Go ahead, Paul, back to you. I'm going to throw up a trial balloon here. I'm going to ask that we make a motion to approve both of these with class three polls, with the requirement for class three polls. Is there a second for that? Um, be, I'm sorry. I, I just want to make sure that we have that condition um, uh, exactly how it's supposed to read. So one of the suggestions was uh, subject to the feasibility of FCE, um, that the replacement pole must be a metal class three. A class three just means that- I'm willing to have it be metal or wood because okay. it's been explained that the, the difference in safety is not that much. Okay. So uh, as long as it's a class three, I, I would be happy. In, as in long as they're both class threes, I would be happy. In terms of the structural stability, they're the same, but in terms of uh, whether one is more prone to a fire, there might be a difference between the, the two types of materials. So, and we did hear from Scott McCullough that he believes the metal would be an improvement, although it was not necessarily the, the best or the, it doesn't necessarily answer uh, all their concerns. It's, it's uh, the opposite. Well, everybody agrees that class three is better than class two. So that's that's why I want it to be that. Okay. So I made a motion. Is there a second? I see Bruce has his hand up. Yeah, Paul, I'd like, uh, man, I'll, in full disclosure, I'm going to vote against it, but I, I still want to propose a friendly amendment to your, to your motion, which is that and the safety analysis be published and the permit not go into effect until after some reasonable period, I don't know what it is, but some period of time for the public to come back and object if they think there's a problem. I'm 
I'm trying to think of the process right now for uh, for building a house. And, you know, you get the concept approved that, yes, you can build this house, but you've got to do all this different engineering and you've got to satisfy the engineers. And your engineer has to stamp the plans and then our engineer will stamp the plans and then you go forward. Uh, and I think that we have somebody at, the city who's going to be looking at their engineering and signing off. And I would imagine that person is going to be a licensed engineer as well. So I don't, Good. I don't, I don't think that uh, my object, I don't have an engineering degree. So if I want to object to engineering, I'm automatically disqualified. And I don't think that, and, and I think that's right that I should be automatically disqualified for objecting to engineering. And if, if our own engineer says that their, their engineer's numbers are right, you know, that's, that's got to be good enough for me because I haven't ever been to engineering school except driving by. And I've taken a materials class, but that's it. But the, the difference between the situation you just described and this is that under our our new ordinance, when it comes into effect, they are going to have to produce that engineering analysis up front. And you're going to have to look at it and make an analysis based on whatever you want to base it on. But you're going to have to make a decision as a city council member whether the engineering is satisfactory. So we'll telegraph what I, my response right now. When we when we actually get one of these, if we ever get around to changing the other ordinance so that there are no more gap poly, gap things at one point in the thing, I'm going to go talk to Richard or whoever he appoints and ask them if they are satisfied that the engineering is correct. And then I'm going to take their word for it. Yes or no, whatever they say. So that's. So it seems that my motion does not have a second. Well, I, you know, I would second your motion if, if, if I, and now I'm losing the wording, but if it's a metal pole, because, you know, my, my, still my memories after Woolsey are, we had to chainsaw our way through down power poles, wood power poles to go help people. Yeah. You know, I'm, and I, it's hard to forget that, you know, so to me, this is about safety. I get the rest of it. I, I, I feel I feel secure that that the you know that our engineers that our team is going to inspect them for safety. It's going to be public. It's going to be published on the site. Um, I get that part. Um, but yeah, I would love to see. I would love to know that the pole in one of these fires is not just going to collapse as easily. Admittedly, a metal pole probably can too, but I did not see that in my experience. So. Well, I'm, I'm willing to accept a modification to a, metal, uh, a class three metal pole. I see Steve's hand and then Karen's. Yeah, I just want you to rethink or, you know, consider the, the issue that Bruce brought up. And it's not about you understanding the engineering of the thing. It's, it's for the residents. And the residents, there may be engineers out there who can look at this and say, hey, yes, I agree. No, I don't agree. Maybe, maybe they can find an engineer they want to have take a look at it to make sure it's right. It's more of this transparency thing. It's more of the, the, the issue that says the residents want to know that we're doing all the, they want to have evidence that we're doing all the things we need to do to make this thing as safe as possible, considering all the issues we heard in the beginning of fire starting with these things. So at least in my mind, taking a couple extra steps to make that happen and make giving those residents that level of comfort that we understand what they're talking about and we're going to try and make the thing work for them. I just think it's, it's the right thing to do for the people who are out there who are concerned about this thing. So we got to re we're, got, we're adding a requirement to publish and an amount of time for people to comment on it. Yes. I think that makes sense. Do you, do you want to take a stab at, at, uh, at how long a period of time between publication and and the closing of objections from this public? A month. Okay. Karen is next and followed by Bruce. 
Um, just uh, regarding this metal pole, we've heard uh, comments tonight about different risks with each, and that class three uh, is considered uh, is considered structurally sound. So, uh, and I think it was Scott McCullough who mentioned that there were different issues with metal poles. Mm -hmm. Uh, where the equipment is or could be located inside uh, and could fail, uh, as opposed to what Mikey was saying. So, and we all saw, uh, I came in here two days after the fire, uh, dozens or hundreds of poles down, which I assume were all wood. Yeah. Um, but since, since there are risks with each, I think we, I would rather see that left open to a class three pole, metal or wood. Okay. I don't want to condition this on that. Um, as for um, publishing the standards and having a comment period, I don't think that's a bad idea. Um, and, and as long as we can agree on a time frame, uh, does, does anybody, uh, Richard or Adrian or Gail, does anyone see an issue with that? My concern is the expectation of the public. Uh, the, we don't mind receiving comment. Uh, the issue is that at present there isn't a appeal mechanism for a building plan check approval. Uh, so this is the, the appeal period here. And uh, uh, John could jump in here and correct me if I'm wrong, but the idea is that in general, someone appeals a project here. Uh, if they don't like what gets approved, then they have an opportunity to challenge it in court uh, after the, the city's rendered its decision. And so that's my only concern. We're more than glad to publish the materials like we are going to do for the uh, last uh, wireless facility that was heard by this council a few weeks back. Uh, glad to do that. Glad to receive comment. Uh, my concern is the expectation of what they could do with that comment. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I will just say, I'll make it quick. Um, we all receive emails pretty much every day of the week. Um, and we always take public comments at our meetings. So, um, you know, we are doing that. Uh, I, I am not looking to change public expectation. But I do, I do think it's a good it's a good idea to publish these um, these standards. So, uh, thank you. I have Bruce followed by Robert Ross. So two things, one is gonna to go to the timing and the other is going to go to the expectation issue. On the timing, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, Tony Simmons is the engineer that works with the group that usually objects to these matters most vociferously. So perhaps Tony could give us a, you know, an indication of how long it's believed it would be appropriate to let the public have an opportunity to see this and object if necessary. That, that's the that, room. Yes, I see. I see the name on the screen. Tony Simmons. Yes. Yes. If you were retained to um, to, to review the engineering and, and decide whether an objection is appropriate, how long would it take you? It would act. It would. I could. I could. Depending upon other work, I, I could. It, it would take probably four or five days. But that's assuming there's no other work in the process. I would say three weeks would be would be adequate. So how about how about two? How about ten ten business days? Two weeks. Would that be adequate. Well, the, the 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 issue I run into is I commission substations and I get tied up. I could sometimes get tied up for 14, 15 days in a row. Um, so it, it would be an issue. Of, it would, it's, a, it's an issue of scheduling more than anything else. But if, if, if it were, if you guys decide it has to be done in 10 working days, then it will be done in 10 working days. Okay. And, and Richard, to your point, which, which is a valid point. I was thinking about that as it's like, well, if there's a objection period, so what if it doesn't mean anything? What I would suggest is language to the effect of the permit 
will not become effective until the passage of 10 days without an objection, or if there's an objection, a rejection of the objection by city council. Or you could do the planning commission even. But Bruce, I think there's another way to solve it as well. Could, is it possible that, that uh, we could make the material that's submitted by the applicant available to the public immediately when you receive it before you've even approved it? Yes, what we can do, uh, like what we're going to do with the other application, is that once they make a submittal, we uh, the plan is that when the submittal goes to the Environmental Safety Dis Division, or, uh, ESD, Environmental Safety Department, for plan check, uh, when we get it, we would post that material at the same time so that it's, uh, you know, it's shared instantly. That's helpful in the timing. And I see Robert Ross still has his hand raised. Robert? Yes, sir. The only thing that I would recommend is that you've got to remember that you have a, a FCC shot clock. Uh, when these applicants really want to push your buttons a little bit, uh, they can jump on you pretty hard uh, from the day that they apply, whether it be uh, for an application uh, for an example, for a small cell, 6409, if it's an application or a request, you got 90 days for them, for you, for you to give them a permit on the 91st day. If you haven't, they can go ahead and construct that. Are you suggesting that they might not supply the engineering until the 89th day? No, once you turn around and, and when I say the shot clock, that's from the day that shot clock starts the day that they give a complete application. On day one, if they give you a complete application, for an example, the 6409 application, you got night, you, you have 90 days total for city council, for any reviews, anything in order to complete that application unless you do um, a uh, you stop the shot clock and that's one of the things that other municipalities get caught on is they fail to meet the shot clock requirements and I'm, course, I'm not Gales, understanding something here if, if we say yes go for it tonight and how long do they have to get the the things that the uh ESD wants to us. We have to go back to the first date of this application. Well, the first date of this application is a year ago. So, mm. what's going on here? Yeah, then, then Gail can talk to you about the shot clock requirements. I think Gail should talk to me about the shot clock requirements. <laughs> Hey, happy to talk to you about the shot clock requirements. So, uh, so uh, what we were just hearing is, you know, uh, some explanation of that there are FCC shot clocks that apply to these uh, applications here um, in this situation. And staff can correct me if I'm wrong. As I understand it, there was some agreement, um, you know, informal with Verizon that's, that the applications that were um, in process were going to be taken up. So we've kind of, we've got, we're kind of beyond shot clocks in a sense now in terms of the application was acted on. Uh, this is the appeal. Verizon agreed to the timing of the appeal. Uh, the, the shot clock rules do say that all permits and authorizations are supposed to be issued within the shot clock period, right? Uh, but uh, the way that the applicants typically deal with the, their applications is they don't file for all of those permits, right? If they need a building permit, they wait till after they get their um, discretionary permit. And so uh, to, the bottom line is the easiest way to address this issue is to ask uh, Verizon Wireless to agree, the applicant to agree to whatever timeline you want to roll out for ad addressing that. But but my experience has been that uh, it, it's a rare occasion that an applicant will 
uh, raise shot clock issues once they've got their initial permit and they're moving into the building permit, electrical permit stage. Uh, but for your best protection, just ask Verizon Wireless, will they agree to this timeline? And, and uh, presumably they will. Bruce has still got his hand up and he's smiling, so he must be ready to speak. I just try to smile whenever I can. Um, so the, I, I heard Robert talk about small cell application shot clocks. I, I thought that there's an issue as to whether shot clocks apply to these particular applications because they're not small cell. That, that's, that's one. So Gail maybe can respond to that in a moment. And the other is, um, if I'm understanding what's been said correctly, though, if the shot clock does apply, then even if we grant a permit subject to satisfying building, satisfying safety after the fact, we still have to have that done within the shot clock period or else we lose. I mean, if that's what I heard. So that, that really doesn't have any bearing on the process we use because it's the same timing whether we have public input or don't have public input. Is that, so those are, those are two questions. Yeah. yeah, so to answer your first question about shot clocks, there is there are now uh, FCC shot clocks. We're just talking about FCC, not state. Uh, five different shot clocks. So there is no wireless application that will come in the door that doesn't have a shot clock that applies to it. There, the the catch-all if it, small wireless facilities have shorter shot clocks. I think uh, Robert was mentioning eligible facilities requests. They also have short shot clocks. Um, here we're talking about uh, changing out a pole, so and not a small cell. So the shot clock would be 150 days. That's the longest one. Uh, and then you know there are ways to stop it and start it and all that with incomplete instant notices and all that. Uh, but that shot clock's been around since 2009, so definitely applied here. Um, well, the clarification the FCC made in more recent orders, I think in 2014 or 2015, was that this covered all permits and authorizations. And so that's what I was saying uh, about, you know, these other, whatever the city can issue would, would be covered uh, by the shot clock according to the FCC rules. But as a practical matter, in my experience with these applications and how applicants address them, they are most concerned about the discretionary approval. They don't push shot clock issues for building permits and, and electrical permits that come after. Uh, that doesn't mean they couldn't uh, raise that issue. And so in an abundance of caution, caution, I would recommend, you know, if you're moving towards an approval that you uh, get uh Verizon to state in the record that they are, you know, not going to raise a shot clock issue with the building permit process. And a representative of Verizon assure us of that now? Daisy, Kevin? Um, I can speak to that. We, we cannot assure that, especially if the council um, opens up comments and um, I mean, posting it is one thing, right? To allow public to see it, we're, we're, we have no objections to posting it. That's totally fine. It's just that what do you do with the comments, and how does that extend the shot clock even further? And um, you know, how does that you know address timelines and whatnot? So um, I cannot um, say that we would agree to to say to stating on the record right now that we are not going to pursue possibly shot clock if if it is open for comments. So. Thank you. Uh, I see Robert's hand is still raised, and then I'm going to go back to Bruce, and then I'm going to go and admit that I don't have a second yet, so maybe I need another motion. Robert? I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. I left my hand raised, and I uh, forgot to take it down. Okay, Bruce, that was the shortest comment we've had so far. So Daisy said exactly what I thought she would and should say as a representative of Verizon. It's what I would have said if I were representing them. And uh, for that reason, again, I, I think we should deny the application because then it's not a question of whether they still have more time or not more time and make them do it again. And then deal with the shot clock. Is that a motion? 
Well, sure. I'll move, I'll move that we deny the applications. I'll second that. Second to that motion. I'll second that. Karen, you have your hand raised. Uh, procedural question. Is that a replacement motion? Because I was about to second Paul's motion. <clears throat> John. Yes, it would be. Paul's motion technically never was seconded. So technically that's probably an initial, uh, a new motion. So if we, look, I thought Paul was withdrawing the motion. If Karen wants to second it now, we can deal with that first and maybe that'll be the end of it. That's fine. You still want to second it? I do. Okay, so the motion, uh, I think Adrian, are you, who's keeping track of it? It was, I believe that we were going to use a, yeah. we're going to require a class three pole of steel or wood, or are we, are we strongly preferring steel? Karen? I would rather just leave it at class three. Okay, a class three poll. What other changes do we have to have to it to make it make sense? The oh, other one was the um, the safety analysis shall be published in the time frame. The safety analysis shall be published immediately upon receipt from the applicant. Okay. That's good with me. So what then happens if somebody believes that the safety analysis is insufficient? It's just, it's... Somebody would need to get their their uh, engineer to look at it and then talk to the city's engineer. And hopefully, if they actually have a good objection, the city's engineer would go, gee, you're right. I didn't see it that way. And then we wouldn't have the problem of, you know, for me to go in there and say, I don't like the blue ink they used, isn't going to make any difference. We need somebody who's an engineer who's going to hopefully add something to the uh, process with the city's engineer. You know, Paul? Yeah. Uh, just as a reviewer, I'm going to be much more effective and get to my job much more quickly if the city, they publish the city's results and allow me to look at those versus making me start from scratch and do all the work that the city's going to do. Reviewing it, once I, I, it, it's been done, is a much quicker process than sitting down and doing it from scratch, just for what it's worth. So if I'm on the outside looking in, I'd like to look at the final results and, and use those to figure out what's going on versus trying to do it from scratch. I think that just adds more time to it. Just I mean, the, uh, the applicant is already going to have done all the work. It's a matter of checking their work, right? Tony has a comment on that. Mikey, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I say Tony has his hand up. He has a comment on that. And he's one of the experts. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Tony. I'm so Are you available? Yes, I am. Um it would be better. It would be, I, I have done this kind of review. I, I work for a utility similar to Edison and I reviewed the original document and then the, then I reviewed the documents of the reviewer. And it's better if, if, and I have found mistakes by both. So it's going to be better off if you publish the, 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 the report prepared by the, by the applicant and the report prepared on behalf of the city. And I want to point out something that, that I think you guys may not appreciate. When that engineer sends that report, he is certifying, he or she is certifying that they have evaluated and mitigated the risks. And not anybody, ha and anybody, not necessarily an engineer can come in and say, you have not mitigated this risk. Because they don't have to be a technical person. As an engineer, I don't care who comes to me. As a professional engineer, I want anybody who thinks I've made a mistake to come to me. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, that makes I, sense. But um, I, if somebody comes in and says that I don't like the color of your ink, I'd say explain why that's a safety hazard and move on. But if I want so if somebody says, "Hey, that 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 bolt is making a funny sound," I want to know about that, even if it's not an engineer. 
because that, that may mean something's going on I don't know about. So I, I, I think we need to understand that a, a professor engineer obviously has more standing, but we, you really have to consider people who, who don't have professional expertise who may see something or think of something that there, if that makes sense. I have no objection to anybody looking at it. I just yeah, anybody can look at it and say, hey, I think this here is wrong. I, I did that as a lay person in New Mexico and found out that 40 people had looked at a report and there was a mistake in it because they didn't have the expertise to see it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I would say that you'd be better off to definitely publish the report that, that's submitted with the application immediately. And then as soon as the report prepared by the city consultant, is is done publish that too that would be your best process i once again going back to expectations i like to be clear with everybody there will not be a report pub created by the city uh, what the plan check process does is we will take the engineering documents and reports those will go to our engineers to review. Now, they will provide written comment if there are corrections, uh, but the goal of what uh, ESD does is to get to a set of plans and a set of documents that answer all questions. And once that happens, uh, they then will put their approval stamp on the plans. So we can definitely share any corrections that come from the city, but the the okay, the you can go forward and start building this is not going to be a written report. It, it would be our city stamp on the engineer's documents. I have a condition uh, ready if we're ready to right. add that to the motion. Please. Um, structural and electrical uh, documents and city review comments uh, must be shared with the public upon submittal and or uh, preparation. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Is there say any more that, discussion? Say that again, Adrian. Do that motion again, please. Sure, this is the added condition, structural and electrical documents um, and city review comments must be shared with the public immediately upon submittal and or preparation. And, and what does and or preparation mean? Shouldn't they be submitted after, after the comments should be when the city is signed off on them, right? Well, there's going to be likely uh, a number of reviews, and every time the structural plans and electrical plans are submitted to the city, the city plan checker will provide a set of comments, which are okay. not submitted, they're prepared by staff. So we, I want to make sure that once those documents are prepared, that we also make those available to the public. Cool. Sounds good. The goal here would basically be to take the file that's at City Hall and and place it on our website so that no one has to actually come to City Hall. Okay. And we just have to let interested parties who will have responded know <laughs> that it's available. Okay. Ready? Kelsey, would you like to call the roll? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? I just need to hear what the motion is again. It's been enough talk. I'm not quite sure I know it. I apologize. It's oh, the here. staff recommendation with two modifications, one requiring a class three poll and the other requiring the posting of the materials as Adrian just described. As to both appeals? Yes. So it's extremely long and hard to read on the screen. No, it's okay. I'm just uh, thinking over not getting my metal pole thing. Um, and, and I'm getting tired. Um, yeah, I'll vote yes. Councilmember Yaris? No. Mayor President Silverstein? Nope. 
motion carries. All right. Can we handle 4C? I think we agreed we would when they when they agreed to the delay. So, uh, sorry. We're now on 4C, appeal number 21-006. Uh, do we have a staff report? Yes, uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and members of the City Council. The uh, next item tonight is for another uh, wireless appeal for a wireless communications facility installed by Verizon located on Pacific Coast Highway inside the public right-of-way. Next slide, please. The project is located on the land side of PCH in the right-of-way. It's northeast of Malibu Pier and Surfrider Beach. Next slide. Same thing as before, in July of 2020, the project was submitted to the city. In September of 2020, the project was deemed complete. The city council adopted uh, the ordinance 477U and, and resolution 2065 in December of 2020. Uh, and in May of 2021, the planning commission approved the item before you tonight. Next slide, please. The project proposes a replacement streetlight pole that reaches an overall new height of 34 feet 9 inches with an attached omnidirectional canister antenna on top of the pole and one remote radio unit which will be concealed within the shroud uh, below the antenna but also atop the pole. Uh, the project includes the installation of three hand holes inside the concrete sidewalk in the right-of-way and the application requires a variance for height and a site plan review for uh, right-of-way installation. Next slide. Uh, here's an existing coverage map provided by uh, Verizon showing the existing cellular coverage. Green's good, yellow's fair, purple's poor in, according to their interpretation. Next slide, please. Here's the proposed coverage. As you see, the cellular coverage doesn't change much, but Verizon is aiming to increase their cellular, uh, their cellular and data capacity in the general area of Malibu Pier and Surfrider Beach. The, the area is highly serviced by locals and tourists. Next slide, please. Here's a site plan review showing the pole location. The uh, original planning commission approval had the um, pole approved three feet east of the existing pole. But after discussions with the appellant and the applicant, uh, it was determined that moving the pole actually three feet west of existing was a more desirable location for the appellant. And uh, although it should be noted that it wasn't the appellant's most desired location, Verizon could not confirm whether the new location would be infeasible. So staff is recommending that the city council approve the new location, which is three feet west of the existing pole. Next slide. Here's a Google Maps that kind of shows that a little better. Um, like I said before, the Planning Commission approved the pool three feet east of that existing pool there. The new location, if approved tonight uh, by the recommendation, would be three feet west of that existing pool. Next slide. Here's an elevation. The current pool is uh, 31 feet tall. The new pool with the uh, canister antenna on top would be 34 feet, nine inches tall. And uh, as mentioned before, the application requires a variance because they are uh, putting in a replacement pole that's taller than 28 feet and taller than the original pole. Uh, staff checked for any primary view determinations within the area and, and did not find any. Uh, and kind of a um, little different than before with the G uh, GO95 standards, the, the height here was uh, proposed for Verizon to meet a SoCal Edison design. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a photo simulation of the proposed site. Next slide. Mr. Stephen Hakim appealed the Planning Commission decision for this project. The appeal items were as follows. A notice was not received by the appellant who owns the property within 500 feet of the proposed site. The proposed site does not meet the setback requirements from a park. The proposed site is out of character with the surrounding neighborhood. The proposed variance for height would be detrimental to public interest because of potential view impacts and there is no special circumstances uh, to grant the variance for height. Next slide, please. So kind of in summary, staff is recommending a couple ch of changes from the Planning Commission Resolution number 2137. Um, one change is to move the pole three feet west of the existing pole, and um, 
the other is to add the building plan check commit uh, the requirement to submit to building plan check and pull permits. Uh, those conditions were not originally added to the planning commission approval because they were they weren't they aren't in the ordinance and they were added in later discussions for planning commission uh, uh, decisions for wireless facilities. Next slide, please. Again, as the as as for the other two, it was brought to our attention that the notice had an incorrect map, but we did verify that this one as well, uh, the actual notices had the correct maps. Next slide, please. So with that, staff recommends the city adopt uh, the resolution 2159, uh, denying the appeal and approving the project as condition. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is council member disclosures. Uh, I'm talking, so I'm gonna begin. I haven't had any conversations with anybody about this but I've read this package at least three times now. I'm tired of it. Steve Uring, you're up. No, no disclosures on my side, but how come we got a, a, a coverage map on this one when we didn't get it on the other ones? I mean, who, we must have asked nicely for this one, huh? So so this one is a new facility, uh, so they were, they were willing to give it to us. Um, the, the coverage maps, I think it wasn't stated last time, um, and it was kind of mentioned in the staff report, uh, kind of what that FCC order alludes to is that they are starting to become um, not really the basis anymore for determining a clear need. A lot of it's a capacity driven issue, which is which is harder to uh, demonstrate. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that in there. But yes, they did add a coverage map. And as you could see, the coverage map still didn't really tell us if there was a need uh, in this area. Thank you, Tyler. Bruce? Yeah, didn't learn. I didn't talk to anybody. Didn't learn anything. But I, I too, I, I too was. Um, I found it ironic that they provided the coverage analysis and the alternative placement analysis with this, even though this one is a small cell application, and they wouldn't provide them for the ones that weren't small cell applications. I don't get it. <laughs> Karen, do you have anything to disclose? No disclosures. Mikey. No disclosure. Okay. Uh, the appellant team will present. Is yes. the appellant team available? We have Stephen Hakeem here. And Stephen, I'm setting your timer for 15 minutes. So let me know if you'd like to save any time for rebuttal. Okay. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? We can. Um, thank you, city council members, uh, for taking the time. I know it's been uh, a long uh, night for everyone, so I'll try to be as brief as I can be. Um, and thank you, staff, for putting together that presentation. Um, there were various items that uh, we based our appeal on, and I'll just kind, uh, kind of go through them quickly. Uh, the first was about receiving the notice. Um, we did not receive any notice uh, for the initial planning commission hearing. And I just wanted to uh, bring that to the attention uh, of everybody also in uh, for any reason that some other neighbors within 500 feet didn't get that uh, same notice. But um, uh, the other uh, issue for us, uh, I mean, the main issue for us is that we're proposing to build a uh, small motel behind this um, proposed cell site. And we have various concerns with the view, the view preservations, um, as well as the location of the uh, uh, new pole. Um, it's also very close to a driveway, similar to what you heard in some of the other uh, appellants uh, prior to this one, but I don't want it to be confused with the previous uh, appeals because it's very different for uh, the reasons which I will go into. Um, one of the other uh, things in the LIP section 3.16.5N states that no wireless communications facility shall be within 500 feet of a park. Um, this is clearly within 500 feet of a park. And I know we have numerous other provisions having to do with, uh, you know, with being within 500 feet of a park. 
And so I don't know why this is any different. And it states that a clear need would uh, need to be demonstrated for the facility to exist there. And due to, you know, you, you saw from their own admission, the coverage maps provided by Verizon show that the general area has good coverage there already. Um, going into the reason that it's out of character for the neighborhood and um, impacting scenic views, uh, the, this poll is, uh, you know, there, there's a, it goes on and on in the staff report about how we don't think that it impacts the scenic views and um, it doesn't, um, uh, evidence in the record demonstrates that all project alternatives that would meet Verizon's goals and objectives have more significant impacts than the current proposal. Therefore, this is the least impactful alternative. And I also bring up that I wasn't noticed because I would have spoke at the planning commission hearing if I knew about it. Um, but, you know, there were uh, other alternatives that Verizon went through. Um, if you go to the, I think there's another slide. Um, is there another slide with, uh, yeah, there we go. So you see here, they have these different alternatives and for, you know, across the street, um, I don't understand why that isn't a better alternative. I know that we had a brief conversation, uh, with Verizon, um, and trying to determine why some of these alternatives or other alternatives in front of the other property where the Malibu Inn restaurant is. Um, that we offer to try to work out with them. And essentially, they just continue to tell us that it doesn't meet our goals or we're going to have problems with Edison or it's not within so many feet of a right-of-way or various excuses that uh, we don't really know if they're accurate or what they mean, to be honest. Um, but, uh, you know, of course, this... Um, uh, once this property hopefully is developed, uh, this will have major scenic impacts for uh, that development. And even if it's not developed, you know, we still uh, have rights to that property and, and it still impacts the view. It's double the width and diameter. It goes from six inches to 12 inches. And um, there's another variance you know, which we don't think is warranted for both height and location. Um, and we don't think there's any special circumstance to grant those variances in this scenario, especially by their own admission when they don't need the additional coverage there. So we think that they should definitely maintain the 28 foot height limit. Um, and I, we have no idea whether or not they can do it within that height limit. Um, at least I don't know. So, um, you know, their, their request for 35 feet, you might say, well, it's only seven feet higher than approximately seven feet higher than the 28 feet that's allowed. But seven feet in the city of Malibu is monumental. I mean, we can't even get a new sign approved for more than six feet. So, you know, every foot makes a big difference. And um, as uh, Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein astutely uh, mentioned, granting these variances for height is not just something that, uh, you know, it's going to set a precedent for every provider to say, well, you gave it to Verizon, and so you should give it to everybody. Um, so the, these were the general um Concerns that we had, we also saw that this was an omnidirectional canister antenna, and we didn't know really exactly what that, you know, so essentially what that would mean from my uh, viewpoint is that the radio frequencies could also be pointing directly towards the proposed development right into the occupant's rooms, and, you know, I don't know if that is something that needs to be looked at further or not. Um, but I assume that, you know, the regulatory conditions cover that. Um, so I'd like to, uh, uh, I think there was one more slide. Uh, so this just kind of shows the general proposed development. Um, and again, you know, I'm not trying to, I'm usually 
trying to be on the other side of this. I wasn't trying to make this difficult for Verizon. Um, so that's why we tried to work something out with them. Uh, but essentially they kind of ignored our requests and in saying that for whatever reason, which we don't really know, it, those other alternatives don't really work for them. Um, and, uh, you know, they said, well, we would have to file a new application and we've already been working on this for a year now. And to which I sort of laughed because we've been working on our development for over 10 years now. So anyway, I'm here to answer any further questions. We'd like to try to work something out. Hopefully that's amicable. But again, I think the biggest factor for us is that increased height that we really don't see any reason for the special circumstance of that variance request. Um, and I'll just save the rest of the time for rebuttal. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Stephen. Is the applicant available? Yes, we'll get them unmuted right now. Good evening, council members and mayor. Um, we'll actually have uh, Rob Searcy start up the presentation and go over a few slides and then hand it over to me. Rob. Rob, you should have a pop-up asking you to unmute. Mayor, commissioners, can you hear me? Yes, I'm we can hear you. Hearing for the council members. Uh, my name is Rob Searcy, and I'm the consultant who works with the engineering group who actually designed the site, triaged the area to find a viable location, and came in with a design. And before I get to the slide deck, if I could just probably point out a few items that might help move us along uh, quicker. Uh, I will do that, and also I wanted to bring to your attention that we have Kevin Sullivan, our Kevin Sullivan, and Daisy Kimpang, who will also uh, want to provide some comments as a part of this. Uh, when we first start looking at a site, we definitely take into account that there's the LCP, the LIP, and the municipal code for the city. Uh, I think the overarching uh, standard that we see is that public safety and preservation of the resources in the area of the, are of the highest magnitude. Um, I also want to bring to the to the forefront that we have some design criteria that supplement the LCP, the LIP, and the municipal code that are construction standards that are disseminated by Southern California Edison and also by Caltrans. Uh, those uh, standards pretty much require that anytime we identify an SCE streetlight standard and that asset is being identified as a co-location opportunity, that that pole has to be replaced with a structurally sound pole that is of a larger diameter and with a larger case on. We are then also required to relocate that pole at least three feet from the existing location and Edison will not allow us to do a same hole set. So we have to locate it either way at a minimum of three feet. Um, three feet is also a significant number as it relates to how Caltrans and SCE have a standard that will not allow us to place any replacement pole within three feet of a driveway approach. And if you'll notice as we go through this, you'll see that happens uh, very frequently and that also minimizes our opportunities in this area. So if you could go to uh, slide number three. Slide number three is an aerial view that shows our proposed location where the yellow pin is located. You'll see that on the south side of PCH, you have Surfrider Beach, Malibu Pier, and on the north side, you have commercial area uh, that includes restaurants, uh, vacant lot that Mr. Hakim's uh, group owns, um, a Shabbat, and also some commercial area. Next slide, please. You'll see here that we have a picture of the existing 31 foot tall streetlight. That streetlight currently resides in a location that would be just about in line with the uh, elevator uh, system proposed at Mr. Hakim's uh, design project. And that's based on the information he provided to us. Uh, this site currently is in conformance with the LCP, the LIP and the municipal code. 
and that is an existing vertical structure. It's on the land side of Pacific Coast Highway. It's located in front of commercial uh, property in a parking lot. It meets the coverage objective, and the site is the least intrusive option as it relates to scenic views. Um, as you can see in the proposed design, we are replacing that uh, existing octagonal pole. The octagonal pole is a nine inch diameter pole that tapers to six inches. And our proposed site is a 12 inch diameter pole that tapers to nine inches. We would then place our antennas and radios in a 66 foot or a 66 inch um, radome on top of that standard. And the diameter of that uh, radome is about 12 inches. Next slide, please. Um, on this slide, you can see that um, we are simply emphasizing that all seven alternatives of vertical elements that are existing along PCH are all in excess of the 20 foot or 28 foot height standard that the code limits. As such, we don't have an opportunity to meet the objective of the code to attach to an existing element and not require a variance because even if we uh, attach to any one of those uh, structures, a variance would be required. And throughout the city, you have numerous sites where we have, um, as a uh, wireless industry attached to Southern California Edison streetlights, Southern California streetlights do not uh, provide an opportunity for us to place our antennas below the luminaire. And therefore we would always be in excess of that 20 foot, 28 foot limit. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, we've identified three initial alternate sites that were investigated. Next slide. Alternative one is a, an existing Edison street light at the easterly uh, end of the boundary of Mr. Hakim's property. The, this site is again, a 31 foot street light in excess of the 28 foot height standard. Any attachment to that would reflect the same design that we're proposing uh, that has been approved before you today. And again, that is not a site that would provide a coverage objective solution. And we're, since we're trying to densify the area here, we're simply trying to provide additional coverage to offset the capacity uh, deficiency that is in service here. Next slide, please. Uh, both alternative two and three are on the beach side of PCH and being on the beach side of PCH is inconsistent with the local coastal uh, program, the LIP and the municipal code. Uh, option two would provide uh, an efficient line of sight. However, it is not consistent with the LIP. Next slide. Alternative three is a street light on the beach side. It is about 130 feet um, to the east of alternative two and does not provide a line of sight. And again, this pole is on the beach side and therefore inconsistent with the LCP. Next slide. When we first submitted our project to staff, staff evaluated the proposed project and required that we look at some additional sites in order to establish whether or not there was a viable candidate as we move further west of the location. Next slide, please. Alternative four is on the north side of PCH, and this is again a 31 foot street light. Uh, this site is actually, actually, it would be the most optimum uh, opportunity for us to shoot in an effort to meet the coverage objective and to provide an unobstructed line of sight. However, if you'll notice in the picture, there is a driveway approach uh, at the bottom of the picture. There's also another one on the other side. Uh, that driveway approach uh, preempts us from being able to relocate that street light to meet Caltrans and SCE design standards. Therefore, the site was rejected. Next slide. Now, alternatives five and six are also on the north side of PCH. And both of these structures um, from a uh, coverage objective do not provide the adequate line of sight. Uh, alternative five is actually an Edison street light and it is located adjacent to the driveway um, for the in and out or for the uh, fast food restaurant. That location does not allow us to relocate that uh, street light either side of 
the existing monopole that's developed adjacent to it. If we move that pole to the east, it would obstruct the access into that restaurant and would not provide ADA coverage. The uh, existing monopole that's there, because of uh, standard wireless separation, vertical separation, it would not be an option for us because we would have to add basically 12 feet to accommodate the 12 foot separation and then another five feet to accommodate our facility locating on top of it. And that pole would then top out at about 48 feet. These options were reviewed by staff and they found those to be reasonable as they were rejected as disqualified candidates. Next slide, please. Um, alternative seven is one that we discussed at length with Mr. Hakeem in two separate meetings following his um, filing of the appeal. On this option, we were more than willing to look at investigating what whether or not we could actually relocate that street light three feet to the, to the west. However, if we did this without having it be a part of the project, it would cost about $25,000 and it would take about eight men and about five days in order to accommodate that investigation. Next slide. Uh, this too is a, an exhibit that was shown by staff. Where you have photo A, uh, that is actually an existing SCE uh, vault. Uh, B also shows where you've got uh, power coming across PCH into that vault and sweeping around the corner of our um, proposed location for our streetlights and the existing streetlight. You'll also see in this area, you've got existing handholes that power uh, the Edison streetlights in this area. And at the back of the sidewalk, you've got uh, fiber uh, from one of the cable companies. Next slide, please. Here you can see where USA actually came out and based on the schematic maps obtained during our substructure research, you can see a sweep of that proposed alignment of the electrical uh, conduit that run down that sidewalk. Um, as you move further east down the sidewalk, there's a major uh, vault that locates there. And we're not sure whether or not those two electrical conveyances are in the same trench or separate trenches. However, we would need to physically expose the line there to find out exactly what options we have and the ability to move that site to the west. Last, uh, or the next one, please. Uh, this is simply a uh, communication that we received from Southern California Edison confirming that the research that we obtain is simply schematic and that a physical investigation would be required. But at this point, I'll uh, turn this over to Daisy and have her take it from here. Brown. May I do a time check, please? You have four minutes left. Okay, thank you. Um, next slide, please. So here we're, um, we're proposing a new facility as opposed to the new projects earlier. And it's intended to provide a capacity solution and increase antenna signals in the general areas of Malibu Pier and Surfrider Beach. It'll be a replacement SEE pole and conservatively, we're trying to also address the number of visitors that come to this area, so we provide the statistics here. Um, the proposed small cell facility will all be located on PCH uh, with an average daily trip on Caltrans records at 40, 47,580, so a lot of daily traffic. Next slide, please. So same arguments earlier that were brought with the two facilities under retroactive application apply. So next slide, please. In this particular case, um, the, the, um, in addition to what we argued earlier, um, this is actually a small cell. So the application for um, FCC's requirements, we bring up um, the standard of um, basically uh, densifying the network. That's the goal here. Next slide, please. So here I provide enhanced coverage maps in addition to what was submit, submitted previously. So what you can see here is the purple um, Malibu Pier 101, which is this project, is proposed to pick up where our other site, um, Malibu Riviera A3, ends. So it's supposed to pick up the, um, the need for that particular location and also due to the volume that we get from Surfrider Beach and Malibu Pier. Next slide, please. So as you can see, there is some help that's actually happening as far as capacity and coverage um, for this location. Next, please. This is just a standalone view of um, how far uh, this proposed location is supposed to cover. 
Next, please. We do have conditions that we raised originally before, um, and we're just raising them again. And also, the appellant's concerns about noticing, please see Exhibit A of Kevin Sullivan's letter dated October 11th. Um, the applicant, the appellant here was actually the first notice person um, on that Exhibit A, so he did receive notice of the Planning Commission meeting. In addition to that, um, we spent a good number of time, unlike what was um, stated by the appellant earlier, we spent at least an hour or an hour and a half and staff was present at both those meetings twice with the appellant to go over the same um, alternatives and the different reasoning why we, we are able to do what we can do. So we are open, bottom line is we are open to the location that staff is proposing three feet to the west. However, only if um, we have the option to go back to the original proposed location, if our sub step, sub, uh, sub underground um, investigations show that we cannot build at the location three feet west. So if we are given that option to, to revert back to the location that, um, that we originally proposed, then we are open to it. Um, you see, you have a minute left. Okay, I will reserve that for rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you, Daisy. Do we have any public comment? Yes, we have one speaker signed up. We'll hear from Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Thank you. I, I wanted to say that um, I don't think there was a public notice posted and maintained for the time period through, well, whenever it was, June of 2020 until tonight for this hearing, because I would have seen it. And that's a requirement of the applicant that uh, I realize it's been over a year, but they need to, to notify the public so that they understand. And Mr. Hakim would have seen the notice in front of his property that he's been meeting with his architects and developers and the public and everything else. So uh, this is probably the third one that didn't have proper notice uh, for the public maintained by the applicant, which is a requirement. So I'd like to assert that as a private individual that this was not properly noticed. Um, the second is, I don't see a battery backup component. This is all new facility and the batteries could be down, you know, in the sidewalk in a vault. Um, I would consider this a macro cell and I'd like to have you get Bob Ross to uh, confirm, maybe based on the power outputs of this proposed site. It's not only different. It's more omnidirectional, as they said in the Radome. They want to shoot data up into the hillside homes, uh, into the hotel rooms, into the businesses, and, you know, charge a monthly fees to run their credit cards and other data services, streaming video, and so forth. That's the profitable aspect of, cell, of the cell phone companies these days. Um, it's not on unlimited talk and text for $14 with Spectrum, just reselling this service from Verizon. The last, though, is the, the view obstruction. And the alternatives uh, two and three across the street are actually less view obstructive because if you take your finger and put it in front of your eye, you're going to block out a whole bunch of view. And just as Steve could tell you about a little issue up at Harbor Vista, the closer you put the thing, uh, the more it's going to obstruct. And across the street, uh, the view obstruction is minuscule as viewed from all of these properties that are highly valued and proposed for development of certain types. And those other analysis saying it's not consistent with the LIP, well, you know what? You're the city council. You make that determination. Um, I don't think this is a small cell. And I'd like to know the power outputs. If it's quadruple the output of a traditional microcell that would shoot signal uh, up and down the highway and not up into the hillside and into the homes. And uh, it, it should have battery backup as a full cell because if it's if it's needed, we're definitely going to need it during an emergency and, and needs to work. So I'd like to see Verizon step up and do that. Uh, I'm watching them. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Are there any other members of the public? No, see no other speaker signups or hand raised. We can move on to the appellant rebuttal. Thank you very much. Is the appellant available? Steven, Steve. I'm gonna adjust your timer and you'll have seven minutes. 
Okay, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I, in summary, you know, we we try to work this out. You saw the other locations. I still don't understand why across the street is not a less intrusive scenario. Um, and those uh, depictions from Daisy showing that the coverage got better. That's the first time I ever saw that. Um, and it looked like the coverage got better towards the direction um, uh, closer towards Santa Monica, which is one of the other uh, alternatives. So I don't know why, again, that one is not uh, meeting their objectives and goals. Um, and again, you know, the main, the main elephant in the room here is um, they keep saying, well, we can't we can't do it any uh, lower uh, because we can't attach to, to this uh, without going above the light. Um, but so what? So then they should look for an alternative that works or they should do what many other uh, facilities have done and attach to buildings um, that are in actual compliance and not over uh, the height limit. So, um, you know, it's obvious what they want to do is to increase their uh, uh, coverage in the densely populated peer area. Uh, but I don't think that it's fair or just to grant uh, such a variance uh, at our detriment of our views, um, amongst other things. And, um, you know, for the various reasons that we outlined. Uh, so I'll let you guys take it from here. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, is the applicant ready? Yes. Um, thank you for the opportunity to close um, our arguments. Just wanted to state um, a couple things. SCE only gives uh, wireless carriers several options on height. So the next height down would be 23 feet. Um, and so that height would be completely inconsistent with the lighting in the area and the poles in the area. So, and we would not be able to achieve what we need to achieve at the height of 23 feet. So that's the height that um, we have proposed here today. In addition to that, again, I would reiterate that um, council look at the letter that Kevin Sullivan provided with the fact showing that the noticing was properly completed. We also did the sign posting notice as required by the city. Um, staff was witness to our communications with um, Mr. Hakeem and our attempts to try and achieve a result here that could be amenable to both. Um, and we think that Verizon has provided um, all the reasons why this site is needed. Council, thank you for your time. And we uh, urge you to deny the appeal and approve this project. Thank you very much. I believe at this point we go to the council. Who would like to open up? Hmm. Bruce, you go first. Why not? Why this not? won't be anywhere near as long as the others. This one's Thank actually God. a lot. This, this one's a lot. This one's a lot easier, and I know where it's going, but um, I still have problems with it. Um, first of all, we, we we no longer have a height requirement for utility poles and 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 these wireless facilities, obviously, because again, as I said before, all the applicant has to do is say it meets. It, we need this for our purposes, and they get the uh, variance. So I'm sure that's what's going to happen now again. Um, I note the exhaustive alternative placement analysis. That's exactly what I would have liked to have seen and think we were entitled to see with respect to the other two applications because they would have been very revealing. Um, a general matter, I mean, Ryan's comments, I, I find Ryan's comments far more often than not are very well taken. They seem to always be disregarded. I mean, there's, I don't know whether people have them in their mind to think about them, but I never hear any response from the staff or the appellant or the applicant or anybody as to why he's wrong. And I suspect that's because more often than not, he's right, but it's little points that nobody seems to care about. So they just get disregarded. Um, I don't understand the argument that I hear consistently that SCE only provides limited options. I mean, we're required to bend to the requirements of the um, telecom, but SCE can just ignore them. I, I don't get how that works, but maybe that's just the way the law is. The mailing issue, 
I had asked about that. Apparently, there is no real record of the mailing. I'm not going to, that's probably, that's not going to stand in the way of anybody, but all there is is a list of, of who to mail to. You know, when I send my tax returns out to IRS, I take a picture of the envelope to prove that I mailed it in case there's ever a problem. There's nothing like that. There's no records. I hope that the staff will keep better records in the future for, so that we can resolve assertions like this, that there was no mailing. The proposed variance finding number one is that, I'm sorry, in the planning commission staff report is there are special circumstances or exceptional characteristics applicable to the subject property, including size, shape, topography, location, or surroundings such that strict application of the zoning ordinance deprives such property privileges enjoyed by other property in the vicinity and under the identical zoning classification. I've previously been told that finding is required to grant a variance. I may have missed it, but I did a word search. I couldn't find that finding in the proposed resolution for city council. Maybe the word search program didn't work. I don't know. Maybe, hopefully somebody will point that out to me. I couldn't find it. In support of variance finding three, it stated there are some other similar facilities co-located on existing utility poles that exceed 28 feet in height within the city of Malibu, and granting this variance will not constitute a special privilege to the applicant, and it would bring the project closer into compliance with other design criteria. It is common that co-located facilities exceed 28 feet in height in order to meet those requirements, and I heard a similar statement by the appellant, the applicant. I asked the staff whether any of the other co-located facilities in excess of 28 feet are on street lights on PCH. I was told we don't know the answer to that. I tried to do my due diligence. That was the answer I got. Lastly, the argument's been made by the appellant that because this is within 500 feet of a park, Surfrider Beach, there needs to be a finding made that clear, showing that a clear need for the facility exists. That is what our law provides. The staff report acknowledges that's what our law provides. The staff report says that that's somehow been satisfied, but I couldn't find any explanation of how that's been satisfied. The answer that's given by the staff is the project site is located within 500 feet of Surfrider Beach and Malibu Pier, pursuant to LIP section 3.15.5N. No wireless telecommunication facility shall be located within 500 feet of any school, ground, playground, or park unless a finding is made based on technical evidence acceptable to the planning director as appropriate, showing a clear need for the facility and no technical feasible alternative site exists. The report then says, as stated in alternative site analysis, the applicant has demonstrated that no technically feasible alternative site exists that would place the proposed project more than 500 feet from Surfrider Beach and Malibu Pier. Well, that just establishes that there's no other alternative. It doesn't establish a clear need. We've been told that there is adequate coverage in this area. This is just to densify the coverage. I don't know that densifying a coverage is a clear need for a proposed facility, especially when we have a resident who believes rightly that it is interfering with his potential future business prospect. So again, I think that this application is not well-founded. I think the requirements for a variance are not satisfied, but I know I'm going to lose that one either four to one or three to two. I suspect three to two, which is the de rigueur vote these days at the planning commission and here. Thank you. Chris? I don't see another hand, so I'm going to jump in with a couple of questions. I'm not on Verizon, but I have suffered dropped calls in that area. There's something about the kink in the road there. I don't know why it is, but it's frustrating for me, but I wouldn't be helped because I'm not on Verizon. Has the appellant accepted the option of three feet to the west? Is that a space that he can live with? Yeah, they mentioned that that's an option that they would be okay with, provided that after they do some work on establishing what's actually there and it's feasible, 
uh, that they would they would be okay with that option. Um, they mentioned that it I is. Think you, I asked about the appellant. You've just told me about the applicant. Oh, I'm sorry. The the uh, we did talk to the appellant as well. Um, the appellant um, uh, was okay with that option, but preferred other options, uh, including an option that would put it in front of the Malibu Inn instead of uh, the you know three foot to the west location. Um, but they prefer you know in terms of the proposed or the approved location, which is three feet to the east, they would prefer three feet to the west, uh, which is what staff is recommending. But in terms of uh, optimally, they would uh, want it to be across the street or, like I said, uh, in front of Malibu Road, uh, uh, Malibu Inn, excuse me. And the problem there is there's two driveways too close together so moving anything gets you even closer to one of the driveways. Correct. Okay. Uh, and uh, there's, there's, is there a battery backup option here that is going to be in one of those uh, hand holes or is that not something that's possible here? It's possible. Um, they can, we can certainly ask the applicant whether uh, it's something they're willing to do. Um, they have mentioned before that they looked at a couple, I think there's three or four sites um, that they uh, felt were best suited for um, battery ba backup. Apparently it's very costly and they're only doing it for the city of Malibu. Um, and they, again, only picked a few locations along PCH to provide those battery backups. Um, um, but we can certainly ask them if that's something they're willing to do on the site. And can the, uh, can the applicant respond to the appellant's question about, will the antennas be beaming towards the rooms or how directional are these antennas? They're actually directional, not omnidirectional. Um, and the, as far as um, the the emissions, they're actually um, facing towards Surfrider Beach because that's the area we're trying to cover. So okay. um, that's the, it's not intended um, for for the in behind it or the proposed development behind it. It's intended to cover PCH and Surfrider Beach and and the pier. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, who would be next? I see Mikey's hand. My question has to do with appeal item two. Um, is there, I want the term clear need is here. Is it actually part of the code that a clear need needs to be established? I see differing opinions on that in here, and I don't know the answer. Yeah, and, and we can uh, maybe have Gail address the clear need question, but to answer the question you just asked, the municipal code does require that the applicant demonstrate that there is a clear need for the facility um, because it's located within 500 feet from a park. Um, the park at the time this application was submitted uh, did not have a definition, and we consider all of, um, you know, the beach uh, to be a park, and locating the facility anywhere along PCH would, in essence, be less than 500 feet. So um, given that uh, they had a target area, um, there was no place for them to locate this facility and avoid uh, that 500 foot encroachment into the beach. Okay. Um, did you want to elaborate on that, Gail, or is that pretty much it? Um, sure. I, I would just add a couple of comments. Um, so <clears throat> you have uh, that standard of clear need in your code. Uh, it's not 
not a defined standard, so it's subject to some interpretation about what that might entail, right? What, what does it mean, a clear need? Um, and a couple of considerations on that. One is that this is a, uh, a small wireless facility or a small cell application. And so from the um, applicant's perspective, I think they, they've been arguing that the need that they have to demonstrate is um, if you if you're going to say it's like an if you have to show an effective prohibition, they would point to the FCC small cell order, uh, which uh, has kind of lessened the standard from the old significant gap least intrusive means standard to a material inhibit standard. <clears throat> and I can quote you from the order itself. It says the test is so this material inhibits effective prohibition test. If that's the clear need, um, this test is met not only when filling a coverage gap, but also when densifying a wireless network, introducing new services, or otherwise improving service capabilities. So uh, it, it was intended to be a softened standard, recognizing uh, that um, we're not dealing with issues of no coverage in many cases now with small cells, we're really dealing with densifying and improving the capacity of existing networks. So that's the applicant's view. If you're looking at clear need in your code um, and you're thinking of it's an effective prohibition standard, there's a lower standard uh, now in the small cell order. Well, certainly I cannot make a finding with what was presented for clear need based on our code. There's no doubt. I mean, I saw the one map, there was coverage. I saw the next map, there was coverage. <laughs> so I, I don't, I don't, I can't make that finding. That's why I'm trying to understand the, the federal law as it relates to that, which I'm still a little lost on. I mean, I heard you, but as I'm hearing it right now, I can't make that finding. That's how I, that's why I'm throwing that out there. So someone can convince me I'm wrong if they want to, but that's how I read it. That's that's my comments right now. Thank you, Mikey. Uh, I don't see other hands, Bruce. So you get a second turn. I'm happy to wait out anybody who hasn't commented. Seeing no hands, you're it, boss. All right. Well, you know, I, I want to pick up where Mikey left off because I don't see how we can possibly make that finding either. Um, clear need doesn't need to me to me doesn't need much defining for me to understand what it means. It means they can't provide the personal wireless service, i.e. wireless phone calls, without it. This, the report says there must be a clear need. The same report on page six says the existing coverage map shows that the general area has good coverage already. But for wire, Verizon Wireless aims to add additional network capacity. To me, that's not a need. That's a want. And as the Rolling Stones say, you don't always get what you want. You get what you need. That was really campy. I'm sorry. Um, I, I think no camping here. Sorry. I think ultimately it's a bit of a mute point because I suspect the wireless industry will roll, try and roll us over, but I just can't make that finding. So if no one else is going to speak, I would make a motion to deny because I cannot make appeal item number two. I can't make that. Second. I see Kevin has his hand raised. That's great. I was looking for someone to try and tell me I'm wrong. So, Kevin. Mr. Sullivan. Yes, thank you, Mayor Grisante. I was just unmuted. So the city's code section, uh, particularly here, a, um, a potential finding of clear need also has to be reviewed and interpreted under governing federal law. And as uh, Gail Karish pointed out, the FCC's 2018 small cell order um, kind of identified a kind of a new standard for carrier justification for their facilities. Um, the 2018 FCC small cell order does not have a clear need standard. It has a much lower standard of a carrier that is proposing a small cell facility, and that's what we have here, everyone agrees to that, um, is only required to show under preemptive federal law that they are trying to densify uh, a network, increase network services, or improve network services. 
there is no clear need requirement under federal law with respect to small cell facilities. Um, and so that's, that's our explanation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Kevin, can you show me in this report the data that, that shows that, that it accomplishes that goal? Yeah, I'm sorry, you, uh, Daisy with Verizon explained that the purpose of the facility is to densify uh, and improve network coverage with respect to Pacific Coast Highway, which has nearly 50,000 average daily trips, and also to densify and improve coverage with respect to Surfrider Beach and uh, the Malibu Pier. I totally get that, and I totally agree with what you're saying, but I don't see it in the report. How do we, how do we judge that? If that's the finding we're supposed to make, where is the point to me where in the report it does that? It's, it shows yeah. how you're doing that. I get that you want to do this project, and I'm sure you are doing it. But if I have to make that finding, where am I seeing that data? You're seeing that data based on Verizon's testimony here tonight. And in making any kind of findings and approving any resolution, the city council is able to utilize uh, any substantial evidence that is in the record, including Verizon's um, statements uh, made tonight. And it looks like Daisy may have something to add on that. Daisy? Yes, uh, Council Member Pearson. Um, just want to state um, capacity is something that's not um, something we can show the way we show coverage. Um, there's not like a modeling that we can we can show to you in in a picture of sort, you know, how capacity is is improved. So that's why um, when we're being asked to um, show why we need the site, you know, typically you get coverage maps, right? Um, and the need here is really what dri what is driving um, the facilities um, asked here. And in addition to that, I had indicated earlier that, um, this facility will pick up where the other facility, Malibu Riviera and um, A3, leaves off. That facility is an older facility. It's, it's similar to the other two that just previously came before you. And so there are services that in that facility um, that this facility will provide that that doesn't. So it basically picks up, you know, certain services and, and allows for increased capacity, especially during times of need, emergency, um, and or, um, you know, increased visitors and which inevitably this area does get. So, um, you know, and, and that's what we're showing here is the densification de the network. I hear you. And I guess I'm thinking, I guess, thank you, Daisy. And I hear you and I'm sure you're right. I guess I'm just thinking it's kind of like buying a car, you know, you know how much horsepower it is, zero to 60. And so I would think, you know, this model, whatever it is, can carry X number of calls related to X number of traffic. I just don't, you know, it's like literally there's just no data. And it's, it's just catching my attention right now that we're asked to make a finding and I just, there's no real data. There's just a story. And I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying I don't see it. That's all. So thank you. Bruce? Yeah, well, I concur with what Mikey just said. Um, and it's not going to change my analysis of that, that we're not legally compelled to grant this or that our statute is preempted. But um, I, I heard the, the lawyer say that we all agree it's a small cell facility. And I actually thought that was the case coming in. But I did hear Ryan ask the question uh, and ask for our consultant's view on whether that's been demonstrated as well. And I haven't heard a response. I see Robert's hand is raised. Um, Mr. Ross? Uh, yes. Um, from from the information that we received, it is definitely a small cell. Um, and the one thing that may help a little bit, in most cases when we receive these applications, um, we ask for analysis immediately upon um, the site going up, which would give us um, the exact 
uh, output of those sites, which would give us a little bit more information to determine just exactly what the uh, coverage would be. Um, everything that you're seeing right now is is uh, is computer generated and hypothetical. Uh, to tell you what the actual site is going to do, I don't know yet until after the site goes up. So we're, it's an assumed um, uh, position that it would do cover those areas where exactly it will cover and what the power output's going to be and what the RF's going to be at that site. Uh, we won't know that until actually the site's gone up. Thank you, Robert. And I see it. Gail's hand is raised as well. Right. I just wanted to add that for the purposes of determining whether, whether this is a small wireless facility under under the definitions in the FCC rules, uh, the output is not uh, a factor. It's it's based on volume of equipment and height and and uh, their definition, not not the um, uh, the output or the. So I just wanted to clarify that. And it, and the purpose of the definition is really to establish certain requirements, so like uh, a sp special shot clocks and things like that. Thank you, Gail. I saw Karen's hand earlier. Did you? You're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, I forgot if it was... Adrian, somebody made the statement that the backup battery uh, was very costly. What does that mean? Uh, we, we can ask the applicant. Uh, they explained to us that it's not something they typically add to their facilities, and it was something that they were doing specifically for the city of Malibu based on uh, a request made uh, by uh, other departments uh, uh, due to the, you know, due to the need and uh, the the reason we'll see fire. But we can ask uh, Verizon about the cost. Um. Okay, thank you. I think it's worth looking into. Um, so would that be Jay-Z's going to respond or who's going to respond to that? Is that yeah, an answer we would... can get now? Yes, it's me. Um, Thank you uh, for the question, council member for, um, I don't have the exact cost of what it is, but um, the main concern actually I have about adding a battery backup unit here are more um, spacing reasons, Caltrans and Edison. So it's not so much the cost. Um, you know, we could look into possibly doing that. Um, I just would have, to, we'd have to make sure that Caltrans would accept it, that there's enough spacing um, in the area. To, to accommodate, um, it's not like um, you know the other two sites were, or actually the Canaan Doom where you have a little bit more room. You know, it, this one there's it's a very narrow uh, regular sidewalk. So um, you know, depending on those three elements, which is SCE um, and substructure, actually four, I'd say SCE, Caltrans, and substructure information and space in the public right away. Um, mainly ADA, you know, can we be ADA compliant? So um, if those conditions um, are feasible, we could look into it, um, and we would certainly be open to that. Okay. Uh, I can appreciate all of those um, parameters, but, uh, yes, I think that is definitely something to look into. Um, I just have to note I have found it interesting uh, in tonight's deliberations to see the, um, the sympathetic, uh, response that Bruce has had tonight to a hospitality developer. I found that fascinating. I guess you never know what you're going to see at one of these meetings. Um, anyway, uh, I do think it's worth looking into, uh, the backup unit. Um, and I, I, I don't know why we wouldn't have that. Uh, Ryan, I believe that was your suggestion. 
So contrary to a statement made tonight, we do listen to what you say. And I want to thank you for that. Um, so I don't know. Are we ready to make a motion? I do see Bruce's hand is up. There is a motion in the second on the floor. Oh, Mr. excuse Fair. me. Okay. All right. Go ahead. All right. Can you read the motion back for us, please? Well, it's I, a motion to deny the project. I don't know if you want to hear from Mayor Putin Silverstein first. Okay, Bruce. Yeah, man, you're going to be shocked by this one because, you know, contrary to suggestions by some people, I try to be honest about this. Um, Mikey, I mean, I, I, I'm going to vote no, but and I hear your concern that you can't make that finding, which I agree. I could not make that finding either. I've got other issues, but um, would you approve this if that finding were not required? In other words, if the resolution didn't need to have that finding? Is that your only is that your only issue? You're muted. Looking at specifically we're asked to rule on here, these appeal items, that is the item that I was struggling with. If it certainly with a battery backup, it's um, a much more attractive proposal to me. I'm still not sure on appeal item number two. Yeah, but everything else. Um, you know, right. What I'm, what I'm, that's my main item. Yes. What I'm asking is, in a, if the, if the city attorney were to tell us that the resolution need not that we need not find a clear need, it's an interesting argument, and you know, because Gail's suggesting maybe right. some. If if we need not find it and do not find it, would you then have a different view, especially if a battery backup could be added? Yes. I thought I thought that might be the case. So lawyers. Do we have to find that or do we not have to find that? Well, uh, your code, so you have to apply your code, but your, I think, um, if I'm recalling correctly, your, your code says that you should apply it consistent with state and federal law as well. That's also your objective. So it would be an issue of interpreting this requirement of a clear need consistent with the FCC small cell order uh, that has uh, basically said that if an applicant is looking for uh, improving their service, increasing their capacity, something less than a significant gap, least intrusive means test would, would apply. Yeah, Gail, with, with all due respect, and I truly mean this, that, that's re-argument, not an answer to my question. Do we need to find a clear need? Whatever that, whatever we might think that means, or do we not? You you need to apply your code and and apply it consistent with uh, and and I I need a minute to pull up what your code says at the beginning, but I, I believe that it says something to the effect that you are supposed to apply you intend to apply your code consistent with with state and federal law. So it's an interpretation issue. But you have to make a finding under your code. I, I really would like a direct answer to my direct question. Leaving aside whatever we might think a clear need means, do we need to find a clear need or do we not? Yeah, you need to find a clear need because Thank that is your code. Thank you. That was the question. Mikey, do you still are you still making the motion? I'm still seconding it if you are. Uh, I think I wouldn't hear what Paul said. He's starting to talk. My, my question is, I, I think it was Kevin who waded in with an explanation of why the clear uh, need standard doesn't apply any longer. Am I correct that it was Kevin or was it someone else? It was both of us. Was, we yeah. both were pointing to the FCC small cell order. Okay. But the, You know, I have the I have the language uh, of that section. If you uh, would like for me to read it, because there's more to it than just the clear need. Um, if that helps, yes, please. please. Okay. So, um, and if you like to follow, this is on page 52 of the, your packet, uh, and it's part of the uh, staff report that was prepared for the planning commission. Um, it says, uh, no wireless telecommunication facility 
shall be located within 500 feet of any school ground, playground, or park unless a finding is made, uh, comma, based on technical evidence acceptable to the planning director as, a, as a appropriate, showing a clear need for the facility and that no technical feasible alternative, alternative site exists. So it has, there's a, a requirement for technical need and that there is an alternative site. And like I mentioned before, no matter where you place it on PCH, you would still be less than the 500 feet from the beach. So I guess then the question becomes, do, have we, has the, what is, was it planning director you said? It does say uh, acceptable to the planning director, um, but that was assuming that the planning director would be the one making the decision on the project. Okay. In this case, so it would be city council. Code that I'd like to ask Richard quickly, have this, this will decide my vote. <laughs> um, have you seen technical evidence to support that? I think, Tyler, as we discussed on this one, and, and it's, I'm sorry, it's been a while, but the evidence I recall seeing was just the statements from Verizon. Am I correct on that? Yes. So um, based on the area, it being within the, the vicinity of the Malibu Pier, Surfrider Beach, and kind of the commercial core of the city, uh, we did accept Verizon's statement as a, as a need. So you're accepting that you have technical evidence? Okay. That's well. That's what the code says. That's why I'm asking. Actually, can, I've asked about this before. Whether when it says planning director, that means planning director when it's before us. And I've been told by the lawyers consistently, no, it doesn't. It means city council in this point. At this point, the other thing is the statute clearly says, as as Adrian just read, that there are two findings that must be made, not one or the other and means both. So we're still looking at clear needs. So unless Gail is telling us, not, not Verizon's lawyer, but our lawyer is telling us that that provision of our code is preempted, not, not that we have to think about how to define it, but it's preempted that we need to make that finding whatever we think it might mean. So Gail, is it preempted? So, no, because a decision has to be, uh, so if there were an effective prohibition claim, if you, let's just play this out, for example, say you were to deny because you couldn't make that finding, then it would be a matter of whether there would be uh, a lawsuit by Verizon claiming that your denial created an effective prohibition and they would have, that would be evaluated by a court based on the small cell order. And they would have the opportunity, but they have the opportunity to present technical evidence, which we're told they didn't. They just made the assertion. They made the assertion. I guess bottom line is they made the assertion that you you shouldn't apply that standard or you should interpret the standard in your uh, your code uh, in compliance with uh, what their interpretation is of federal law. Yeah. Okay. I'm not hearing anything different than I thought we were hearing before. I was tr I was trying to get there for Mikey, but maybe maybe he's hearing something different than I am. Yeah, I I feel like we're just we're stuck in a language issue. I mean, I'm sure they are supplying some need that they want, but there's no technical evidence that I'm seeing. So that's that's if we're sticking to language. That's where I'm stuck. But okay. you know, I, I just wish they could go here. Here's it's an you know B eleven twelve. It does this. Here's the evidence. Great, you're approved. I just don't see that. So maybe I'm getting too deep into the language. I don't know. Sounds like time to call a question for me. Let's do it. Kelsey, would you take the roll? And this is Councilmember Pearson's motion to deny the project. And John, I want to clarify, we're going to bring back resolutions to formally deny this, correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, so Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. 
Councilmember Fair? Abstain. Councilmember Yuri? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? I don't, I'm not smart enough to abstain, so I'm going to say yes. Motion so, carries. All right. Moving right along, uh, item 6A is, is pretty darned uh, non-controversial. I'd love to receive and file it, but I, I don't think I have the option of doing that, do I? Uh, Mr. Mayor, we are looking for some feedback from council tonight. Um, we could continue this item if that is council's pleasure. We could either try to bring it back on the 8th or some sub subsequent date. I would like to continue this item 6A to the 8th. I second the motion. Bruce, I see your hand. Yeah, I was, I was going to move that we continue the balance of our agenda to the 8th. I don't want to do that. I want to continue this item and the oh, other. We need an appointment. I'm sorry. But other I'm, than the other than the appointment. Yeah. Well, I'd I'd kind of like to get in uh, our little project as well, Bruce. Okay. I didn't think there was a time sensitivity to it, but okay. Let's just vote on yours. This one for now. Okay. Kelsey, we take the roll, please. Mayor Grisanti. Yes. Councilmember Pearson. Yes. Councilmember Fair. Yes. Councilmember Yuri? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. That takes us to item 7A, Council Appointments to the Planning Commission. Is there any public comment? No, you don't have any speakers for this item. Mikey, will you make your appointment? I'm appointing Mark Wetton. Thank you. The motion is necessary, so we move on to 7B. 7B is a ban on outdoor smoking. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein and Council Member Pearson. Uh, one of you guys or both of you guys have got to tell us about it. Do you want to continue, Bruce? Or do you want to? I can make it. I, I mean, I got one paragraph of something to say, and I think, you know, it's up, it's up to you. Go ahead. So, I mean, there are multiple reasons identified in the written staff report, public safety, health, and environmental benefits by reducing the risk of fires, reducing exposure to secondhand smoke, and reducing the number of cigarette butts that litter streets and end up polluting the ocean. Uh, it also provides another tool for law enforcement to enforce the camping ordinance and emergency <laughs> resolution, dealing with encampments in very high fire hazard severity zones, because if someone's living unhoused in Malibu and they're seen smoking, if we adopt this, that will provide adequate cause for law enforcement to approach the individual, require identification, ascertain whether any other applicable laws are being violated. That'll help to regulate the use of public space by unhoused people who've migrated to Malibu to take advantage of LA County's, in my view, incorrect and misguided reading of Martin versus Boise. So it's got public health aspects, it's got environmental aspects, and it's got fire safety aspects. So we're looking for council to ask the staff to go ahead and, and prepare a, a ordinance for us to consider approving. Is there any public comment, Kelsey? Yes, we have one speaker who is still in the meeting. We can hear from Ryan. Hey, Ryan. Tell us you want to smoke in public. Well, um, I am very pleased. Um, I'd say it's about time, considering our neighbors, Calabasas over the hill, seem to have done this in like 2008. But um, they have successfully honed their program. And if it was used as a model, I think this is terrific because the fire department's report um, strongly um, led in the dimension that the 2007 fire that burned homes on Malibu Road was caused by someone tossing a cigarette out their car window. And I think that this law needs to be as much a motorist advised enforcement with um, large signs, not small boilerplate print, like, you know, no skateboarding on city roads, it needs to be um, at all entrances to the city and at regular intervals on Pacific Coast Highway. So I wanted to weave that into my public comment and that uh, 
even perhaps an addendum sign below the, the city's scenic beauty sign, for instance, you could say something like a no smoking community or no smoking in public uh, places or something to that effect of promotion that Malibu is, you know, going in the right direction of uh, of this. And that and I also want you to state and make clear that this also applies to vaping. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Well, well said, Ryan. And once again, to go against popular opinion, that was a very good input. I appreciate it. I agree with you. I watched that fire that burned those houses when it went through Bluffs Park. We had a clear view of it, and it was amazing and horrifying how fast it burned those houses down. So you're right. Um, and I think you know, this would need to be marketed. This ordinance would actually be stronger than Calabasas. I researched ordinances around the country. There's actually very few. And this ordinance, I think, would uh, would be another level four in public safety, public health, and protecting the environment. And I'd just like to say that I believe that the motor vehicle code also already makes it illegal to discard a smoking material out the window of your car. And I'm prepared to vote for this, but Bruce has got his hand raised. I, I just wanted to add very quickly that I forgot to mention before that um, Sheriff's Department has actually advocated that we should consider doing this as well. So right. that's yet another reason for doing it. So this this is, uh, we're gonna, do we have to have a motion to direct staff or do we just direct them? Do you we, want to vote? Yeah, we need a motion. I would make yeah. a motion. So we make a motion, Mikey. Go ahead. Oh, I'll go ahead. So uh, the motion is to direct staff to bring back an ordinance amending the Malibu Municipal Code Chapter 9.34, smoking regulations to ban smoking in all outdoor public spaces. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? And they're supposed to use the Calabasas ordinance as the model. That will um. It, our, ours is a little more robust, to be honest, but that can be part, if they're still worth looking at theirs as part of building it, yes. Theirs doesn't mention, you know, the cigarettes are the number, cigarette butts are the number one thing found on beaches that go into the ocean. It right. turns up. So there's all sorts of things that Calabasas doesn't have. Okay. All right. Kelsey, can you call, take the roll, please? <laughs> Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Yuri? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, the next item is item number 7C. 7C is uh, we want to make it clear that the city of Malibu is going to require public hearings for coastal development permits uh, under Senate bills SB 9 and 10. Uh, cities have the opportunity to avoid holding them if they wish. And we simply may wish to make it clear that we are in faith that we require them in the city of Malibu. Is that correct, Bruce? Yes, this will remove the discretion of anyone other than city council to forego public hearings on all uh, coastal development permits. Okay. Is there any public comment for us, Kelsey? No, you don't have any speaker sign up to raise hands for this item. Okay, any council comments? We have a motion and a second. Kelsey, will you take the roll please? I'm so sorry, could you repeat the motion maker and the seconder for me? Oh, well, I, I think that you know, Bruce and I have to arm wrestle over who gets to make the motion. I don't stand on that formality. It's your motion. Go ahead. Okay. So I made the motion. Bruce seconded. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Yuri? Yes. Motion carries. Motion carries. Hey. I want to thank everybody for staying up. This meeting is adjourned. In memory uh, of? In, in memory of? Dashiell Blake and Richard Carrington.
Kerrigan. Kerrigan. Kerrigan, excuse yeah, me. I just want to thank everybody for the very good and professional conversation and deliberations we had on everything. I think it was a great meeting. And I want to thank staff for how late it is and their hard work. I know it's been a late night, and I appreciate your work. All right, I want guys. to thank everybody for assisting in my further education. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Find out how to get out of this.